to make sure that the training is there so that they get on and do the job properly without heading for disaster automatically. And, uh, more and more, this is no longer the case, but it does exist, and we do need, as a parliament, to address this issue, to seize it, to deal with it, no matter who is in government after the next election. It's important that this particular fa factor does get some emphasis, because without it, you're still going to have that widespread perception and fact of waste and uh, inefficiency and disaster, when what we all want is a situation where Indigenous Australians are managing their own affairs and doing it extremely well. The Honourable Member for Morton. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move that the House take note of the report. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the House take note of the report and seek leave to continue my remarks when the debate is resumed. Once again, is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Morton. No, oh, I beg your pardon. The question is that the debate be adjourned and uh, the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Government business. Order of the day number one. Australia remembers 1945-1995. Resumption of debate on the motion to take note of the paper. The question is that the House take note of the paper. The Honourable Member for Perth. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm for the House, and I've been very pleased as the Federal Member for Perth, and have taken great pride and felt very humble in having the opportunity this year, in, as a member of this Parliament, in marking a very significant year of our nation's history, where we've commemorated and paid tribute and celebrated the efforts of those who helped uh, to bring about victory in the Pacific and end World War II. It's uh, been an important year because I think there's a truism that applies to a family, a local community or a nation, and that is unless you understand and appreciate your past, you can't plan for your future. And perhaps the greatest feature of the Australia Remembers Year and the Australia Remembers Program has been for the first time we've made a truly national and community effort to ensure that our young people have an understanding of Australia's contribution and the contribution that a generation of Australia made for Australia in the course of World War II. And the importance of uh, making that effort as a community and personally to ensure that our young people understand this contribution came home to me on Anzac Day this year. Um, like many uh, local residents, I attended a dawn service in Halliday Park in Bayswater on Anzac Day. And After the ubiquitous sausage sizzle, I went home and got home about 7am, and my son, who was then three going on eight, who's now nearly four going on 14, and who will be traipsing the corridors of the house later this afternoon. When I opened the door, he, uh, he said, Daddy, where have you been? And I said, I've been working. He said, no, you haven't, Daddy. You've been standing up for those who died. And of course, he was right. What had happened is that he'd woken up, I wasn't there, and Jane had flicked on the televised dawn service and explained what I was doing. So after he made this point to me, I said to myself, well, why do we stand up? Well, we stand up for what a generation of Australians stood up for, for for freedom, for democracy, for liberty and for our way of life. And When these things were threatened, a generation of Australians rallied to defend them. We also stand up for the sacrifice that they made, and I think we also stand up for what that generation of Australians helped to forge as national Australian traits and characteristics, traits that they forged more often than not through pain and fear and suffering and hardship. And uh, I think. Uh, those national traits which were forged in the course of those years were, were courage, a sense of humour and adversity, mateship, loyalty, sticking together, ingenuity and tenacity, a healthy disrespect for authority unless that authority was deserving of respect or had earned that respect, and perhaps most importantly of all, tolerance and a fair go for others. The, uh, the debt, the ultimate debt of course, that uh, Australians of this generation and my son genera son's generation owes to the generation of Australians in 1945 is, of course, that those national traits, those characteristics are able to be applied by them in peacetime rather than in war. And it's for that debt that uh, this uh, very significant and, in my view, very great program was established by the government and the parliament and the, and the community in the course of this year. 
locally in Perth, like uh, uh, all other uh, federal members and uh, federal electric divisions, we established a local Australia Members Federal Perth Committee, which uh, consisted of representatives from local RSL sub-branches, from local city, shire and town councils, from local schools and historical societies. The local Federal Perth Committee was chaired by the recently retired City of Bays Bayswater Town Clerk Kevin Lang, and that was despite uh, a number of work commitments that Kevin uh, has uh, on board. And the charter of the Federal Perth Australia Members Committee was to seek to provide for the Electorate of Perth a focus to the nationwide Australia Members program. And the major objectives that the local committee sought to uh, work by were to encourage all Australians to remember and thank the veterans who fought in World War II campaigns, to recognise and appreciate the sorrows and difficulties of the widows and children of those veterans who did not return home or who died in intervening years, to encourage all Australians to remember and thank all who remained at home and kept the home front running, to create the sense of relief and excitement which marked the end of the war in 1945, and to educate the nation about the horrors and impact of World War II. And the local Federal Perth Committee sought to initiate activities and make contact with existing organisations to encourage them to conduct Australia Remembers activities. And I'd like to take this opportunity, Mr Deputy Speaker, of thanking all those organisations who took part either directly or in a representative capacity in the local Federal Perth Australia Remembers Committee, Kevin Lang, whom I've mentioned, representing local state members of parliament, my state parliamentary colleague, the member for Perth, Diana Warnock, representing the various RSL sub-branches, which include the Mount Lawley Inglewood sub-branch, the Eastern Regional sub-branch, the Bedford Morley sub-branch, the Bellevue sub-branch and the Mayland sub-branch, and representatives at various times included John Quinn from the Mount Lawley Inglewood sub-branch, John Roll and Percy White from the Eastern Regional sub-branch, and Bill Gaynor from the Bellevue sub-branch. Local government, which uh, included the Shire of Swan, the town of Bassendine, the city of Bayswater and the city of Stirling, were represented variously by Councillor Margaret Kitson from the Shire of Swan and the then mayor of uh, Bassendine, John Cox. Local uh, schools were represented by Marilyn Piper uh, from John Forrest uh, Senior High School and the various historical societies uh, in my uh, electorate, which include the Bayswater, the Bassendine, the Maylands, the Swan Guildford and the North Perth Historical Societies or Associations, were Betty Masrol from the Bayswater Historical, Association, Historical Society and Michael Grogan from the Bassendine Historical Society. And, uh, I was very pleased that uh, all those organisations and community representatives were able to uh, take part in this significant year's activities. There are a range of uh, activities which the local Federal Perth Australia Members Committee sponsored, and I'd like to very quickly draw those to the attention of the House. The committee in part sponsored a uh, VE day dance at the Maylands Library uh, by the City of Stirling, and the dance sought to reflect Australia's lifestyle in 1945 and the mood of Australians in the final year of the war. The committee also sponsored the Mount Lawley Senior High School to coordinate an extended school and community awareness program with the 1st, 11th and 2nd, 11th City of Perth Battalion Regiment. And uh, I was very pleased uh, to take part in the culmination of those, uh, those programs with, uh, with the uh, Mount Lawley Senior High School students and the representatives of the 1st and 2nd 11th Battalions in the Mount Lawley Senior High School Library. And to uh, formally mark the uh, occasion by uh, drawing to the community's attention the Centenary Memorial Library Book, which is held by the Mount Lawley Senior High School Library, which records donations of books made by members of the 1st and 2nd 11th Battalions in the course of, uh, of the school's uh, history. Other projects supported by the local Australia Members Perth Committee were a uh, community victory ball dinner dance on uh, September the 2nd, sponsored by the City of Bayswater and the Town of Bassendine, which celebrated the end of World War II, and that function was held in conjunction with the Eastern Region and Bedford Morley sub-branches of the RSL, and I was very pleased to be able to attend that occasion. The Bassendine Historical Society, in conjunction with the Bassendine Memorial Public Library, 
uh, established a photographic and memorabilia display in the Bassendine Library in the course of August. I was very pleased on one Sunday afternoon to formally open the, uh, the, dis the display on behalf of the community and the local Australian Members Committee was very pleased to sponsor that project. The Bayswater Historical Society sponsored a number of, uh, of projects, uh, including a cookbook entitled On the Home Front, which uh, published popular recipes from the war, as well as an historical account of life on the home front during the war, and I was pleased to be able to present to the Minister for Veterans Affairs this week a, a copy of the uh, book published by the Historical Society. As well, the Society also organised a display in conjunction with John Forrest Senior High School students which featured written and oral histories of uh, local people who uh, lived uh, during those war years and I was very pleased at a, an assembly at the John Forrest Senior High School to be able to present uh, to the relevant students a, 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 a small token of uh, the community's appreciation of their work and I was very pleased that one of the local veterans chosen for uh, for those oral histories was Jack Henderson, who is a, a resident of Bayswater, whom I've known and had a high regard for for many years. I was also very pleased that the committee sponsored the RSL Bedford Morley sub-branch commemorative uh, dinner on the, on the 15th of August, which coincided with the sub-branch's 50th anniversary. And uh, on that uh, occasion, uh, which was attended by very many members of the Bedford Morley RSL sub-branch, very many of whom uh, bowl at the uh, Bedford uh, Bowling Club, which is uh, the bowling club that my father has bowled at since 1967. And in the course of uh, conversation with members of the sub-branch on, on that evening, they suggested that I'd learned uh, a fair bit about politics from my father, having had conversations with him since 1967. And my riposte to the various members on that occasion was that uh, they needed to understand that bowling was a bit like politics. One needed to understand where the bias was. But I was very pleased to, uh, to attend uh, on, uh, on that occasion. The uh, local Australia Members uh, Federal Perth Committee also sponsored uh, the Australian Ra Railways Historical Society in its development of a permanent display recognising the vital role that the Midland Railway workshops uh, played in the course of World War II. The uh, Midland Railway West Rail workshops uh, in the course of World War II was converted to ensure that contracts were completed for propellers and engines for minesweepers, for Yarrow-type boilers, for corvettes, uh, for uh, Australian standard Garrett locomotives and uh, a range of 25-pounder uh, shell, shell forging. So the workforce at the workshops during the latter years of the war, which then included a significant proportion of women, played a significant uh, role in the course of preparations of munitions and equipment. And the Historical Society, which currently manages the Railway Museum in Bassendine and which has an aspiration which I share to, at some stage in the near future, transfer that museum to the uh, old Midland West Rail workshop site, uh, received widespread support in the community for its effort in ensuring that the historical contribution that the railway workshops made to the war effort was recorded. Finally, the committee supported the RSL Bellevue sub-branch in uh, engaging in a week-long comprehensive display at the Bellevue RSL Club depicting the life experiences and styles from the 40s and the war years. And the sub-branch's activities included children's school, school and artwork, which commemorated the end of World War II, and members of that sub-branch visited local schools and provided relevant students with a presentation about the significant of the, uh, significance of the week. As well, a commemoration plaque was, was placed on the uh, Bellevue RSL memorial, and I was very pleased, uh, together with Bill Gaynor from the R Bellevue RSL uh, sub-branch, to take part on that, uh, on that ceremony. Uh, and, uh, there are a number of other uh, functions which were held in the course of the year which weren't formally sponsored by the Australian Members Committee but which were nonetheless supported by the community. I was very pleased to be able to attend the Mount Lawley Ingwood RSL sub-branch Australia Members Dinner on the 15th of August at the Cascades Tavern in, in Maylands and I was very pleased recently to at a uh, regular monthly meeting of the sub-branch to be able to present Australia Members Certificates of Appreciation to, uh, to that branch. I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, attending the sub-branches annual dinner later this year. In addition to uh, 
those uh, activities, a centrepiece of the local Perth Australia Members Committee support of uh, Australia Members' activities in the course of the year was to sponsor every local school in the, uh, in the electorate which, uh, which conducted Australia Members' activities. And this was either in the form of competition or in the form of other appropriate uh, Australia Members' commemoration activities. And uh, I have over 50 primary and high schools in my electorate. I don't wish to go through <coughs> all of the uh, activities by all of the schools, but draw attention to a couple. I've referred to the Mount Lawley Senior High School's activities with the 1st and 2nd 11th Battalion. The, I was pleased recently at Anzac Terrace Primary School in Bassendean to commemorate the, the uh, moving of the uh, flagpole of the school, to, which was formally dedicated on the 11th of uh, November, and very pleased recently at the Bassendean Primary School when the Minister for Veterans Affairs made a presentation to the school library for its uh, activities in the course of this year. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was very pleased that local authorities in my electorate also took the opportunity of engaging in Operation Restoration to restore a number of local war memorials, and I pay tribute to the town of Bassendean for engaging in uh, a program to restore the Bassendean Memorial in o Old Perth Road and the Memorial Rose Garden in Bassendean Oval, to the city of Bayswater for the restoration of the memorial at Halliday Park in Bayswater and Remembrance Park Memorial in, uh, in Beaufort Street in, uh, in Bedford, and, and to the Shire of Swan for Stirling the Square Memorial in Guildford and the Railways Workshop time. Memorial in Midland. Has expired. The question is the House take note of the paper. <coughs> the Honourable Member for Moore. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak on this debate, <coughs> and first of all, in uh, following on from the Member for Perth, whose uh, electorate uh, also got heavily involved in the Australia Members' Commemoration, as does yours, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. That I'd first like to congratulate the Chairman of the State Committee for Australia Remembrance in Western Australia, Mr Keith Mattingly, who I thought had uh, provided some inspirational leadership in ensuring that the Western Australian end of the commemorative effort was superlative. And I particularly appreciate the fact that he took the trouble to come to uh, a committee meeting of ours. In fact, it was the committee meeting in which the various seeding funds were allocated to the various applicants. And I found uh, having him there and uh, his advice was uh, very useful. And uh, all the way through the Australian Members' Commemoration year, uh, Keith Mattingly has been ex an extremely good leader. And I'd just like to congratulate him and Mrs Mattingly. I know they've also made quite extraordinary efforts to ensure that they were present at as many of the functions as possible. And uh, that uh, really did give the Western Australian effort uh, in Australian Members an extra fillip. Well, in the electorate of Moore, we had a very um, active participation in Australia members, and from an early stage, we instituted the committee, uh, and the committee was formed of uh, representatives from many of the community groups, schools, clubs, institutions, including, of course, the RSL, the local city councils, and others, who all participated in ensuring that in Moore there was a first-class uh, program of events to commemorate what is effectively the 50th anniversary uh, celebration of the end of the Second World War. Before I go into looking at those individually, I'd just like to make a couple of comments about the advantages or, let's say, the benefits of the uh, Australian Members' Commemoration. The first of those is that—and I, and I must commend again the Minister, Mr Shacker, for what is uh, probably uh, will, will be an, an historical uh, contribution to Australia's uh, commemorative, commemoration of its past events, because Mr Shacker's uh, theme or the themes that were set up by the original idea or project Australia Remembers Commemoration was not only to commemorate or to recognise the sacrifices and efforts made by those who had served in military theatres and of course in auxiliary um, services with the military forces, but also to recognise the efforts of those at home and those who stayed and made the sacrifices in Australia. And of course in an electorate like mine, with around 25 to 27 per cent of people actually born in the United Kingdom or in Ireland, then of course there was the added, uh, matter, the added feature of being a large number of people who had undergone the war in Britain, which of course had suffered considerably uh, thanks to the Blitz and of course the blockade by the U-boats to prevent vital supplies from reaching the United Kingdom. Now, 
the committee set about uh, ensuring that there was going to be a as across the board celebration of what is, uh, of, as we now know, uh, a very successful uh, project. And, and, I, and in enlarging on the themes I spoke of earlier, I'd just like to point out that in Wanneroo in particular, from North Beach all the way up to the city of Wanneroo and beyond, Two Rocks, there was, during the Second World War period, a great consciousness of the, I suppose, the proximity of the Second World War, not the least from the fact that many of the people in the market gardening, growing industries in the area contributed to the war effort by growing valuable uh, foodstuffs, but also in the fact that with its proximity to the coast, that there are various points along the coast that acted as valuable lookouts or um, important strategic points in relation to any uh, potential Japanese invasion of uh, the coastline. Now, in the case of my committee, um, I'd just like to point out some of the people who are involved. If I can first start off with uh, Maureen Hill. Maureen was, uh, is actually an officer of the Department of Veterans Affairs and a friend and a member of the committee, and she provided a terrific liaison. And I must say that the, and commend the officers of the Department of Veterans Affairs in Perth because they were very, very helpful and uh, provided, I think, a first-class support for all of our efforts. And she's been a very active member in, and an active local community member in the electorate and was able to give us some valuable insights into how the Australia Members Program was going to work. Margaret Cockman from the City of Wanneroo, and she's in the Recreation, Culture and Recreation Department, uh, was absolutely fantastic as uh, someone who contributed towards our uh, objectives. She, of course, provided valuable liaison between the City of Wanneroo and oh, its activities okay. and the more uh, electorate committee for Australia Members. Uh, that included all of the uh, various events in which the City of Wanneroo were involved. We also had assistance from Philip Baker, Church of Jesus Christ, Colin Fletcher from the 53 Regional Cadet Unit, Tony Martin, a former Wanneroo Citizen of the Year and Chief Inspector of Police, and also during the war a diver who used to dive in Fremantle Harbour to ensure there were no limpet mines attached to the ships, the uh, military or merchant shipping in, in the harbour. Also uh, Phil uh, Rankin, the President of the Antioch Two Rocks RSL, John Astell from North Shore Rotary, uh, Darrell Deakin from Craigie Senior High School, uh, Don Edwards from the North Suburban Historical Society and Coastal Heritage Association of Western Australia, Kelsey Tolman from the 507 Regional Cadet Unit at Joondalup, Cara Cox from the North Beach School, Kate Hurlbat from Training Ship Marmion, Navy Cadets, uh, Captain Alex Kent from the Regional Cadet Unit, Justin Townsend, Number 2 Flight, Wanneroo Air Training Corps uh, Cadets, Michelle Westerway of 53 Regional Cadet Unit, uh, Ian Grealish of the same unit, and Arthur Ventham from the Wanneroo Schools. We had also help from Alison Kent from TS Marmion, councillors Fleur Freem and Margaret Lynn from the City of Wanneroo, and Leslie Emmons, who is another person who uh, volunteered and uh, helped us out considerably, and a range of other people who came in to get behind this terrific effort. I'd just like also to now briefly talk about some of the events that occurred. Amongst those events, we had a, uh, a very uh, useful and informative exhibition uh, put on by the North Suburban Historical Society, and they have also undertaken the production of a video presenting the Australian uh, War Memorial and Museum, and the collection of a representative photographic display um, of photographs in the West Australian newspapers uh, from the period. Incidentally, they have their museum at Mount Flora Reserve, an old water tank that has been converted into a museum. And I might tell you that used to be a lookout, uh, a very valuable strategic lookout during the times of the Second World War. Um, if I can also uh, make acknowledgement of um, a variety of, of other important uh, projects, uh, not the least was a project uh, undertaken on the 28th of May where 30 volunteers uh, from the um, Men of the Trees in the area, from the Friends of Yalagonga, uh, led by Mike Norman of Sorrento. They planted uh, 550 commemorative trees in the area, uh, in the northern area of, Ye of uh, the Yalagonga Regional Park, and they will be installing a plinth and plaque in the area uh, later. Also, um, Glengarry Primary School had a special service on Anzac Day where the students dedicated a flagpole and memorial to those who lost their lives during World War II. Many of the students wore black armbands or special Australia Remembered armbands during sporting events 
uh, in the area to be held during that uh, weekend of the immediately adjacent to VP Day. Um, I'd also like to specifically remember um, the Remember and Rejoice Gloucester Lodge Museum, which was held on the 1st of October by the City of Wanneroo and the Gloucester Lodge, uh, the, the people responsible for the preservation of the Gloucester Lodge. This was to recognise the RAAF Radar Unit 227 and Number 4 Medical Rehabilitations Unit, uh, the 10th Light Horse, and it provided an exhibition of the history of Wanneroo, uh, the Austra an Australian Members Commemoration, March Passed by Cadets and Veterans, as well as uh, other exhibitions. Uh, Jack Sue, for instance, from Z Force was there, and it was an absolutely superb afternoon. I mean, uh, I think probably one of the, the, the great memories of this particular um, uh, program will be that particular event. I'd just like to point out that in the Australia, the Wanneroo City Library has also contributed by putting together an oral history, uh, capturing the individual experiences in the, in the words of the veterans and in a way not possible with published works. And the Australian Members uh, Collection comprises over 30 interviews that have been published in cassette form, uh, conducted by community volunteers. And the interviews vividly recording varied war experiences from residents who are enlisted, prisoners of war, work camp internees, or market gardeners producing valuable war food supplies. And that was launched on Tuesday, the 15th of August, uh, at the Woodvale Library. Of course, that was VP Day. A tape of composite interviews and synopsis of all the tapes supporting, supported by a display of memorabilia. And those uh, tapes are available for reference from the Whitford Library. Now, the other great, uh, one of the great uh, um, events was the Sentimental Journey concert held at the uh, Wanneroo uh, Civic Centre. And, and I can say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that was an absolutely wonderful uh, production put on by the city entertainers, who put on basically a sort of a, a kaleidoscope, a smorgasbord of um, events, uh, with the focus being the Second World War, the sort of old-time music hall themes, and then moving through all the way through to the present, actually using that theme 1945 to 1995. And I must say that the, the, the response from the audience at every concert was, was absolutely one of acclaim. They did a fantastic job, the singing and the production was superb and they really did for many of the people, particularly those who perhaps come from uh, or had uh, experience of the, war the, the sort of music hall experience, whether it's in the United Kingdom or here in uh, Australia, um, it gave them certainly a, a lot to feel uh, nostalgic and to reminisce about. Now the schools in particular in um, the area got right behind Australia members. Uh, I've mentioned the North Beach School. They had uh, a, a, a wonderful uh, a display uh, that put on a, a plaque in their main assembly area. And I'd just like to re-congratulate Cara Cox, who was the then acting deputy principal, but has been responsible for um, the Australia members' activities in her school. She is also uh, responsible for a, a certificate presentation the other week at which the Australia members commemorative certificates, certificates of appreciation, which is a one, were a great idea, were presented to veterans uh, who were associated or live near the school. And uh, they really do, or had got behind, the local community. The Craigery Senior High School um, conducted a memories project in a very enthusiastic and significant way. And I'd like to also congratulate Darrell Deakin, the, uh, the, the teacher at the school responsible. And they invited uh, representatives, veterans representatives, to a celebration breakfast and um, assembly, uh, commemoration, I suppose, um, uh, well, it was a commemorative assembly at which these veterans were made very welcome and their efforts were recognised. And congratulations to Darrell Deakin and um, his school, uh, his school uh, students who were responsible. I'd also like to congratulate the one Gara Inner Wheel and the Wanneroo Roti Rotary, who put on a, um, a uh, gala supper dance at the Wanneroo Civic Centre. Another thing that was uh, on the September the 2nd, which was another great success. And if I can also, uh, and I'd just like to recognise Margaret Bain and uh, Buzz Goodacre from the Inner Wheel and Wanneroo Rotary. And if I can also recognise the Ocean Reef residents who established a commemorative seat which was placed on the Trick Point Lookout in Ocean Reef to commemorate uh, Australia members. That was uh, launched, uh, or officially opened, I suppose, uh, the other week. And um, I'd just like to uh, congratulate 
the uh, people responsible for that at the Ocean Reef residence, and um, they have been, again, uh, also strong participants within our program. The uh, Wanneroo Lions, uh, sorry, the, uh, I beg your pardon, the Whitford's Lions Club uh, staged the 1995 Whitford's Community Fair, in which they had a marquee and exhibition especially dedicated to Australia members. Jack Lacra, a former district governor and uh, stalwart of the Lions Club at Whitford's, was responsible for the organisation of this, and I'd just like to, to, to make that recognition of Jack's uh, individual contribution. Um, and I'd just like to point out that uh, at that uh, community fair, one of the few surviving VCs from the, United, from the, the British Royal Navy was present there as a guest uh, and also participating uh, in the events there. So it was good to see that as another activity that was a success in the electorate. I'd like to also recognise, if I may, uh, Anthony Kent and, um, and Peter West from the Wanneroo sub-branch, the Wanneroo and Joondalup sub-branch of the RSL. They had a uh, parade in September in which they recognised and commemorated Australia Remembers. And I'd also like to recognise, if I may, um, the uh, Mr. Bennett and Mr. Tomlinson, the President and Secretary, respectively, of the North Beach RSL sub-branch, who, who were involved in the opening and the, the establishment of a plaque at the Mount Flora Regional Museum. The Wanneroo Schools also participated um, in a, an exhibition. We had um, a, a range of, of uh, smaller events, amongst which was the St. Luke's uh, Church in Padbury. Or um, they had a small exhibition at their recent fate, and um, a number of others used various facets of Australian members to add that theme to their local Order. events. The Honourable Member's time has expired. The question is the House take note of the paper. The Honourable Member for Melbourne Ports. <coughs> Mr Speaker, first I'd like to pay tribute to the Minister, Con Shaka, and his staff and officers of his department who made the Australia Remembered celebration, I think, one of the important occasions in the history of this nation. It was an occasion where all sections of the community, people of diverse religious and political beliefs and of none, came together as one generation to openly, publicly thank an earlier generation for the sacrifices that they bore uh, during the last great world war conflict. In Melbourne ports it was especially significant because within my electorate there are continual reminders of the sacrifice that has taken place. We are the home of the historic St Kilda Road barracks the Shrine of Remembrance and, of course, uh, Station Pier at the, at the city of Port Nolan, uh, from whence generations of young servicemen went overseas to do battle, many of whom never returned. We formed a committee with RSL representatives and community representatives the level of participation that took place within my community was such that it's not really possible to single out individuals, some of whom may have played a more significant part than others, because there were very few people who asked to contribute, asked to assist, did not give of their very best. And of course, uh, RSL organisations were amongst the base structures, as there were teachers. Uh, and principals from various schools and citizens, just in their capacity as citizens. The events or the structure of Melbourne Ports were such important edifices as the shrine and the barracks, enabled us to put together uh, for school children uh, historic tours from their schools where these children uh, went first of all to the Shrine of Remembrance, visited uh, the Victoria Barracks and the War Cabinet Room of that time. Then they went down to Port Melbourne where they boarded uh, the historic sailing ship Alma de Pell, which played an important role 
in the war, and then uh, went across to Williamstown where they toured the HMAS Castle Main. So it was a, an, an episode which for many of those children, although they lived close to the sea, uh, they had by, walked past or ridden past the shrine in the St Kilda Ray Barracks. But, but this tour uh, really brought the whole exercise alive to them. And uh, the emphasis on the number of young children who participated uh, I think achieved one of the fundamental aims of the whole Australian Remembrance Celebration. There was a video competition for high schools based on the Australia Remembers theme uh, and uh, that was participated in by a number of high schools. Uh, a grant to the Jewish Museum as a contribution to their uh, historic display uh, and we, the committee assisted financially with the, uh, the Jewish Library's uh, presentation of a historic uh, set of videos where they had interviewed uh, survivors of the Holocaust and people who uh, as individuals at, took their own lives into their hand to form part of parts and units and people who were involved in the heroic, resi the heroic resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto. We have a, a local uh, theatre of high quality which is one of the smaller theatres live theatres in Melbourne, Theatre Works. It produced a professionally locally based uh, play uh, called The Peep Show, uh, which was uh, available in, in video presentation. The city of Glenara hosted a tea dance and a historic display. The city of Port Phillip commissioners used the theme uh, to commence uh, war memorial refurbishment schemes. There are a very large number of war memorials in my electorate uh, dating back to the Boer War. Many of them were in need of refurbishment. All shops through their main streets uh, displayed programs and other memoralia uh, related to the uh, events of the war. And the Caulfield Race Course, and one should have express appreciation to those people who are responsible for its, its management. During the war it was of course uh, one of the more important army camps. Uh, many uh, Australian diggers received their basic training and, and lived there for some time. And it was good to see the wide variety of people who then uh, turned up to an Australia Remembers Cup. Uh, I'm sorry that the, the Minister Con Shacker, who was a lover of horse flesh, uh, and I don't know if he's too successful a punter, but he was unable to make it on that occasion. Uh, Melbourne Ports was also, of course, by virtue of, of the Palais Theatre being uh, in my electorate, uh, that was the basis and the site uh, for the very successful presentation of the Melbourne Australia Remembers concert. So that I think for members of my community and my electorate, uh, there were very few people who were not touched, if not, not very deep, deeply and directly involved in these very significant and important events. I'd like to finish on this note. The march in Melbourne, I think, as one who's been to many Anzac Day ceremonies, many marches. I think that that was event, an event which will live for a long time in the memory, not merely of all those service, ex-servicemen who participated, many of them with their grandchildren, will live in the memory of the people who turned up en masse to say thank you. I have never seen that level of enthusiasm, that level of community spirit uh, at any of the many marches that I've attended and participated in. It was a tribute which was richly deserved and it was a tribute that was generously given. And it was, uh, I think, uh, for many, 
It was a, an occasion which will not be forgotten, and particularly amongst the young children, many of them marching with their grandfathers or their fathers, mainly their grandfathers, and wearing their, the medals that had been won. It was a march out of the ordinary. It's a march which brought the people of Melbourne together in a way uh, which happens unfortunately only too infrequently. I'd like to finish on this note. The those of us who are in this parliament are involved by the very nature of the Westminster system in a situation of continual debate, disagreement, uh, and for those people uh, who attend this parliament and observe our behaviour, they are entitled to think that basically uh, we are fierce protagonists and that there is seldom any point of agreement. Ceremonies like this and events like this do tend, I think, to remind us that we are one people. That when our nation in the past has been threatened, uh, there's a spirit of unanimity that flows through the Australian people where differences are forgotten. And it is therefore, I think, important that we see the Australian Remembers Ceremony is not merely a tribute to those who made sacrifice, but an occasion which brought together our people with one sense of purpose, one, one concept and an ideal uh, about who we are. We mightn't always agree where we're going, but the important thing is that people across the board were reaching out to each other in order to say thank you to a generation of Australians who served their communities their small towns, this country well. It was an important event for every Australian uh, that participated in it. And I think we all owe not merely a, a debt of thanks to those who, right throughout the length and breadth of Australia, took on the responsibility of, of helping organise it. It was the great community effort which I think should inspire people in this parliament uh, in the heat of political battle uh, to remind us that it, when it comes down to it, we are one people who are able on occasions like this to show a spirit of unanimity and sincerity in reaching across political and religious boundaries to assert the fundamental values which, for which many Australians fought and died. The question is that the House take note of the paper. I call the Honourable <coughs> Member for Pearce. Thank you, Mr Deputy, Deputy Chair. Uh, I, was, uh, uh, I, say, I have to say that I share the sentiments, many of those uh, just expressed by uh, uh, the Member for uh, Melbourne Ports, and uh, I think that it has been a wonderful time uh, this, uh, this year of remembrance for us all to remember that essentially, although philosophically we may have many differences, uh, we are essentially here for the one purpose, and that is to uh, uh, assist in the management and growth and development of this great country. As 1995 draws to an end, so too does Australia remembers, but the memories will undoubtedly uh, linger with all of us who have been uh, able to participate in this uh, year of uh, remembrance. And uh, I have to say, Mr Deputy, Speaker, um, I uh, congratulate the government and the minister for their initiative uh, in this regard uh, and in making available the resources uh, and uh, uh, the wherewithal to uh, assist uh, all of us to in some way participate uh, in uh, the uh, 50th year celebrations of the, se of the end of the Second World War. In uh, August, the Australia Remembers 1994-95 uh, program was launched uh, by the government, and uh, in November 1994, the Pierce Australia Remembers Committee was formed. Uh, it was formed to commence work on projects for the Pierce electorate. The members of the committee were chosen by way of nomination from each of the local authorities in the Pierce electorate, uh, who also approached the Return Service League clubs in the area. And since November 1994, the committee uh, got 
uh, going very well under the guidance and the chairmanship of Mr Bill Gaynor, uh, the Shire of Mundaring's representative. The committee members were uh, comprised of Mr Bill Gaynor, uh, Mrs Barbara Harper-Nelson from the Shire of Kalamunda, Mr Mac Roth from the Shire of Tujay, Mrs Jan Smith, the Mayor and the representative of the Town of Northam, Mrs Judy Tomlinson from the Shire of Ch Chittering and Mrs Jan Zeck from the Shire of Swan. And all local uh, authorities were invited to participate and did so with a great deal of enthusiasm. The focus of the peers celebrations was a week of activities at our regional shopping centre Midland Gate on the 14th to the 19th of August 1995. The week was organised to acknowledge those in Pierce and their relatives uh, who served in the Australian Defence Forces during World War II and those who played their part both at home and abroad. And the sacrifices and commitment they made can never be fully appreciated by, by those of us who were not there and by some of us who were, uh, who were born uh, just as the war was ending and some of us uh, who were not uh, in this realm at the time of that event. And it's very difficult for us to fully appreciate what, what uh, these people sacrificed and what they went through. But it is through occasions such as Australia Members Week that we were able to uh, share with those people experiences and get to, to have a greater understanding and also to remember and pay tribute uh, to those who contributed to making our nation uh, what it is today. I was really delighted at the wonderful response in our community to this event and I'd like to uh, thank all of those who involved themselves in that. Many schools and community groups participated in an assortment of events and displays, uh, bringing their uh, understanding of history, uh, their artistic abilities and their writing abilities, musical abilities and dancing and acting and so on, all to the fore. And uh, it provided a, a wonderful week, uh, which I know many of our uh, veterans enjoyed immensely. The Shire of Swan, the RAAF, uh, Pierce Air Base, the Navy, the Defence Force Recruiting, Hollywood Hospital, Australian Red Cross, Australian Railways Society and the Western Australian Museum all participated in the Pierce Week of Australia Remembers. Group Captain Dennis Green, the officer commanding uh, at the RAAF base Pierce, officially opened the week of activities and gave a very moving address. Schools included Greenmount, Riverlands, Falls Road, Bellevue, Woodla Pine, High Wycombe and Middle Swan Primary Schools, the John Forrest High School and Mazenod College, who I would particularly like to thank for their contribution of uh, music of the era with the college swing band. School projects uh, uh, included 14 schools and uh, they took part in a week of activity and displays, as I said, which covered a whole spectrum of uh, talent. And uh, the schools that uh, won awards were the Kalamunda Primary School, Bindoon Primary School and Falls Road Primary School. The standard of work was extremely high and the judges had a very difficult uh, decision to make. And one of the students from Kalamunda Primary School, Lisa Tan, I think summed up the whole essence of the week's activity in a, uh, a poem and it reflected the message of peace and it seems to me that many of the young people as they listened to the stories of the veteran, veterans uh, understood very much um, uh, that uh, these were people who made sacrifices to bring about a peaceful uh, uh, Australia and uh, that, that peace is, is an important ongoing theme for us all. And uh, it was very moving to see how uh, deeply many of the young people understood that message. And it was certainly a common thread in many of the displays that were exhibited in that week. But Lisa Tan from Year 7 said, I think wars are futile and prove nothing. We can do, can't we do anything? Can't we do something? Don't start wars. Instead, be a friend, and hopefully all wars will come to an end. And uh, we had, as I said, a great uh, interaction between some of our veterans and some of our students from the schools who came down to listen to their stories. And uh, Mr Derek Carling was one, and I just thought that I might read a little uh, of, of his background because he was... Uh, 
a volunteer in the Air Force in 1940. He was a wireless operator and a gunner, and he became a gunnery officer with the 44th Squadron Lincoln, which was the first Lancaster squadron ever formed to fly an operation over Germany. The first Lancaster was delivered in 1941. Uh, he was involved in 16 sorties over Germany, but it shot down on the 6th of October 1942 and captured three days later on the Dutch border. He spent time in two separate uh, camps in uh, the Dulag Luft and the Stalag Luft III, which was the main Air Force prisoner of war camp in Germany. Whilst in the Stulag, uh, Stalag Luft, Mr Carling was a member of the escape organisation. They started three tunnels called Tom, Dick and Harry, and eventually 76 officers escaped one night out of Harry. The tunnel was 310 feet long. Fifty of the officers were subsequently murdered on direct orders of Hitler. This murder was stopped by Goering, who appeared, appealed directly to Hitler. As a result of the escape, only three officers got back to the United Kingdom, two Belgians and a Norwegian, all whom could speak fluent German. It was just wonderful to watch the expressions on the young people's face as these stories were related. How did they manage to cart all that sand out of the tunnels? Uh, how could they see in the darkness of the tunnel? And Mr Carling explained how they rigged up an, a, a system of uh, electricity to provide them light in the tunnels. And uh, they were just totally, uh, uh, totally caught up in, uh, in these stories and these events. And there were others. There was Mr Tom Pilmore who brought along his, uh, his mess kit and uh, showed uh, the boys the basic uh, kit that they had and, uh, and explained uh, uh, what they did. And, of course, some of the children were asking, well, did, did you have a gun? Did you use it? And, uh, again, the, uh, the great interest that was taken in uh, uh, the experience of these veterans was, was something to be seen. Mr Keith Flanagan of Darlington put together an audio-visual presentation, The Quiet Lion, which was a tribute to the life and times of Sir Weary Dunlop. And I remember at a lunch celebration which uh, brought all of the veterans and, and other people from that era together in the chittering area of my electorate where they, one of the veterans was relating an experience, talking about a young soldier who was a veteran of war at 19 and how being taunted at one stage by the Japanese across the way who were saying, we're coming to get you, we're coming to get you, uh, Australians, and uh, finally he'd had enough of this and he poked his head up and yelled out, well, if you're coming over, mate, bring some tinnies. We're a bit dry over here. And uh, there was also this wonderful sense of humour that came through in the most appalling conditions and, uh, and dreadful sacrifices that had to be, ma to be made. And uh, the, the awe the children held these people in was just immense, and the experiences shared, I'm sure, will be valuable for them as they go through their, their lives. The committee was very appreciative of the enormous support that was given to the Australia Members Week by Mr Lou Hook and all his staff at the Midland Gate Shopping Centre. The Pierce Australia Members Committee did allocate a portion of its funding to the week celebration, the week of remembrance, and the balance was apportioned to each of the Shire. The Shire of Mundaring rededicate, rededicated the Black Boy Hill Memorial. The Shire of Kalamunda upgraded the War Memorial. The Shire of 2J uh, had uh, a, a, and provided lights for the memorial and held a school competition, an essay competition, a writing competition. The town of Northam had a return to Northam lunch because one of the main training camps was at Northam. And the Shire of Chittering had an honour board made and a reunion lunch. The Shire of Swan put together a very wonderful photographic exhibition uh, which uh, highlighted the role that women played. And I'm just uh, sorry, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, I'm not able to read uh, some of those quotes from the women that time doesn't permit. But uh, sometimes women's role and the role they played both abroad and at home uh, has become perhaps a, a little dim uh, in, uh, in, in the remembrances. And uh, it was wonderful to see these women remembered and, uh, in fact, saluted for their contribution. 
I couldn't help but note when I went to 2J to the rededication of the war memorial that many women were listed on that war memorial. Many women gave their lives, uh, many of them as uh, uh, serving as nurses and caring for the sick and the injured. Uh, and their stories are very, uh, uh, very moving stories indeed. So uh, I was pleased uh, that we were able to also salute, salute the women. And uh, perhaps I've got time just to read perhaps one of those one of those stories. And uh, in fact, it was, uh, came out of the book White Coolies. And uh, it goes, this is a story of women who fought in the last war. Yes, I mean fought, for they surely did, just as surely as a sailor with his submarines and guns, the soldier with rifles and tanks, and the airman with bombs and machine guns. With these women, it was a different kind of war. They fought against anything which threatened to destroy life. Theirs was a courage not stimulated by lust for battle, but born of women's natural instinct to tend the sick, the helpless, the suffering, and the fearful. What they suffered physically was almost inhuman, but only women can fully appreciate their terrible mental anguish and the constant dreadful fear <clears throat> of what the Nipponese could and might do to them. This is a story which should be read and remembered, not only for the fine examples of courage and bravery, of which it tells, but also for the grand humour, resourcefulness and ability to overcome the greatest of problems and withal to keep morale at the highest imaginable level. This is so typical of the army nurses. I had the privilege of seeing them in many places. I saw them in the desert, in the jungle, on the high seas. I saw them housed in tents or huts, menaced by all the terrors of war, as well as by the scourge of malaria, scrub typhus and other tropical diseases. The longer the war progressed, the greater grew my admiration for them. I will never cease to love them all. Thank you. The question is that the House take note of the paper. I call the Honourable Member for Throsby. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, at the outset, I should like to pay tribute to the Minister uh, for Veterans Affairs and his staff for their efforts uh, during this year. Uh, this past year, um, concerning Australian Remembers, every Australian has been touched in some way by the Australian Remembers program, and many thousands of activities associated with the program have occurred throughout the nation, and what a, a diverse and interesting range of activities there have been. Each of these activities around the nations were, and still are, being enthusiastically embraced by millions of Australians, especially the younger members of our com community, keen on remembering or learning about the contribution of uniformed and civilian men and women to Australia's war effort. These young people, as members of a generation who have never had to face the horrors of war, I believe now, more than ever, understand and appreciate the enormous sacrifices that uniformed and civilian men and women made for this country, for future generations and for peace. This, I believe, is the lasting legacy of this year and demonstrate the success of the Australia Remembers program. In Throsby, I convened and established a Throsby Australian Remembers Committee, which was comprised of a diverse community groups and local RSL sub-ranches. What basically we tried to do we tried to involve the whole of the community and we arranged a whole range of activities from the very young to the more senior members of the community. All the local RSLs participated except one, but I pay tribute to the RSL uh, membership of Port Kembla, Barilla and Albion Park. Each played a magnificent role. I also pay tribute and commend all members of the Throsby Australian Remembers Committee for their ideas, their participation and their continued enthusiasm for organising and arranging the large number of activities which were part of the Australian Remembers program this year. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've been listening to some of the speeches and it's rather like each of our maiden speeches or our first speeches where we thank everyone and list various things. Well, I'm going to follow that tradition and outline just some of the activities and thank uh, those many people who were involved in the, the Australian Remembers campaign. Our, our year was launched by the Minister on an official visit on the 3rd of February, 
1995, he launched uh, the Australian Remembers campaign at the Breakwater Battery Museum at Port Kembla. And throughout the year, uh, the Breakwater Battery Museum was very much a focus point for us because we had various activities there. This was an old uh, coastal watchtower, and as you remember, as you would be aware, uh, being so close to the steelworks at Port Kembla, uh, it was the steelworks were a target, and it was a very, very important uh, aspect of it was uh, that uh, building that now is the Breakwater Museum. Uh, they had a, a display which went throughout the year, which was regularly changed, but uh, local activities uh, associated with our area. And of course, one of the local ac activities is that the Owen gun was invented by Elwyn Owen, invented and built at Port Kemla. And I heard the, the Honourable Member for Pearce uh, for talking about uh, the, the contribution of the women. Well, the women at Port Kemla made a magnificent contribution because they worked there in the factory building the Owen gun. And of course, uh, as the parliamentary secretary at the table would appreciate, the Owen gun saved millions of lives uh, because it could be dropped, you know, it replaced the L303, it could be dropped in the mud or anywhere and would fire. And that was uh, invented in my electorate and actually built uh, in my electorate. Um, the Illawarra Folk Club uh, put on a concert in March, and uh, that was so enthusiastically received that a tape was made of that. Uh, we had also displays throughout the year at the Tongara Museum. We had uh, all sorts of things, and that was a, a very local museum, uh, of almost a community museum at Albion Park, and it was very much Albion Park during the war years, and all sorts of uh, displays were put on there. Uh, the Port Kembla RSL had a magnificent ball in April, um, and in June we had uh, a golden wedding, wedding anniversary. Francis and Joanta O'Brien, they met. I actually think in your elector, I think they met in Townsville and were married in Cairns, or it might have been the other way around, parliamentary secretary, but they were there, and they now reside at DAPTO, and so we made that a feature. I know there were many golden wedding anniversaries during the year, but we featured on, on that couple, which symbolised so many other couples throughout the year. Uh, the Ruthietta, as always, uh, assisted us. Uh, they, uh, they put on a, a production which toured around the various clubs uh, there, and um, they had a cabaret style featuring songs and dances from the 1940s, and uh, as always, their enthusiastic youth group also wrote their own work and, and displayed it on. Um, it was quite a big day on July the 9th. That was when the Port Kembla RSL, we had a magnificent march through the streets, uh, the biggest one in the Illawarra, the biggest one in the Illawarra, and uh, we had everything there from old wartime vehicles to uh, detachments from all over, all over the Illawarra including uh, some of the land army uh, women in their blazers, uh, many others, and uh, someone that you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I know very well, Brigadier McCann, uh, did us a great honour of coming to Port Kembla and taking the salute and uh, staying with us for the whole weekend. So that was a, a tremendous effort uh, uh, there in Port Kembla. Um, I, throughout the year, I was constantly amazed at the inventiveness of people and the enthusiasm that they showed. We had a, a couple of rose uh, displays in uh, earlier March. We, we sponsored a, a rose display in which we gave prizes for roses symbolising peace. But at, that, at both that and again later in August, uh, where there was a more formal rose society Thing. We had a magnificent uh, display of peace roses, and that was uh, that was what do you say built or uh, arranged? That was arranged by Steve Astle. Um, I he actually he's a branch member, uh, but he put on, he made this most magnificent display of peace roses for both those. But there was a whole lot of displays. What we also did through the committee. We donated a, a peace garden outside the DAPTO 
the Dapto Senior Citizens Centre or the Dapto Community Hall. Uh, Wollongong City Council assisted us in preparing the ground and the Illawarra Rose Society uh, also uh, did a lot of work there. But uh, we actually donated the roses and I had a great pleasure uh, in October in officially opening that. But in August there was a, a tremendous display put on by the DAPTO senior citizens at Heinegger House in DAPTO and this was arranged by, by someone that we've all got in our community but whatever you want to do it's always there. Someone who, who is so enthusiastic for community activities and this person was someone called Charlie Farrell and he was a driving force behind that. Not only did they have this this exhibition which went over a whole weekend, but they had a, a tremendous concert at the end of it, and that was really good. At that though, during the war, there was a, a camp there, and uh, he got many photographs of that, so that was good. One of the highlights on the 8th of September, we had a ball, again, in association with the Ruth Yetta, and uh, a young student from one of the, the high schools who was on the, Dapto, uh, on the Throsby Remembers Committee, Julie Hamilton, she emceed uh, that ball uh, tremendously. And then for me, or for some of us, a highlight the next day is that the Throsby Remembers Committee sponsored a nine race meeting. And, uh, and that was a, and I actually won a little money. We thought that uh, that was good, not that I won money, but that we had a horse race day, that we took Kembla Grange horse race, a ho um, race course for the whole day and provided that. You'd be aware, Mr Deputy Speaker, that during the war, many of the surf clubs uh, closed down and because a lot of the young people were away. And one of the first uh, to reopen was the Shell Harbour surf club in 45, so we put on a surf carnival. We, we sponsored a surf carnival there. I did suggest that they wear the costumes of 45, but people laughed at me and said they'd be all moth-eaten, but we, uh, we had a photographic display there. We also had displays at the Unandera railway station, and the Unandera people put on a magnificent display, as indeed there was a very good display at the Albion Park railway station. and. Um, and, in, and indeed in Unidera again there was another thing, um, another activity. In Warilla we had the Warilla RSL arranged a day and a parade and on August the 15th not only did we have the big stamp launch again at the Battery Museum but again involving all the young people we had uh, outside the Breakwater Museum we had 50 trees planted but every tree was planted by a veteran and a young person from the primary school. And the stories that they exchanged when they were doing that were really tremendous. And, and they, they did it and uh, they've all given me a guarantee that uh, they will look after those trees. Also at the Mount Terry School, again, we printed a lot of trees there. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, there are many, many people that I should like to thank. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Gina Mandarinda from my office who was the coordinating point for all these. Uh, a young guy who knows more about war now and that not having ever experienced one, but I think he knows all about it. I'd like to thank Jean Gavin Gordon Street from the Ruth Theatre uh, and Sharon Bird, Tony Kent, Peter Morton from the Breakwater Museum, Keith Clements, John Collins Ray, uh, from the Rurilla RSL, Ray Wetherill from the Port Kembler RSL, Kevin Gillies uh, from the Tongara Museum, Lee Kramer from Shell Harbour Council. Bernard Egan from the local Red Cross, Seth Glenn Holmes, who's the mayor of Shell Harbour, Jim Derbyshire from the Tongara Museum, Bill Taylor from the Albion Park RSL, and Norm Harrison from the Albion Park RSL. Rebecca Park from the Lake Times, who gave us magnificent coverage throughout the year, magnificent coverage. Frank Larkin from Dapta High School, who coordinated many of the school activities. Alf and Norma Viles, Viles from uh, the Rural RSL, Sue Kingsford-Smith from the Rose Society, and we'll have that lasting memorial at DAPTO, the Rose Garden there. Um, Charlie Farrell that I've already mentioned from the DAPTO exhibition, Don Briggs from the surf, for the Surf Carnival, doing so much arranging of that at Shell Harbour Surf Carnival, and my friend Russell Henna from the Illawarra Folk Club. I'd also like, seeing I've got some time, to thank Mrs Norma Long, principal, and the students at the Mount Terry 
Public School and also Mrs Nell Hogan. Stephen Aspel, that I've already mentioned for his magnificent floral arrangement. Angus Campbell, who was the coordinator for the march and the activities at Port Kembla. And Port Kembla continued with activities throughout the whole year. And indeed, next Monday evening, I will be there presenting over 100 certificates of appreciation. Um, uh, Julie Hamilton, who coordinated the ball. Barry Banks, who's the principal of Port Kembla School, and his magnificent students. It was the students from the Port Kembla School who came down to the Breakwater Museum there in August. And it was magnificent. Each student went up to a veteran and, and so, like selected. It was like an old time uh, selection dance. They went up and selected a veteran, and each of them went and then planted the tree. And I, I didn't just plant the tree, they talked, they talked about the meaning of it and all that. It was magnificent to see that. Kenny Vaughan from the Western Suburbs Leagues Club, Keith Nolan for being such a, a magnificent helper to me in arranging the, the race meeting, Keith Nolan from the Illawarra Turf Club, Frank Larkin from the Dapta High School, Alan Smyth from Australia Post and Kevin Gillies. I'd also like to thank all those who sponsored race meetings, uh, the, the, uh, thank those who sponsored a race during the meeting. Um, what we wanted, we had each race sponsored, and um, and they sponsored that, and that enabled us to raise some money that we are going to use. What we are going to do, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is uh, put out a commemorative book uh, entitled "Throsby Remembered," and we're going to record, and we've been collecting photographs all through the year. I hope I don't feature in too many of them. But we've got these, all these photographs and these articles that we were publishing, and it will be a magnificent souvenir for the schools, for the people, and for the many, many thousands of people throughout the Throsby electorate who participated so fully, so fully in this magnificent year. I know we can't have another year like it, but I was always proud to have been a member of Parliament and have been so much part of that year. I thought it was a magnificent year. It was a year that, that had so much meaning to so many Australians, and I think it's tremendous that we will have this book and it will be a souvenir that many people, I hope, will cherish and I hope it will go to many parts of the world. We did remember in Throsby and we will continue to remember. The Honourable Member's time has expired. Oh, I got Honourable Member Latrobe. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the debate be adjourned. The question is that the debate, debate be adjourned and that the debate be resumed at a later hour this day. All those that opinion say aye, the contrary no, I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Banks. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, I present the Committee's report entitled a third paragraph of section 53 of the Constitution, together with the minutes of proceedings and evidence received by the Committee, and I move that the report be printed. The question is that the report be printed. All those that opinion say aye, the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I call the honourable member for Banks. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to table the report by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee on the interpretation and application of the third paragraph of section 53 of the Constitution. The third paragraph states that the Senate may not amend any proposed law so as to increase any proposed charge or burden on the people. This matter was referred to the committee by the House last year. The Senate Legal and Constitutional References Committee has a similar reference. The committee tabled an exposure draft in March this year. Submissions have been received on the exposure draft and the committee has taken these into account in preparing its final report. The committee considers that the task of the parliament is to arrive at the most sensible and practical view of the third paragraph of section 53. The view must be consistent with the broad policy of the section. It should be harmonious with the drafting history of the paragraph and the subsequent course of parliamentary precedent. And the view should be reasonably sustainable within the actual wording of section 53. In considering how to interpret and apply the third paragraph, the committee has focused on associating the broad policy of section 53 with the purpose of the third paragraph of section 53. The broad policy of section 53 
deals with the relationship between the houses in dealing with financial matters, with an emphasis on the effect on the people. The drafters of the Constitution recognised that there had to be a distinction between the powers of the houses in considering money bills. Section 53 provides that the Senate shall have limitations placed on its ability to originate certain bills and to amend certain bills. Where the Senate is prohibited from amending a bill, the fourth paragraph of section 53 provides a mechanism whereby the Senate may request the House of Representatives to amend the bill. From time to time, disputes arise between the Houses relating to when the Senate may amend and when it must request amendments. The limitations on the Senate's powers to originate and amend certain money bills are offset to some extent by the provisions of sections 54 and 55, which prevent the House of Representatives from abusing the privileged position in which it is placed by section 53. The broad policy of section 53 is often shortened to a simple formula that Section 53 supports the financial initiative of the House of Representatives. Within the section, the general language of the third paragraph ensures that the policy is not applied in a narrow or technical manner. It prevents a bill escaping the net of the broad policy on a technicality. The task of the committee in interpreting Section 53 in general, and the third paragraph in particular, is made more important by the fact that section 53 is not justiciable. The parliament will not be assisted by the High Court in its role as interpreter of the Constitution because the section, like section 54, addresses only proposed laws. It is concerned with the fate of a bill during its passage through the legislature, but once the bill is enacted, it will not be found invalid because it failed to comply with directions regarding its passing. While the non-justiciability of section 53 gave the committee a certain flexibility of approach, the committee did not feel able to ignore the High Court's findings on relevant issues. In particular, the committee felt bound to take account of the High Court's interpretation of imposing taxation for the purposes of section 55, because sections 53, 54 and 55 are part of a package designed to achieve the same end. The committee has interpreted the third paragraph of section 53 by taking into account the meaning of imposing taxation in the first paragraph of section 53. The committee has been assisted in its task by many very able constitutional experts. I would like to take this opportunity to express thanks to all those who assisted the inquiry particularly those who participated in the seminar on the topic. This seminar was an important step in identifying and crystallising views on some of the more difficult topics. Thanks go to Mr Lynn Barlin, Professor Tony Blackshield, Professor Michael Coper, the committee's consultant, Mr Harry Evans, Mr Ian Harris, Mr Dennis Rose QC, Professor Cheryl Saunders, Dr James Thompson and Mr Bernard Wright. I would also like to record my thanks to the Secretariat, particularly Judy Middlebrook, Kelly Williams and Michael Wright. The committee recognises that the recommendations may not, may not avoid all the potential problems associated with the application and interpretation of the third paragraph of section 53. However, we hope that our report narrows the areas of disagreement between the Houses. The committee has maintained its recommendation that there should be a compact between the Houses to deal with difficult areas of interpretation. The committee believes that its work will be of assistance to members of parliament, senators and parliamentary officers when issues concerning the interpretation and application of the third paragraph of section 53 next arise. I commend the report to the House. The Honourable Member for Tangney. Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, I seek leave to uh, make a statement in relation to the report. Is leave granted? Minister. The Honourable Member may proceed. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. I'm very pleased to uh, have the opportunity to speak on the tabling of this report. Uh, I believe it is a unique report in, in this parliament, and uh, let me say why a little later on. 
Under the Australian Constitution, there are separate functions allocated to the legislature, to the executive and to the judiciary. In Australia, the doctrine of separation of powers uh, is not so rigidly applied as it is under the United States Constitution. In the United States, the, it's suggested that each arm of government has a separate responsibility for the interpretation of those provisions of the Constitution that relate to it. In Australia, uh, we have to some extent a separation of powers, uh, and in particular, judicial power is vested exclusively in the High Court and in courts established by this Parliament. The consti our Constitution was written against a common law tradition that the courts would exercise restraint in interfering or intervening in the operations of other organs of government. Uh, we have therefore, for example, a, a common law doctrine of the supremacy of parliament and the common law principle that legislation is presumed to be validly enacted. On the face of it, however, we have no uh, imposition of restraint in, written into our constitution. Um, the common law tradition was well known to those eminent delegates who, to the constitutional conventions of the 1890s who wrote our constitution, uh, some of whom found their way onto the High Court. And the High Court itself has long recognised that in relation to some matters, most significantly the, what are described as the intramural activities of the parliament, that is those activities that go on in the parliamentary processes, uh, the court has a limited role or even no role. The effect is that some provisions of our constitution are regarded as non-justiciable, that is the High Court will not undertake any examination of them. Section 53 of the constitution deals with the respective powers of the Senate and the House of Representatives with respect to money bills. For example, uh, the first paragraph prevents the uh, origination of a, an appropriation bill or a bill of imposing taxation in the Senate, and the second paragraph prevents the Senate from amending an annual appropriation bill or a, a bill imposing taxation. The, the third paragraph uh, is, has been a cause of significant difficulties because its relationship with the other paragraphs is not clear and the scope of its language is not altogether clear. It's presented difficulties to the executive in preparing legislation and to the Senate and the House in their respective dealings with each other in relation to particular bills. The High Court has on a number of occasions, most recently in the case of Western Australia and the Commonwealth, the native title case, affirmed that section 53 is not for them to interpret. Against that background, the, the, the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs had a reference uh, to examine the effect of the third paragraph. Uh, contemporaneously, a corresponding reference was given to the Senate um, Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, now this Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee. This report is the result of the labours of the, of the committee. It's, it's unique, I believe, because it represents a formal opinion of a committee on constitutional questions not raised in a political context, but raised more in an abstract context. It's a unanimous report, have a, therefore has bipartisan support, and it results from uh, what to my uh, understanding is one of the most exhaustive studies of uh, such issues undertaken. In the course of its work, the, the committee examined the, the history of the drafting of the constitution, it examined the language of the constitution, it looked at the history of, of the application of section 53 over the uh, years since federation, it looked at relevant high court decisions, it received and studied expert legal opinion, it conducted a seminar uh, in which expert constitution lawyers and members of the committee debated issues and it con consulted the clerks of the two houses. The Senate itself has had significant input into the, into the report and the, the clerk of the Senate, Mr Harry Evans, was a, 
a frequent maker of submissions to the committee. The, the House Committee itself uh, met jointly with the Senate Committee for the purpose of, of progressing their respective deliberations. The, the result is the Committee's recommendation as to what is the proper interpretation of the third paragraph of Section 53. In situations not covered directly by the language, the Committee has recommended how, in practical terms, those situations ought, ought to be dealt with in the future. Uh, it recommends a compact uh, between the House and the Senate to provide guidelines for the executive and for the, the two houses in relation to particular situations. The notion of a compact um, is not new. There have been um, two arrangements that can be appropriately described as compacts in the past. Um, um, and it's to be sincerely hoped that this report will generate the third. I join with the chairman of the committee in thanking most sincerely the, those members of the secretariat who uh, assisted with the preparation of the report. They put in a, a, a not only long hours, but, but uh, I believe considerable skill. And the uh, chairman has mentioned those particularly involved. I join with him in, in, uh, in expressing appreciation also to those experts who offered their services and advice to the committee. And on this occasion, um, it's not always appropriate, I also offer uh, thanks and congratulations to my fellow committee members on the, on the work that they put into the report. I strongly commend this report to this House. I strongly commend this report to the Senate and I strongly commend this report to the Executive. The Honourable Member for Mitchell. I seek leave, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to make a short statement on the same matter. Leave is, leave is granted. The Honourable Thank you, Mr Deputy proceed. Speaker. Um, this has been one of the most interesting inquiries that the Leave and Constitutional Affairs uh, Committee of the House of Representatives have undertaken. Uh, the Constitution of Australia um, is a fascination uh, for lawyers, but a world unknown for the vast number of Australians who are bound by the Constitution of Australia. This uh, paragraph, uh, section 53, uh, uh, paragraph 3, uh, is perhaps one of the most obscure, but certainly one of uh, those paragraphs that has created some conflict and differences here in, in uh, this place between this House and the Senate. The examination of how that uh, uh, differently could be resolved has been a very interesting inquiry. I want to thank uh, Judy Middlebrook and the staff of the committee. I want to thank uh, uh, Daryl Mellum, the chairman, uh, for excellent chairmanship of this committee over the period uh, of the last parliament. And uh, it has been uh, in the highest traditions of, uh, of the process of the parliamentary committee. And I think that the work of the committee was uh, really brought to a, a very um, successful fruition with the presentation of this report. We took a tough line basically on the interpretation of expenditure and raising taxation. Uh, Harry Evans from the Senate was pretty compelling when it came to the end of the day, but there were still some areas that um, we were sure there could be possible conflict. And so the concept of taking a fairly hard interpretation and saying to governments, if you're going to introduce legislation into the Senate that raises taxes and, and, and have a process of uh, request or amendment, then you're taking a risk. And if you want, want to do that, well, that's your prerogative. But uh, we uh, basically recommend that uh, appropriation and taxes should be introduced here and amended here in this place. Now, it may suit government from time to time not to do that. And if the government chooses to ignore that process, which is basically inherent in the Constitution, um, if the government uh, chooses uh, to ignore that, then we've uh, set down a suggested process of agreement between the two houses uh, whereby uh, a method can be adopted uh, for uh, the solving of problems and the prevention of future difficulties. Um, I recommend uh, just uh, some portions of uh, this report as required reading for all parliamentarians. I suggest that they read uh, pages 60, uh, 163, 164, which epitomises the process 
uh, that we recommend. There still remains a vexed question, in my view, that uh, there could arise circumstances where a government is proposing a tax cut, where the Senate makes an amendment which actually increases taxation, but not to the extent that it, that it uh, raises tax to the original level before the tax cut was proposed. And it, uh, if John Hewson had been successful at the last election, then he had said, I want to tax cut personal income tax and have a substitute tax. It would be possible for the Senate to destroy the intention of the government by saying, well, we don't think tax, personal income tax should be cut to that extent. They could then, in fact, uh, move an amendment which increases the level of taxation above where the government wanted it to be, but still beneath the original level now applying. So that is a, a situation that we haven't uh, dealt with. The interpretations have been by the High Court that, uh, as a strict one, the increase in taxation should apply rigorously. I want to thank uh, all of those involved and commend the report to the House. The, on, on, the Honourable Member for New England. I seek leave to make a short statement on the same issue. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member may proceed. Mr Deputy Speaker, the question of whether or not the financial powers of this place are replicated in any measure by some interpretations of section 53.3 of the Constitution is important for two reasons. The first is that if, um, as a product of a disagreement between the, how the Houses, the uh, product of uh, section 57 of the Constitution is brought into effect and uh, there is a base from which a double dissolution can be called, there is quite a significant consequence. But determining the limits of financial authority of the House of Representatives was really very much in the minds of our constitutional forebears when the terms of section 53 were first drafted. Over the course of my time in this place, there have been a number of instances where we have had uh, discussions and uh, uh, some disagreements as to the actual capacity of the Senate to request or to amend legislation. The purpose of this report is to try and narrow the area of difference and to suggest that there are areas where a compact might now be drawn, hopefully leading to a satisfactorily resolution of those differences so that it will not be necessary either for the question of the application of 53.3 to be justiciable nor for there to be an application of section 57 and the processes for uh, the dissolution of the two houses. I think the report is really a very good uh, appraisal of a situation of very considerable importance in the practical application of a bicameral legislature. And I think it's important that we try and uh, find ways where there is any confusion in interpretation to adopt, as we've sought in this instance, a criteria which we believe can be accepted without in any way prejudicing the authority and ability of the, the Senate. And we've drawn a number of instances in our recommendations to procedures which we think can be adopted by the Senate which will avoid the inevitable problem that might otherwise flow. As I've been given the very generous three and a half minutes in which to cover the whole of the, the interpretation of the Australian Constitution, I really haven't time to say much more. I did want to say three brief things in the practicalities of it. The first was to the Chairman, the Honourable Member for Banks. Uh, I think that this report is one of the better reports that's come out in this parliament and I commend him for his initiative and enthusiasm not only in the drafting of the report but in the conduct of the committee. Those who are interested in the subject and who uh, uh, decide to read the report and consider it in detail will note that we in fact had a, a very interesting seminar which brought together some legal leading exponents in constitutional law, and that too was an initiative which I thought well worthwhile, and I'd like to express thanks to those who participated, Professor Blackshield and others, all of whom I thought made a, a very valuable contribution. Not the least of those was the man who sits silently to the right at the 
uh, of the uh, uh, the Speaker in this place, and that's the uh, Clerk of uh, the Parliament, together with uh, the Deputy Clerk and others. We've been very indebted to him on the way in which he's helped us in the interpretation of uh, the, uh, the provisions and the application of 53.3. I'd also like to, as others, send to, uh, to the Secretariat of the Committee our thanks. Uh, uh, Judy is a, an absolute uh, godsend. She's one of the outstanding members of the Secretary of Staff of this Parliament, and I think we're very fortunate in having had her assistance. But um, in the report are listed a number of other members who some seconded from uh, the Attorney General's, some who have given help uh, from the University, all of whom have played a, a particular role. Judy Middlebrook, Kelly Williams, Michael Wright, Professor Michael Coper, uh, Ms. Dyer Singleton and Ms. Annabel Lamb, each of whom have made a, a very worthwhile contribution to the committee, and I thank them for their role. And could I also say to the other members of the committee, I think it's been an interesting uh, report, an interesting study. I think the product more than justifies the time and effort they've put into it, and I commend each of them for the work they have done in producing what I think should form the basis of a worthwhile compact between the Senate and the House of Representatives on the interpretation of 53.3 of the Constitution. The Honourable Member for Sturt. Mr Deputy Speaker, I seek leave to make a statement on the report. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member may proceed. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, an inquiry into the operations of the third paragraph of section 53.3 of the Constitution is a subject of continuing relevance to the procedure operation of our democratic system. This exercise has been important because in assessing the competing views presented throughout the inquiry, we have come closer to discovering a proper relationship between the comparative powers and responsibilities of the respective houses. The tabling of the final report on the interpretation and application of section 53 Paragraph 3 is an event worthy of note, so I am pleased to have this opportunity, albeit a short, to speak. The final report makes 13 recommendations which the Houses can foster in reaching a workable interpretation of the third paragraph of section 53. The Committee has, has sought an objective analysis, and the interpretation is one designed to preserve the intention of the drafters of the Constitution, principally that the House of Representatives should have the initiative and principal responsibility in relation to financial matters. The committee has considered a number of factors relevant to the interpretation of uh, this section, namely the policy behind section 53, parliamentary practice, the drafting history of the third paragraph, the plain meaning of the words of the paragraph, the opinions of eminent lawyers and commentators, and the practicality and workability of particular interpretations. Although arguments about the justiciability of section 53 can be sustained, the committee has concluded that the provisions of section 53 are non-justiciable, as the High Court recently affirmed in Marbo No. 3, the State of Western Australia against the Commonwealth. Thus, in the absence of judicial pronouncements, the Houses would seem to remain bound by the legal meaning of the provisions of the section. In the opinion of the committee, the task of the Parliament thus is to arrive at the most sensible and practical view of the third paragraph of section 53 that is consistent with the broad policy of the section. After taking evidence from vast numbers of people and hearing particularly from the Clerk of the Senate and the Clerk of the House of Representatives, the committee considered that a test should be applied to determine whether an alteration in the Senate increases the proposed charge or burden on the people. I have spoken previously of my preference for the availability test in another place. This test determines an increase in expenditure by considering whether the amendment would have increased the amount available for expenditure whether or not any of the extra amount would likely to be spent. When Parliament makes more money available to the executive, that is a burden on the people, regardless of whether the money is actually spent. This test is most capable of application it is in that it is clear and unambiguous. It does curtail the power of the Senate to amend bills that authorise expenditure, but in my view this is consistent with the broad policy of section 53 that is to maintain the principle of preserving the financial initiative of the House of Representatives. The report recommends that the Senate should be required to make a request to the House of Representatives where an alteration to a bill is moved in the Senate which makes an increase in the expenditure available under the appropriation or the total tax or charge possible. The report includes a statement of principles for possible inclusion in a compact. The objective of the compact would be to assist in the practical workings of the parliamentary process and to define and limit the constitutional powers of both houses. It is the committee's view that these principles could form an innovative step 
in establishing a better dialogue between the respective houses. Such a comp compact is not to be between the government and the Senate, but between the House of Representatives and the Senate. The committee recognises that both houses will need to be prepared to make concessions to reach a workable agreement. Consensus wouldn't be easy. However, I believe the establishment of a compact would be indeed be a progressive undertaking. The preparation of the report has taken considerable uh, uh, hours of, of work, Mr Deputy Speaker. Up to two years of work for a three-and-a-half-minute speech is slightly ironic. But I would like to acknowledge particularly the Secretariat, the Chairman, and also Judy Middlebrook, who is the committee secretary, who I think could write a book on Section 53.3 uh, in her long-off retirement. <laughs> Not that it would sell particularly well, Mr Deputy Speaker, but at least she could write the book. I'd like to thank the Secretariat and my colleagues and commend the report to the House. The Honourable Member for Mitchell, did you no, want to no, speak with Lee? No, the Honourable Member for Banks. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask the Leave of the House to move that the House take note of the report. Is leave granted? We have no opposition. No opposition. The leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Banks. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the House take note of the report and seek leave to continue my remarks when the debate is resumed. The question is the debate. Oh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, the question is that the debate be adjourned and the assumption of the debate be made in order the day of the next sitting. Well, does the opinion say aye? Contrary, the ayes have it. The, the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We have some procedural hurdles to jump over, if you would Let's bear see how with we me. Go. Uh, I will begin by moving that that business intervening before order of the day number five, government business, be postponed until a later hour of this day. Well, the question, the, the question is the motion be agreed to. Will that opinion say aye? Country now, I believe the ayes have it. Okay. The minister. I ask leave of the House to move a motion to suspend so much of the standing and sessional orders as would prevent me from moving an amendment to Schedule 1 of the Electoral and Referendum Amendment Bill 1995 during the consideration of amendments made by the Senate to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The I Minister. thank the House. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Minister for Administrative Services moving an amendment to the Schedule 1 of the Electoral Referendum Amendment Bill 1995 during the consideration of amendments made by the Senate to the bill. Question is the motion be agreed to? All those opinions say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I believe the, the ayes have it. The clerk. Government business. Order of the day number five. Electoral and referendum amend amendment bill 1995. Consideration of Senate's amendments. The honourable minister. Having got that far, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I would I would like to indicate to the House the government proposes that amendments number two, three. 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9 be agreed to, and that amendments numbers 1, 8 and 10 be disagreed to, and that an unrelated amendment to Schedule 1 be made. A motion to suspend so much of the standing and sessional orders as would prevent the unrelated amendment being moved has been agreed to by the House earlier today. May I suggest, therefore, that it may suit the convenience of the House First, consider Senate amendments numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9, and when those amendments have been disposed of, consider the Senate amendments number 1, 8 and 10, and then the unrelated amendment which I propose moving. Is there agreement on that course of action? Well, if, that, if, that, if that's in order, I'll allow the Minister to continue. Come the Minister. Uh, I move that Senate Amendments number 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9 be agreed to. And uh, in so moving, I might explain generally to the House uh, the, the government's position on all the amendments, which will save us time as we proceed. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill passed through this chamber some six months ago and was eventually considered by the Senate on September 20, 1995, when four substantive amendments were carried. Two of them were of a minor nature, but involved changes to seven clauses. The government will accept the changes. Firstly, uh, the opposition wants the provision of electoral gender information on the Commonwealth electoral roll to be supplied to parliamentarians and political parties. This course is not supported by the Privacy Commissioner, 
who has been anxious to protect electors from harassment by commercial interests. The Privacy Commissioner's concerns are obviously genuine, and I recognise the strength of his case. All the same, the government is not prepared to lose the many other good things in the bill over this issue. Secondly, the opposition has removed the cost-cutting measure, which would have allowed the Australian Electoral Commission to, to advertise in one instead of two newspapers. Uh, the government is relaxed about this amendment. Amendments three and four go to much more substantial issues. The government actually supports the spirit of the opposition's amendments in both cases, but cannot agree with the manner in which they have been drafted. The Third Amendment seeks to eliminate discrimination against polling officials over 65 years of age. The problem arose when the Australian Electoral Commission announced that because it was not feasible to provide appropriate workers' compensation cover to over 65s, that the AEC could not assume the risk of taking them on as casuals at election time. This was a public service-wide problem, and the government has since agreed to legislate to ensure appropriate coverage. Unfortunately, there is insufficient time to put those changes in place before the 1996 election. I take the view that it is not sensible to create an anomaly with the Electoral Commission staff by giving them rights not enjoyed by the rest of the Australian public service. Instead, I have argued that we should solve the problem of the 1996 election by administrative means namely by the Australian Electoral Commission taking out private workers' compensation cover. Mind you, Mr Deputy Speaker, the AEC is an independent body and not subject to my direction in administrative matters. They have, however, agreed to take whatever steps are necessary to allow over 65s to be employed as polling clerks at the next election. And I think this means that the opposition amendment is redundant it's right, but it is redundant, and moreover, it's, it's been drafted in such a manner as that there is some legal doubt as to whether it would have the effect that the opposition in intended. And in those circumstances, uh, my submission is the opposition should not press this amendment and direct the Senate, uh, their Senate colleagues to take a similar view. In any event, uh, we are opposing the amendment. The Fourth Amendment uh, is the contentious one. It deals with the reoccurring saga of truth in political advertising. Uh, I will not delay the House with a long history of the many failed attempts to legislate to ensure that political parties and candidates are brought to book if they tell lies in election propaganda. What needs to be said is that the government made it clear when the Senate debated the Democrats' amendment to the Electoral and Referendum Amendment Bill that we agree with the principle of truth in advertising, but we do not agree with the form of the amendment that was carried. Our objection was based on the fact that despite the assertion by the Democrats that their amendment reproduces verbatim the South Australian legislation, this is not the case at all. Indeed, there are very significant legal differences, and if the Democrats persist with this false assertion, they could end up being prosecuted under their own amendment. Uh, the South Australian law makes it a criminal offence to print, publish or distribute during elections electoral advertisements containing statements that are inaccurate and misleading to a significant extent. The Democrats' amendment uh, is far wider in that it, instead of catching only statements of fact, it embraces statements generally. Further, instead of statements only offending if they are inaccurate in a significantly misleading way, the Democrats would now make it a crime to advertise in a way that is untrue and likely to be misleading or deceptive. That is a totally different concept involving the assessment of opinions and value judgments. But we ask why restrict the crime to advertising? It strikes me as passing strange that we should require truth in our newspaper, radio and television advertisements, but still allow the Leader of the Opposition and others to run around the country, as they have been, uh, equivocating about their policies and prevaricating uh, about things such as overseas debts and interest rates. We'd also want to put a stop to other highly objectionable methods of 
disseminating falsehoods about Labor candidates currently being used by the Liberal Party. I refer in particular to the disgusting American-style political practice of telephone push polling employed by the Liberal Party candidate for Eden Monero, Mr Gary Nan, in the last Northern Territory election and also in the Canberra by-election. Uh, the Liberal Party in those elections employed pollsters to spread false, highly defamatory material about Labor candidates to their constituents. We take the view that if it's wrong to tell untruths in ordinary advertising, it's just as wrong to defame candidates by the telephone, facsimile machines or by direct mail. There is also some doubt about the constitutionality of, of a proposed restriction on freedom of political communication in the light of the recent free speech cases decided by the High Court. As I've already stated, the government has serious problems with the shift in the amendment from the South Australian approach of strict liability concept of inaccurate statements to embrace the much vaguer concept of material that is untrue or simply likely to mislead. In the South Australian case of Cameron versus Becker, the statement was found to be inaccurate. The statement that was found to be inaccurate was that it was Liberal Party policy to close all schools under 200 pupils. And that was found to be an inaccurate statement of fact by the court. However, the Democratic uh, Democrats' amendment takes us into a world of intangibles, of value judgment. The South Australian Liberals' policy may not actually state, and did not actually state, that all schools under 200 pupils would be closed, but it may well be the inevitable outcome of a proposed budget cut or a change in staffing arrangements, and it may be perfectly appropriate to ask voters to draw such a conclusion. Do we really want to be bogged down in endless litigation about contentious value judgments? There are two other glaring deficiencies in the amendment. The most obvious is the perennial problem of different sets of laws on the subject around the country. This issue cries out for uniform electoral laws. We really have to put an end to election lies like those of John Fay in the New South Wales, Wales, last New South Wales elections, who ran fraudulent newspaper advertisements saying a Labor government would bring in new taxes costing $15 billion. The national and state offices of the Labor Party have indicated that they would like to see national legislations along the lines of the South Australian Act and have suggested that COAG should, be, should put that issue on its agenda. The government is considering that option, but in the meantime takes the view that this amendment should be considered by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, which is cu currently has a reference on push polling. Accordingly, I will be moving at another stage that this amendment be referred to the committee. The other glaring deficiency is the puny penalty being imposed, a miserable $1,000 fine. The man who is prepared to stand up publicly and utter the barefaced lie that all Australians owe a personal debt of $10,000 in respect of overseas borrowing by private Australian companies would not be concerned about having to pay a few hundred dollar fine. The Trade Practices Act imposes jail sentences and massive fines for very similar deception. Even the same section of the Electoral Act uh, being amended at the moment imposes six months jail for false handbills, pamphlets and notices. And if it's good enough to, to go to jail for six months for putting out a false pamphlet, why shouldn't you go to jail for, for running a, a long television advertisement that is just as false and deceptive? And uh, it seems to me that a thousand uh, dollar fine is really a joke and, uh, and indicates that the, the Democrats and the opposition are not at all serious with this amendment, that they're doing it for political advantage, not to produce legislation that is real or effective. If they are genuine about this issue, they would impose a realistic penalty. In conclusion, I would summarise the government's position on the Senate's schedule of ten substantive and seven consequential amendments. We accept the amendments numbers two, three, four, six, seven and nine, and we oppose the rest. Uh, the government, as has been indicated, is also proposing new amendments to, uh, to the bill in relation to funding and, and disclosure. In June of 1995, amendments were passed to the Electoral Act, allowing registered parties to enter agreements to redirect payments of election funding between themselves. At the time, the government made a commitment 
to the Australian Democrats that it would broaden these provisions to take into account uh, uh, the Democrat structure uh, as opposed to the other political parties, and the Democrats are different in their, in their constitutional structure. We've acknowledged this, and we've acknowledged they have a special problem in this regard, because there they have a network of unregistered <coughs> state branches as opposed to the other major parties which have registered uh, state branches. The government is now fulfilling that commitment. These amendments provide the Democrats with an option of requiring all payments of election funding throughout the party to be directed to the registered national organisation. I understand that the opposition supports this uh, proposal. The government is proposing to take the amendments even further and extend to all parties the option of entering into election funding agreements. This will allow parties which have unregistered state branches to enter agreements with those branches to redirect re funding payments. This overcomes the current anomaly whereby only registered state branches are able to enter such agreements. The question is the motion agreed to the Honourable Member for Bradfield. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a very important piece of legislation, made so principally by the fact that everyone in this House is well aware of the reality that over the next few months we will be going into one of the most hard-fought electoral campaigns possibly in recent political history. Having said that, we had hoped that the government would be at least honest to its own claims and take the opportunities presented in both the Senate and over recent months, and the minister made the point that this is not exactly recent legislation, to address some of the issues which were raised here and in the Senate by both the opposition parties, including the Democrats. The fact that the government has chosen to support some of these amendments, which are essentially of a non-contentious nature, relating to electoral funding and related matters, is well and good. There are, however, two issues at stake which uh, are worthy of serious consideration, even at this late stage. I note, for example, the Minister's observations in relation to the provisions for people aged 65 and over uh, not to be permitted to work for the AEC in the forthcoming election. I also note his provision or his proposal that the AEC, being a semi or quasi government instrumentality only, uh, should be authorised to enter into private uh, uh, arrangements to ensure that the workers' compensation is, is, is provided for those people. I think that is definitely a step forward, but as I have pointed out on this, in this House on many occasions, we have now introduced no less than four pieces of legislation, two in the Senate, two in this chamber, on the issue of age discrimination. It remains, in every sense of the term, a fundamental blot on the escutcheon of this government's approach to human rights and to values relating to people over age 65. I, like probably all other members, have been absolutely amazed at the flow of correspondence we have received from workers normally employed by the AEC who have simply received letters saying, sorry, you're healthy in every respect, you do a great job, but we don't want to see you at the next election because you're age 65 and because we've received a legal advice that the workers' compensation provisions may not uh, relate to you. The very fact that that had to go through such a long and lengthy process and has taken such a long time in the parliamentary context to address the issue demonstrates so clearly that this government quite frankly couldn't care a damn about those people. They are retirees for the most part. Many of them are retired teachers. They don't have large incomes. They want to supplement them at election time. They've done this work in year and year out, and they've done it very well indeed. And that's why we have persisted in taking the view that the legislation should have been amended. And I raise two important points in this particular regard. The Cabinet only a few weeks ago agreed to accept in principle that persons over the age of 65 should be entitled to remain in employment. And I trust that that principle also applies to the rights of those people to seek employment in the public sector. Now, the fact that that decision has been made by the Cabinet, the fact that only in this parliament this week I was able to prevail upon the government to accept my amendment to change the rules to allow people involved in the superannuation review tribunals to work beyond the age of 65, which previously the Act quite clearly forbade, and the fact that the government accepted that amendment simply puts into stark uh, contrast 
The question as to why is the government in this legislation not prepared to take a similar step forward. It is completely inconsistent that it accepts it in relation to the superannuation uh, complaints tribunal. It does not accept it in relation to the AEC or to other government instrumentalities. It is ignoring its own recent cabinet decision. It is ignoring a determination made by Minister Lee in relation to Betty Church's re-employment beyond the age of 65 as the director of the, the National Gallery. Uh, as I said, you have agreed to these changes, but here on this particular case you are simply not prepared to make the necessary step forward. The simple statistical fact is there are only 81 permanent public servants aged over age 65. We are an ageing society. We are a healthier ageing society. It is in the national interest and in the individual interest to give people opportunities, especially part-time working opportunities, to be employed for as long as they are so able to do. And it is totally unacceptable for the minister to come in here and put forward the view that uh, that is too difficult, it is too hard to change legislation when in his own admission he's had some months in which to take that through to its inevitable conclusion. I refer now to the second amendment, uh, which is a matter of considerable concern to us, and that is the question of truth in advertising. And again, Mr Deputy Speaker, we find the government once again being caught out on its own rhetoric. For example, its own national director, Gary Gray, recently said publicly that he supported truth in advertising legislation. And he backed that up by saying he also had the support of all the state leaders around, this, around the nation in the Labor Party for this particular proposal. And the minister has just made the point in, in uh, interpolating. He says, so do we. I'm delighted to hear that. But what we have not heard from the minister in this debate is if the government is so keen about truth in advertising, why is it that in the months that it has had available to it, it was not able to at least put forward a progressive amendment to the Democrat amendment, which could have been acceptable to the Senate and acceptable to the opposition in this place? Now, the truth of the matter is the best we've got out of the minister is to suggest that he wants to refer the whole thing to the committee. Well, I happen to be, for my sins, a deputy chairman of that particular committee. We've had a lot of trouble in this whole issue of push polling to get a, a, a unanimous report, and the prospects are that we won't. And the reason we won't is that the government consistently argues that it wants to be able to take a, sp a specific position in relation to push polling in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the Northern Territory experience or the ACT experience or the Queensland experience. When common sense would tell you, if you want to make progress on a complex issue like this, on which definitional issues are very, very difficult indeed, it is better not to play politics on what happened in the past, but try to agree to a set of principles which you can apply for the future. But I know that's not how this government wants to play it. This government wants to have its cake and eat it and be ultimately in a situation where nothing will be done about issues such as push polling because you want to be able to enter into the next federal election campaign without any strictures whatsoever of a legal nature on what you are going to be able to say about coalition policy. We know what your capacity is in this area. We suffered grievously in the last election campaign over the GST and other issues. We know from the evidence which has been tabled in this House and been brought forward in recent weeks that the ACTU, through the union movement, is already establishing now the structures for a major campaign basing on two words, fear and loathing. Fear of what a coalition may do and loathing what the implications of change in any area may be. And you are seeing editorial after editorial and comment after comment in the daily press making the point that this parliament is failing the Australian people and the political process if we are going to go into a situation where you simply do not enter into debate on issues because the opponent side will not take the issue on its, on its merits but will simply directly establish a position where fear and loathing of any form of change any form of change is to be the arbiter of the political process in this country. Is it any wonder that the opposition totally and utterly regrets, uh, rejects such a position? Is there any reason, therefore, why we should support in any shape or form? 
the propositions put forward by the minister here today. The truth in advertising at the legislative level is simply far too complicated and too difficult. He referred, for example, to issues that have recently been before the High Court, the free speech cases he referred to it. Well and truly so. Let's take the free speech case for what it's worth. Since when has this parliament abrogated its responsibility for determining the law of this land to the High Court? Some people would say you did in the case of the Mabo case. But you don't have to do it in issues such as this. We are the responsible we are the responsible party, this parliament and this parliament alone, for determining the laws of the Commonwealth. It is the responsibility of the High Court to interpret those laws. But what you have been told here by the minister, it is all too difficult. There is a free speech case which complicates the issue. I acknowledge that. But that is not in itself a sufficient argument for simply saying that free speech should not be the arbiter of the exercise and the truth in advertising is something that can therefore be ignored and perhaps put off for another time. When you examine in detail precisely what the Democrat amendment was all about, these are the key words. It talked about a person must not, during the relevant period in relation to an election under this Act, authorise the printing, publishing, distribution of any electoral advertisement which contains a statement a that is untrue and b that is or is likely to be misleading or deceptive. Now, obviously, in the normal course of events, all those words are subject to testing through the legal process. The test on whether something is true or untrue is a statement ultimately of fact. The testing of whether something is misleading or deceptive is ultimately the case of how it affects the person who is reading that material and how they react to it. Yes, these are complex issues. Nobody denies that. But that is not in itself a sufficient argument to simply say it can't be done, it's all too difficult. Let's go on as we are. The Australian electorate is simply sick and tired of the obfuscations of the political process and the fact that we have seen in this parliament in recent years a total denial of the significance of truth. And the outcome, the outcome of a recent, recent Royal Commission in Western Australia on one of your own very senior ministers demonstrates that for clearly for all to see. Bob Carr in New South Wales. And Bob Carr in New South Wales. Every parliament, every single government in this state in recent years, mainly the Labor Party, especially the last federal election, established a new low in truth in advertising and a new low in your approach to the political process. You may want to take the Australian people for granted. You may want to work on the principle that if you feed them rubbish long enough, they may be prepared to believe it. We have always tried to face the realities of this nation, the problems that this nation must face in the future. And we've always taken the view that you go out to the Australian electorate and you tell the truth. You tell it like it is and you try to identify people's problems, and you also have the courage of trying to identify the solutions. And it's in that context that ultimately the electorate has to make a decision as to whether they accept your solution or not. But that's not the way the Labor Party works in recent years. You have worked on a simple premise that power is absolute, power must be held at all costs, and sadly the evidence we have seen so often is that power does corrupt, and it's corrupted the Labor Party. It's corrupted you quite fundamentally over recent years, and we've seen evidence for that in this parliament day after day. The fact that you have a parliamentary system now where ministers don't even have to come in here on a daily basis to give an account of their stewardship to the, to the opposition, to the parliament as a whole and through them to the Australian people is a clear demonstration of the arrogance, the arrogance that's come with too many years in government, of too many years of absolute power. And when you have a situation like this, when an attempt is being made, a genuine attempt, despite the difficulties of the issue, to address the question of truth and advertising, if you had a semblance of honesty about you, you would at least have been coming into this chamber with a decent set of alternatives. Instead of that, we hear this muley mind approach, we'll refer it to a parliamentary committee. And I've said I'm on that committee. And I know how difficult it is to address some of these questions. And ultimately, when you want to politicise the issue as so much as it has been on that committee, progress cannot be made. 
because there's no middle ground. The middle ground has to be determined here in this House. It has to be legislated for by the Parliament. It has to be legislated for on amendments put forward by the government of the day. And until you do so, we will continue in the Senate indefinitely to be pushing these issues because they are issues of fundamental importance to the political process of this country. Honesty and integrity are the two words that too many people in this country no longer associate with, with parliament or with politicians or, or with anything else. <laughs> the truth of the matter is change must be started. There must be a step forward to try to make a better, more honourable system in the future, a basis upon which Australian citizens can make determinations about which government they want on the basis of facts accurately reflected in the political process at election time. And what we're seeing here today, therefore, is totally unsatisfactory, and therefore we reject the government's proposal in this particular area. Well, the question is that the Senate amendments numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9 be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Warringah. Okay. Uh, thank I, you. I thought the Honourable Member for Mitchell was sure. Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Honourable Member for Warringah. Thank you very continue. much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government's attitude uh, to these amendments uh, which have come down from the Senate and the government's refusal to accept these very reasonable amendments that have come down from the Senate means that we won't in fact have uh, truth in advertising legislation in place before an election. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, this suits the government right down to the ground because this government knows that if there is truth in advertising legislation in place, they simply don't have an election campaign. This government plans to run an election campaign based on lies and distortion, and that is why they are so hostile to any truth in advertising legislation in politics. The fact of the matter is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this is a delaying tactic on their part. They like to say that they are in favour of truth in advertising legislation. Their national secretary, Could Gary I just Gray, interrupt the honourable member for, 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 a, for a moment? Yeah. Uh, whilst, whilst the minister spoke to all the Senate amendments when he was speaking, and, and uh, well, I allowed the member for Bradfield to respond to those as well, the, the, the actual motion before the House at the moment is, the, is uh, that the House agree to um, certain amendments. The ones that the government, uh, I understand, are disagreeing with will, will, will come later. So you, you will have the opportunity to speak, on, to speak in support of those, of those uh, um, Senate amendments 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9 now, if you want to speak to, uh, if you want to speak on the ones that are being disagreed later, which the, mem uh, the minister has indicated. So just, just because I know the members only just come back into the chamber, yeah. so just, to, just to, is aware of where the debate is at the moment. Yeah. So. yeah well, well I, I, I take it from the speeches that I've heard, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we are that we are talking about the amendments order, which the Senate order. has moved. Order, members opposite. Uh, and this general principle of truth in advertising. Now the fact is, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the, the Secretary of the Labor Party, Mr Gary Gray, has recently said that he is all in favour of truth in advertising. It's good that he's been able to get this out in between the profanities uh, that he likes to, uh, to share with public audiences from time to time. The fact is that this government's attitude to the amendments which have come back from the Senate means that whatever the protestations made that there will not be truth in advertising legislation in place prior to the election. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this government regards truth in advertising legislation as poison. Poison, because it would absolutely destroy the campaign that this government plans to run. If truth in advertising legislation is in, pl is in place, any Labor, any Labor Party advertising, advertising featuring the Prime Minister would have to be a silent movie, Mr Deputy Speaker, because the Prime Minister can't help himself. Every time, he every time he stands up to talk, wherever it is, wherever it is, uh, distortions and misrepresentations uh, are, his, are his stock in trade. Are his stock in trade. I mean, just the other day, he stood up at the Metal Trades Industry Association dinner and made the most outrageous claims about coalition policy. He said that if coalition uh, policy was implemented, we'd have people shooting themselves in the street. That is precisely the sort of the sort of wild claim. The kind of claim that if it was made in business would be struck down by any amount of 
truth and advertising legislation. This is precisely the sort of wild claim that this, these amendments coming back from the Senate are designed to prevent and which this government is scared of. Is scared of. The fact of the matter is this government has shown what it thinks of the truth with its conduct in the case of the Minister for Health and Human Services. The Prime Minister, who liked to tell the Australian people the day uh, he entered that high and once honourable office, he liked to tell the Australian people he chose to tell them that he would not gild the lily, that he would be committed to the principle of truth. And what does, what does he do when he actually is faced in reality with upholding the principle of truth? He stands by a minister who has been found by a royal commission to have told untruths. And when put on the spot in this parliament, what does he say? He says, well, what's a little fib between friends? And then he has his minders go out and tell the press gallery that everyone does it. Well, everyone does not do it. It is an insult to every politician in this place for this Prime Minister to suggest that all politicians tell truth. Tell, untru tell untruths. How can the people in this House stand up and say to the Australian people that truth is important, that truth is central, that truth is the necessary prerequisite for any civilised dealings between human beings when this government, by its filibustering, by its obstruction, by its refusal to accept perfectly reasonable amendments passed in the Senate with the support of the Democrats, how can anyone in this country say that truth is important when the very government of the country is in the business of running away from truth? How can any of us turn around and say to our kids, truth is central, truth is absolute, when the Prime Minister himself insists what, what are just, what, what, what's a few fibs in parliament? It is an outrage, Mr Deputy Speaker, and what we are trying to do in supporting these amendments, what we are trying to do is to, is, is to put truth once more at the heart of Australia's public life. It's interesting watching members opposite uh, at the state, at the state and federal levels. Here they are. Here they are. It's interesting watching members opposite. Members opposite uh, go around in, in, in a strange double speak. I mean, there we are before the state election in New South Wales. We had the, the, the Bob Carr, the then leader of the opposition, running around the place saying, "Oh no, I'm not like Paul Keating. I'd never stand up and say in an election campaign that tax was LAW law. I'd never do that and, and then break the promise. Oh no, I'm not like Paul Keating. I wouldn't build a third runway uh, and promise you that it was going to mean uh, more takeoffs and less noise." And, and, and then produce a th third runway, which meant less take-ups and, and more noise. I'm, Bob Carr was saying, I'm not like Paul Keating. And now we've got the Prime Minister running around the place saying, oh, no, I'm not like Bob Carr. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a promise that tolls are coming off all, all those expressways. I wouldn't make a promise that, uh, that, that no charges are going up and then break it after the election. But the fact of the matter is, whether it's state Labor or federal Labor, it's still Labor, and people are realising that this generation of Labor can't be trusted, that the current lot of Labor leaders, the Keatings and the Cars, don't have the integrity that the Curtins and the Chifleys had. And quite frankly, if, if the Curtins and the Chifleys were hearing what this mob are saying, they would be turning in their graves. Let's look at the election campaign, which this government is trying to wage and is desperately trying to stop uh, this truth in advertising legislation uh, coming, into, coming into relevance for. This government wants to say that the coalition's industrial relations policy means that everyone's wages will fall. Wrong. Wrong. This, this opposition's industrial relations policy means that your wages can't go down, but they can go up. This opposition's industrial relations policy means that people would be able to take $15,000 extra if it was offered to them by their employers uh, for improvements in workplace productivity. The government is going to try to argue during the election campaign that if you vote for the opposition, you are voting to end Medicare. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. Medicare stays 
bulk billing stays. And what this government is terrified is terrified oh, of is truth in, truth in advertising legislation, which prevents it from going on with a campaign of lies. This government is going to allege that the opposition plans draconian spending cuts. Wrong, wrong. And these amendments that have come down from the Senate will quite properly prevent the government from making those kind of wild accusations. This, this opposition is in favour of cutting out the rorts, the rackets and the rip-offs, but we're not in favour of reducing necessary spending on important social services and important public programs. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we all know why the government is opposed to these quite reasonable amendments that have come down from the Senate. The government is opposed to them because the Prime Minister the Prime Minister knows that Truth and P. J. Keating are like Dracula and a wooden stake. That's the honest truth, Mr Deputy Speaker. Speaking of advertising, it was back in 1981 when the Prime Minister, who was then I think the shadow spokesman for Minerals and Energy, went into an ALP women's conference. He disgusted them all back in the days, back in the days when ordinary ALP members were able to be disgusted back in the days when standards hadn't been completely debased, he disgusted them all by coming in and saying that what the Labor Party needed in the run-up to the 1983 election was a really, really vicious ad man. A really vicious ad man. That's what the Prime Minister said then. That's what he's always believed in. That's what he's going to try to get before the next election, and that's why he's not prepared to accept these perfectly reasonable amendments that have come down from the Senate. You see, the Prime Minister, Mr Deputy Speaker, has never really changed his spots. He's never really changed from that young politician who was described by Alan Ramsey as uh, someone with some style, but the style of a street-smart hustler from the rough end of town. That's what our Prime Minister was, that's what our Prime Minister is, and that's why this government is not prepared to accept these perfectly reasonable amendments from the Senate. We have that celebrated memorandum penned by that famous and respected journalist Max Such describing the Prime Minister's attitude to the media, which we all know uh, is, uh, is, uh, can often be a form of advertising. Max Such said that the Prime Minister's attitude was that he would do deals for deals, that he would repay with favours uh, uh, granted for favours given. Uh, his conversation, he said, was littered with threats and references to getting even, with references to our crowd and their crowd. That's the kind of Prime Minister we have, and that's why this government is so opposed to the amendments that have come down from the Senate. The most outrageous example of this Prime Minister's attitude to truth was when, in that other Kirribilli House deal, he said to Conrad Black, who then owned 25 per cent of the Fairfax Group, I will, I will look at increasing your ownership if you are prepared to give me balanced coverage. What a condemnation of a man that that was what he was prepared to do, to trade the policy of this, to trade the policy of this country on the basis of, of some cheap and nasty favours, some biased reporting, some, some wrong advertising in an election campaign. Mr Deputy Speaker, every one outside this place is subject to all sorts of constraints on what can be said. People in business can't stand up and say whatever they like about, uh, ab about their business rivals. They can't stand up and say whatever they like about the quality of their products or the alleged inferior quality of their rivals' products. It can't be done. There is any amount of legislation in place. There are any number of common law rules to prevent, to prevent normal human beings, people beyond this parliament, from telling the kind of pork pies that this government and this Prime Minister deal in constantly. And if this government refuses to let truth in advertising legislation come into this parliament and be passed by this parliament, this government will be adding to the contempt in which the political process is held by most of the Australian people. This parliament should have a reputation for truth. 
This parliament should have a reputation for serious consideration of the great issues before the nation. The people in this parliament should have a reputation for dealing openly and honestly with the great issues before our nation. The people in this parliament should be seen as exemplars and paragons. They should not be seen as spivs and lightweights and liars. And if we are to have Order. in the public, Order. amongst the public generally, the sort of high reputation, the sort of honour which surely should belong to any parliament in a respectable and civilised nation, it is most important that we have political truth in advertising legislation. It is most important that these very reasonable amendments that have, been, that have come down to the Senate be passed. It is very important that this government does not use its opposition to, uh, to these perfectly reasonable amendments to deny the Australian people the truth in political advertising legislation that they entirely deserve. The, the, question, the question is the Senate amendments numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9 be agreed to be approved by call a, a government member, I think, for, um, the member for Patterson. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I must admit I feel very humble uh, following such an exemplar of virtue, such a paragon of honesty and truth. You know, I, I must admit all the time I was sitting listening to that, uh, that uh, I appreciated the member must have been converted on the road to Damascus, and I sincerely hope that Dr Peter Macdonald gets a copy of that statement because he will be most interested to read that you have been converted on your way to the election. Because there's no doubt that Peter Macdonald is an honest man. Peter Macdonald was dumped on by none other than the uh, member who has just spoken in a most disgraceful way. And you talk about honesty, you talk about integrity, I'm not sure how you can stand up and shave of a morning and look in a mirror. But I don't want to take a lot of time, Mr Deputy Speaker, because the honesty and integrity that has been proposed opposite, of course, we know never eventuates. It never eventuates from them at all. They take the moral high ground all the time. I got up here and spoke last night in the adjournment debate. I, I had to follow the member for Parks who'd spoken about law and order in New South Wales. He knew all along it was a state issue. And as I said then, and I'll repeat it, and I'll repeat it anywhere, I bet in the last seven years, while Faye and Griner were there slashing away at police numbers, he didn't issue one word of warning to them. If you keep cutting police numbers, you'll have trouble with law and order. Because they're not concerned about the real issues. They're concerned about appearance. They're concerned about how they dress, whether they wear the Australian flag or not. That's what they're concerned with. They're not concerned with what they say. Because if you have a look at half a dozen of their speeches, you'll find half a dozen different points of view on any issue. But uh, on this side of the House, we are interested in honesty, and we do pursue honesty at all times. And uh, I would just like to uh, go through some of the literature that the uh, pre-selected uh, person for the uh, electorate of Patterson is using because uh, some of it has uh, happened to just come into my hands. I have his CV here that he used for his pre-selection. And I just happened to notice the sorts of things that he claims to have done. And then I have a letter that was sent to uh, uh, the president of a probus club last week. And I noticed that, uh, oh, I think I can read this letter. With an election soon to be called, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce myself to you and your organisation. I come from a small business background, with a range of experiences from the wholesale and distribution to building and engineering disciplines. Where has this person been employed for the last four years? Is it mentioned here? For the last four years, he's been working for the New South Wales State Government. He's got a background in small business. Not once in the letter does he mention that he was given a job by Griner and the boys because he's a member of the state executive of the New South Wales Liberal Party. That's the honesty. That's the standard that you set. That's the hypocrisy that we continue to get from your side. 
and you have the gall to come in here and to lecture us on honesty, and at the same time you go and dump on people with the integrity of Peter Macdonald. I'm not, you know, I, I've just failed to to be able to bring the words together to describe the way I despise the the way you, you lecture us on these I might things. just ask the member for Patterson if he wouldn't mind directing his, his yes, comments I through will. the chair and, re and refer Thank to you. the members of the opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm sorry I'm emotional over this, but you know, there is just so much that you can take that you, you know, we get lectured on this side because we hold the seats that the coalition see as their own. The rural, regional, the marginal seats. I represent one of those. There, there is no such thing as a majority group in those electorates. You go out and you work with every group. You relate to them as a person. And uh, to come in here and to be lectured by someone who regards themselves as self-righteous uh, paragons of truth in this place while outside they live a completely different life. Uh, I think that sort of thing needs to be exposed. And so I simply rose today. I, I support the position the government is taking. And I rose today to expose that because it needs to be exposed at every opportunity. The double standards on every issue from the other side is not parliamentary. It is not acceptable to the people of Australia, and yet they make a, an art form of claiming uh, to be people of integrity. The fact is shown by this type of thing that they simply have no integrity at all. Thank you. And the question is. The question is that the Senate amendments numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9 be agreed to. There are members for the trove. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, a member for Patterson uh, just said it, didn't he? He talked about double standards. As I recall, Mr Deputy Speaker, yesterday, yesterday the member for Kalgoorlie talked about double standards, as I recall. And I think what he said was, isn't it really something when the Australian Labor Party the party for the battlers, supposedly, the grand old traditional party of Australian politics, the Australian Labor Party, is going to dump a member who tells the truth as he sees it and keep a member on the front bench who has been accused of telling lies. Well, that's the hypocrisy, and that's the double standard, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the member for Patterson talks about double standards. He needs to look no further no further than his own benches. And it is, it is quite remarkable, quite remarkable, that this mob that has been in government now for 13 years, which has got enough, enough background hidden back there, enough relationships uh, with enough vested interests around this country, right, en enough hidden and not yet exposed uh, difficulties in their own backyards, to not support, not support a legislative initiative which will give us at election time truth in advertising. It's a simple proposition. It's a very simple proposition. It's a proposition about number one, honesty, and number two, integrity. It says, it says we should give the Australian people the opportunity to judge which party will occupy the Treasury benches in this place, the opportunity to judge which one based on truth, based on propositions that each side puts forward which are based on truth, not on lies, not on L-I-E lies like taxation L-A-W-S that the Prime Minister offered ahead of the last election. I, re I, re I recall we legislated, we legislated to bring in tax improvements for Australian battlers, and they were legislated in LAW law, which turned out to be an LIE lie, because now they'll never be delivered. Because this mob, the Australian Labor Party, supposedly the party of the battlers, changed its mind. So what are we supposed to believe? 
I'll tell you what we believe. We believe that the Australian Labor Party, who represents the government in this place today, is refusing to support honesty and integrity and truth in advertising. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they've already started it, haven't they? We heard it yesterday in the matter of public importance in this House. We did. We did. We heard the members stand up and slate our side of politics basically on two issues. Number one, they said that we were going to cut pensions. We would not, not any longer support maintaining the pension rate at 25 percent of average weekly earnings. And yet, the Leader of the Opposition, in a very clear statement, made a guarantee to the Australian people that we, number one, would continue to index, index pensions at the rate of the CPI twice a year and that we guaranteed to maintain pensions at 25 per cent of average weekly earnings. So that was an LIE, and, and it, would never, it would never have stood up if you had taken the words that were spoken by the member for Perth and the member for Lilly in the MPI yesterday, and you put them out in a public forum, if you'd taken them out of Coward's Castle, out of his house, put it out on a doorstop, out the front, they would never have passed, passed the test inherent in this amendment to your piece of legislation. Wouldn't have passed. Not a prayer of passing, because it was all wrong. It was all distortions. And there was a second lot of distortions in the matter of public importance yesterday in this place spoken by the member for Lilly and the member for Perth. And they talked about our industrial relations policy. The, 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 or, or the, the minister on point of order. This amendment is not about what is said in this parliament. It's not an amendment to the standing orders. It's an amendment to the Electoral Act dealing with advertisements at election time. And whilst I'm, I'm happy for the debate to proceed as it, as it is, uh, the subject matter shouldn't be about what is said in this parliament. It should be about advertisements at election time. Yeah. I think what the minister is saying to the, has got so, some, um, some credence because the, the amendments before us are the ones that the government is agreeing to, I understand. But the, there's, there's the other amendments that have been disagreed with, the, the minister himself spoke about those when he spoke, and, and other members uh, in response have also um, Respond to those as well as I mentioned to the member uh, to Ringer before. So I would just ask the the honourable member if he could stick to at least the um, the debate, the uh, amendments that are proposed from from the well, Senate. I, I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I and I hear your words, and I'm simply discussing the issues which were raised by the minister at the table when he spoke. And so and so clearly, precedent has been established. The member for Ringa, and the point I was trying to make about the the MPI yesterday is a simple point because it represents the kind of words that the Australian Labor Party will use in their advertisements at the next election to try and denigrate the Liberal Party and the National Party on their policy position before the Australian people. Right? And they would never, ever pass any test of truth in advertising. And I'll tell you, what, the, what did these amendments say? It said, the amendment as proposed says a person must not, during the relevant period in relation to an election under this Act, authorize the printing, publication, or distribution of any electoral advertisement containing a statement A, that is untrue, and B, that is or is likely to be misleading or deceptive. Well, I'll tell you what, the entire proposition of the matter of public importance yesterday was a matter of misleading and deception, and it was designed to mislead the Australian people. It was designed to deceive the Australian people about the policies of the coalition. And that's really what this issue is all about. So we have the Labor Party, who, who out in the public call themselves the champions of the people, refusing to process an amendment to this important bill to guarantee the Australian people that when they read advertisements during this upcoming election campaign, whenever it is, when they read advertisements, that they will represent the truth. They will represent honesty and integrity. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know, the Australian people tell us they've had a gut full of politicians. And I don't know about you, but I get letters in my electorate office when I go out and ask people what they think about certain issues. I get letters from people, and they are concerned about the standard of debate in this place. They're concerned about the standard of language used by politicians, and they are concerned about the issue of truthfulness. Terribly concerned about it. And do you know, survey after survey after survey tells us that politicians rate 
on the approval ladder in terms of integrity somewhere between used car salesmen, real estate salesmen, and dog catchers. Dog catchers. I mean, they, they really think a lot of us, don't they? Do you know, before this mob, before this mob came into government, before 1983, politicians were reasonably well respected in this country because people thought that they represented, they represented honesty and integrity. They thought, they thought that their members of parliament were there to represent their interests in this place and they thought that the House of Representatives was a chamber that mattered. Well, that's changed a lot since 1983. Thirteen years worth of the Australian Labor Party has seen politicians denigrated. Why? I mean, you, you need look no further than the former treasurer, current prime minister, the kind of language that he uses at question time itself. Full of hyperbole, right? full of innuendo, very colorful, but often misleading and frequently not to the point or true. Now, I, you know, I talk to my school children frequently. It's, it's one thing that I do in my electorate as a very regular exercise is go particularly to primary school and talk to the school children about what democracy is all about, about how this House works, how the Senate works, and how our system of government operates in this great country. And, and those kids, those kids always see of this place is question time. And I tell you what, they don't think a lot of what they see. They, they, they think, oh, it's a bit of fun, but gee, couldn't you get serious? I mean, are there serious matters that you address in the parliament when you're there, Mr. Charles? They say to me, and I tell them about committee work, but I can't tell them much about debate on bills in this place, because very seldom we have real debate, because the government refuses to listen. And they're not listening on this occasion on an amendment to an important bill, the Electoral and Referendum Amendment Bill, 1995, an important amendment to this bill, to an important bill, which should be passed. And, and the government is not listening because the government has an intention of running an election campaign uh, in 1996 that will denigrate the Liberal Party, will denigrate the National Party, will misrepresent our policy position on just about everything you can think of. You know, th they will say, this mob over there, Mr. Deputy Speaker, he will say that our industrial relations policy will make everybody worse off. They will say our policy will represent take the job or take the sack. They will say we are going to destroy society in Australia as, you, as we know it. They will say that we will again raise and exacerbate any class war system. They will say that Jenny George is right and that it's time for the workers to take to the street again because the Liberal and National Parties will bring in an industrial relations system that makes workers, makes workers uh, somewhere akin to third world, third world uh, people in terms of their salaries and their take home pay. Well, that's all rubbish. That's all lies and it's all distortions and it's all mistruth. Because our policy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, our policy is a high wage policy. I've always said that and I'll always say it. Our policy is a policy to achieve cooperation in the workplace. It's a policy to achieve better outcomes for Australia as a whole and for Australians as individuals. Uh, but the Labour Party will paint it with the blackest of hues and, and they will make us out to be worse, worse than Hitler when it comes to operating an industrial relations system. So we need truth in advertising. Boy, we needed it in the last election campaign too, I can tell you. We needed it badly. I, I remember the bloke that stood against me, the, the Australian Labour Party candidate that stood against me, his name was Payne, and he was too. He was a bit of a pain. Mr. Payne, well, Mr. Payne, Mr. Payne made assertions about me and my attitude to uh, nuclear weapons because I had the audacity to give a speech in this House about the Office of the Supervising Scientist. Well, fair dinkum. So he said I was in favor of covering Australia with a nuclear industry. I was in favor of nuclear warheads and nuclear weapons. But the lie, the lie that that was, was disproved uh, when I marched with others in this place on the beach at Papiete in, in, in anger, in anger over French resumption of nuclear weapons testing on Muro Rock. And it's that kind, that kind of advertising that we want to wipe out. We'd like 
this upcoming political battle to be about the truth. We would like to be able to say the Australian economy is headed back down again because it is. Right? And know that we can honestly say that and stand up in front of our peers and stand up in front of the public and know that that will be believed because it is the truth, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Australian economy, the Australian economy is headed for the rocks. Unemployment is headed back up again. Companies are building stocks, building stocks not on purpose. They're building stocks because they thought they were going to have a market for Christmas. But I'll tell you what. Myers and Woolies don't the think there's a market Patterson for Christmas, and DJ doesn't think place. there's a market for Christmas. They don't. They don't. And they're not buying for Christmas because the Australian public confidence is falling. And we want to be able to say that honestly and truthfully and with integrity at this upcoming election campaign. This mob over there, this mob over there wants to tell lies, create distortions, tell untruth, paint the Liberal Party policies in the blackest of hues. And they want to be able to do it and get away with it. And that's why, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they won't support this outstanding amendment to this important bill before the House. Do you know, do you know wait, one of, I talked about schools. Well, I've got, I've got a school from my electric Gladesville Primary School is here today. And, and they asked me, they asked me at uh, uh, 10 o'clock when I went to talk to them in the Parliamentary Education Office, uh, they said, are you going to speak in question time today? I said, no, I don't think so. Well, if, you're, if Gladesville Primary School is around the building and looking at any of the monitors, at least they, those kids will know that I am standing on my feet in this house representing their interests and standing up for honesty, integrity, and for believable politicians, for believable members of the House of Representatives. That's what I stand for, not like this other mob over there who stands for distortion and lies and untruths. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we must, we must, we must support this outstanding amendment. And I call on the minister. I call on the minister to respond appropriately. Uh, the, question, the question is that the Senate amendments numbers two, three, four, five, six, seven, and nine be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Mitchell. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the very day on the front page of the Australian, when a news poll appears indicating the community attitude toward the Prime Minister, on the very day when that news poll of Australian citizens says that the weakest spot in the whole of the government armoury and the armoury of the Prime Minister is his trustworthiness, the government is introducing amendments to the Electoral Act that will deny the opportunity of the Senate to have their way to make truth in advertising one of the planks of their platform. On the very day that the untrustworthiness of the Prime Minister is recognised by surveys and polls around Australia, you are refusing to rectify that uh, precept, that, that concern expressed by Australian electors. You are refusing to recognise that concern by bringing truth in advertising for political parties. Now, why don't you do it? It is so simple. The amendments. I've been uh, through the Senate, approved by the Senate. Political parties except your own and the independents in the Senate have said to the House of Representatives today, here are our amendments that we want to see to the Australian Electoral Act. And they cover things such as elections and referendum. They cover the whole of the advertising spectrum. Because there is a concern in the Australian community that there is not truth here in the parliament and particularly from the Prime Minister. When one compares the news poll results, one of the strengths of John Howard is his trustworthiness. Now, that's why we are for this proposal. But the, the government itself, when it recognises that Paul Keating, the Prime Minister of Australia, is weak on trustworthiness, they're endorsing, underscoring and emphasising that untrustworthiness by not being prepared to bring truth in advertising to the election process. Now, when one goes back over a period of time, one can understand why that would be case. the case. Budget after budget, the Prime Minister says we're home and hosed. Even in the middle of the recession, we had John Dawkins saying this is a self-healing budget. Everything, if it doesn't look good, it's got the capacity to spring back into shape like it has some inbuilt memory in the budget that will restore it to stability. I remind the House of some of the other comments that have been made. For, um, for instance, when one looks at the uh, 
return to surplus that was proposed for the next, uh, for the next budget. We had John Dawkins say uh, back in 1993 that everything was on track, and I quote from Mr Dawkins at that time, I'm conscious of the fact that we have self set ourselves a target order, that the by 19... Order. The minister, the, the minister on a point of order. The minister might just resume his seat for a moment. These uh, amendments the are about electoral advertising, that is, advertising at the time of elections. It's nothing to do with, with past budgets by past treasury. Yeah, I, I yeah, acknowledge the, uh, the truth or, 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 in what... Wait, uh, wait a minute. I'll just rule the point of order. <laughs> No, the, I mean, the minister has raised a similar point before, and I just, I just asked my member to try and uh, keep the amendments as much as he can. And we, we have allowed a bit of latitude with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the other uh, amendments that haven't been accepted in, uh, in, in, in this debate. So I ask my member. Uh, oh, I, I, I appreciate his intervention and yours too, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, because I've got copies here of Labor Party and some of these, and the uh, honourable member at the table saying these prices will rise by 15 per cent. I've got some of the member for Macquarie's too, saying that during the last election uh, campaign that all prices of all goods will rise by 15 per cent. What a blatant lie. I've got here an adver advertisement. I'll find it for you and hold it up for you, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I'm sure that you would like to, to refresh your memory no, of, uh, of uh, some of the of the statements that were made during the last election campaign. Public telephone rise. 40 cents per three minutes is the claims of the Australian Labor Party stop use and vote Labor. That's your advertising, lies and false advertising. If you take that to the court, it could have been demonstrated quite easily that a 15 per cent goods and services tax would not amount to that sort of a rise or restricted telephone calls. And today we have the Australian Labor Party standing back while Telstra looks at regulated, limited local calls within Sydney and Melbourne metropolitan areas. Telstra is doing that. You made the claims of the last uh, election that Dr Hewson's 15 per cent GST would increase telephone calls not by 15 per cent but by 30 per cent, is your claim. That's false advertising on any account. And then at the same time to make the gross statement that there would be a limit of three minutes to local calls, that is another lie. Now why won't you bring in this advertising? The only the restriction on advertising, the only reason you won't do it is because you're going to run a campaign, as suggested by the ACTU, of fear and loathing, and that will rest on lies and untruth. Your campaign will be a campaign of denigration based on lies and untruth. The only reason why you won't bring in this legislation, these amendments, and approve these amendments proposed by the Senate. Now, if you are in a weak, a weak situation and we see the Prime Minister searching his day, Mr Deputy Speaker, for a hook to hang the next election advertising on as he goes from industrial relations across to the integrity of the uh, Leader of the Opposition to health in one instance, to the integrity of the Leader of the Opposition, to education to the Leader of the, uh, and integrity to jobs. One thing after another he's searching to find some area where he can hang a shred of, uh, from a shred of truth a whole election campaign based on loathing and fear, and uh, the advertising of which will be distortion and lies. Now, if that were not the case, this House today could approve the amendments of the Senate. Just with a flick of his pen, the minister sitting at the table could approve this process and we would have in the statutes of Australia, in the law books of Australia, we could have truth in advertising for election campaigns. You could do it just by saying yes right this minute. You're not prepared to say yes. You're not prepared to approve this truth in advertising. You're saying no, the minister's saying no, and repeating the word no. The only reason that the government would not want to approve this legislation is not for the content or for any technical reason, but purely because they wish themselves in this, this election campaign. They wish to run a campaign which is both misleading and false. And that'll be the basis of their campaign. I could go back through the election campaign results. 
What about the way in which the, the, and the results and the processes used by the Australian Labor Party? See, the New South Wales uh, branch of the Australian Labor Party, the Carr government, they won't introduce this legislation in New South Wales either because we've seen the fear and misleading advertising, the, the, sort, of, uh, the sort of advertising that was run during the last state election campaign of the fear of obnoxious waste incinerators in electorates where there was no chance of them ever being built. Scare campaign and lies. We've got the process of, of uh, the way in which for electorate after electorate in New South Wales, false campaigns, scare campaigns were run in letterboxing, in, uh, in billboards, in advertising. Now, your own ministers are setting the whole process up already. Day by day, you are setting your campaign up. We've got the Minister for Education doing things that will change the benefits to families, but denying that he's made those changes, telling me in the parliament that uh, assurances have been given and everything's right. Completely wrong. We've got the, the Treasurer himself saying the economy's on track and everything's going to be right. We're still running a billion and a half deficits month after month, which is going to keep interest rates high and which is going to force unemployment up. But you're going to deny that. You're saying we've got so much growth that everything's going to be terrific. Everything's going lies, supposition, falsehood is going to be the basis of the election campaign that you are going to run. If that is not the case, if you are not going to run a campaign of that type, You've got the easy proposal here right in front of you today to accept that there should be truth in advertising for election campaigns that has gone through the processes in the Senate and has gone through the processes properly. You can easily, you can easily move to a point where you adopt this legislation, pick up the Senate amendments and you will find that uh, you will have support on this, si this side of the House. Some of the statements that have been made by the Prime Minister over the years, particularly prior to the last election campaign, when I've got here pages of promises that you made that you've not delivered on, pages and pages of them. Some of them are so extraordinary. I thank my colleague Senator Jim Short for producing this just after the election campaign in 1993. And, uh, do you want me to read some of them? Because uh, this just goes to prove the point that you've, you, you intend to make commitments to the Australian people, things like free dental care under Medicare, purchasing private hospital beds. We remember all of those things. We've got them listed. We've got them listed. All of the promises that you've broken, and it's your intention to make the same promises to uh, fabricate a campaign based on lies and falsehood, encouraged by the uh, advice of the ACTU to make your campaign one of fear and loathing. And you know, look, let's, they're, they're terrific. Some of these promises that you've made, because they affected uh, great sections of the Australian community, but they're all lies. Allow superannuation to be used to purchase homes. There's another one I just pluck out of the air. Establish an Asian economic centre. Well, how you've got some right across the board. All of this wish list of stuff. Establish a Department of Regional Development. You know, um, expand group employment and training. Well, you've done that, but the trouble is that you're changing them so frequently they're not getting the results. And as my colleague at the table has said here time and again, thousands, millions of dollars and many of these programs are not producing the results that you've claimed. Um, I, I've mentioned uh, some of these things, like the free uh, dental care under Medicare, the expansion of post-acute palliative care, uh, the, the extend the eligibility of the development allowance. Look, they're, they're just minister after minister has put their shopping list in. You announced the lot prior to the last elections as being, in fact, your, your policy and your intention. Abolish the waiting period for the, um, for the job search allowance. You're going to abolish the waiting period. Childcare cash rebates. Well, you've fiddled around with that, and the legislation's been through the House, Commonwealth the Bank, Development Bank, extra funding. You're going to sell the Commonwealth Development Bank. You don't even know what you're going to do with the Commonwealth Development Bank, but it's going to be caught up in the sale of the Commonwealth Bank. All of these promises 
you made prior to the last election, and they were false. They were lies. And you knew they were lies because you knew you could never pay for them. Now, one way you can abolish the, the uh, lack of credibility that you've got in the eyes of the Australian community is to bring in this, at this, these amendments so the next election campaign, right from today, there will be no political party in Australia prepared to run false and misleading advertising for the Australian people. But no, you're going to reject this legislation. You're going to reject these amendments. We're going to vote for it. You're going to place yourself in the, the prospect, Minister, of uh, voting against uh, the provisions of this, this, ad, this uh, amendment, these provisions saying there should be truth in advertising. Advertising should not be misleading. You're going to vote that down. You're going to vote against truth. You're going to vote against integrity in advertising. But you can bring your parties in, to, your party in and have that happen. Because the fact of the matter is, what it will do is reinforce the community attitudes against you and against the um, Australian Labor Party in particular, against the Prime Minister. We've got. Uh, oh, I've just been reminded of your promises about superannuation. You can go on and on and on of the promises that you've made and the promises you've broken, of the advertising that you've put out and the advertising that is false and misleading. So uh, with, the, uh, with the opportunity of rectifying that and putting integrity back into the perception of the Australian Labor Party, you've rejected the whole process. It's a sad day for the Australian Parliament and a sad day for the Australian people. Here's your one chance to rectify many problems you've rejected. You're going to vote against truth and integrity in political advertising. It's a great shame and shame on you, Minister, and shame on your party for contemplating that there should be lies and misleading statements accepted as part of advertising in, in uh, election campaigns in Australia. It is a great shame you've decided to do this. You had the option of coming clean and doing it well, but that's not your intention for the next election. We know what sort of a campaign to expect. Fear and loathing and lies. Order. The, the honourable member's campaign. time has expired. Uh, the, question, the question is that the Senate members numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9 be agreed to. And no more speakers. The minister not responding. Okay. The question is that, motion, that, motion, that the uh, Senate amendments numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 9 be agreed to. All those opinions say aye. aye. Uh, say aye to the contrary. Now I believe the ayes have it. The the, the honourable minister. Deputy Speaker, I move uh, that Senate Amendments No. 1, 8 and 10 be disagreed to for the reasons that I have given earlier. Okay, the, 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 the motion is that the Senate Amendments Numbers 1, 8 and 10 be disagreed to. All those opinions say aye. To the contrary, no. I believe the ayes have it. No, Savers? Do I hear two people? Yes. Division, division required. Division required. Ring the bells. I'll take it for you, Mayor.
Lock the doors. The question is that, a, that Senate amendments numbers 1, 8 and 10 be disagreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and those to the left. I appoint tellers for the ayes, the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. Tellers for the noes, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina.
Order. The result of the division is eyes 71, noes 56. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, for the reasons previously given, I move the amendment <coughs> to Schedule 1 as set out in the schedule circulated to honourable members, and I table the supplementary explanation. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that Mr Griffin, Mr Chenoweth and the mover be appointed a committee to draw up reasons for the House of Representatives disagreeing to amendments numbers 1, 8 and 10 of the Senate. The question is that that motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Minister. On behalf of the committee appointed to draw up the reasons for the House disagreeing to amendments numbers 1, 8 and 10 of the Senate, I present the reasons which are being circulated to honourable members. No, no, he hasn't done anything yet. Hang on. Uh, and you move. He's busy uh, circulating. <laughs> and the minister now moves. That the committee's reasons be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Minister. I move that, it, that in the message returning the bill to the Senate, the Senate be requested to reconsider the bill in respect of the amendment made by the House of Representatives to Schedule 1. The question is that that motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Next order of the day, Australia Remembers 1945-1995, Ministerial Statement, Resumption of Debate on the Motion to Take Note of the Paper. The question is that the paper be taken note of. So the Honourable Member Dawson. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, thank you, for, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for the recognition and being able to speak to this bill. <clears throat> and could I say at the outset how appropriate it was in this year of 1995 that all Australians had a chance not only to remember but also to really gain information from a world war that did preserve Australia's democracy by the sacrifices of many people overseas and both in, in Australia itself who served at that time. Particularly appropriate because uh, without knowing the actual statistics I would imagine that 50 per cent of the Australian population today in 1995 would not have been alive in, uh, at the, during the war or at the cessation thereof. And so it was going to always be a very important part of uh, this uh, year that we did something that was appropriate to uh, pr provide a culture, particularly with our uh, students and uh, those still at school uh, and those younger people, a type of culture of what Australia was like then and what we were fighting for. And uh, I found this the most uh, appropriate part of the whole program. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, in saying uh, that, I, I would understand that time will have dimmed not only the event but the recording of those times would have been altered to what the actual uh, facts might have been at that time. Uh, and uh, the, the most glaring example of that, of course, is to try to understand the hardships and also the, uh, uh, what people sacrificed in those times to provide Australia and also the world, the free world, with a successful conclusion of that uh, war. And so uh, I, I, I can recall quite vividly that one of the projects that was early muted, I think, uh, just amplified uh, what, was going, what, what we'd like to do, and that was to get the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels, those people who participated so closely with Australian troops uh, in uh, New Guinea to try to get them associated. And unfortunately, while we just couldn't make that connection to bring them to Mackay or into Dawson to, uh, to relate to that, those events and those people, it was successfully concluded in uh, Townsville, and Townsville being a bigger centre and also more to remember by the actual presence in the war at that time, that uh, they did that quite successfully. But there was an attempt made, and I believe that trying to uh, draw those people who were here in Australia at that time draw those people uh, of the present generation to uh, a realisation of what happened. And uh, in all respect, I've got to say that the uh, program Australia Remembers 1995 
was very important for Australians to try to regain some of the culture of the war. And uh, we all know how much uh, uh, that has been lost in the meantime. But <clears throat> in another sense, too, uh, when I say that history has, or time has that uh, opportunity of dimming people's realisations of what might have happened, and I know it has already been mentioned in the House in this debate about the Hiroshima uh, bombings, Nagasaki bombings, and I think we have to put that into the, uh, in into the category that if it had not have been for that, if it had not been for the uh, explosion of those bombs, the war would have continued to grind on at greater sacrifices, both by the Japanese and the Allied uh, forces, to, uh, uh, if that hadn't have happened. Now, uh, that is no, by no means same, and I think we all agree that the abhorrence of the French test at the moment is something that uh, is to be decried, that it was important to remember what things were like in 1945, why it was done, why the Allies uh, did do it, and uh, the means in which that war was successfully prosecuted so soon after that event. Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, I would like to pay uh, tribute to the committee that uh, tried to bring this program together, as I said. Uh, we operated on the basis that there was uh, no political—the uh, you know, the whole celebration was not to be political. And as a result of that, I got employer organisations within the committee and also the union movement uh, delegates, uh, the RSLs, and I have to mention Mr. Kevin Plum, the deputy or the uh, the chairman of the Mackay uh, Regional RSL, himself a Vietnam veteran, uh, a chap who uh, perhaps wasn't even born at the cessation of uh, of hostilities, uh, as chairman, along with other RSL delegates. In fact, what we did do is ask the RSL to act as the trust fund in order that the payments that we received could be paid out. And uh, I just pay a tribute to all those people from the RSL, from the councils and uh, from those other organisations who helped out in such a meaningful way. Uh, perhaps Mackay could not celebrate as many of the other northern centres could because Mackay, even though it was in North Queensland and certainly north of the Brisbane line, uh, we were not uh, a part of the war, except to say that in the Coral Sea battle, the Allied fleet actually anchored within the Whitsundays at Sid Harbour on Whitsunday Island before they uh, pushed themselves into that Coral Sea battle. Probably the first battle, uh, war, uh, naval engagement, where the ships were not in sight of each other, they fought each other uh, from aircraft carriers, and that was fairly important. But the other part about the Mackay is that it was a rest and recreation area for a lot of Americans during the war, and uh, that was the experience of so many people in trying to make this celebration possible. As a result of that, it did centre around a lot of those people who stayed at home and kept the war effort going, whether it was the women or the men, the people in the VDC, uh, youngsters. They were all there to try to get uh, a successful prosecution of the war by doing those things that uh, aren't often uh, recognised. So it was that opportunity of recognising a lot of people. The uh, other aspect that, uh, and I think uh, the two aspects that I, I did want to speak about of our celebrations, I mentioned the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels and the, six, and, uh, the fact we didn't quite make, the, uh, uh, make that connection, but also the Mackay Genealogical Society. Uh, we were given an amount of nearly $2,000 to prepare a booklet on the historical sites of Mackay as they existed during the war, and uh, we've been able to circulate those. And I'd just like to congratulate those people who put, made that effort possible, and perhaps in itself that will be a handbook for the future that people can look to and say, these are the highlights and these are the landmarks of uh, what the uh, World War II meant to Mackay and what remains. The other aspect was the fact that uh, a United States uh, carrier plane crashed on took a takeoff from the uh, Mackay Airport, killing all but one of those on board. And so it was an opportunity also to mark uh, their sacrifice in a very meaningful way, uh, and also the fact that the war was won just not by Australian efforts but by the efforts of many allies in the field, including the United States. And it's fashionable these days to knock the United States, but I have to say 
that there's a general feeling in North Queensland, had it not been for the United States in intervention through General MacArthur, that we might have been defending Australia from the Brisbane line in actual fact instead of defending it from the, uh, the North Australia. And so uh, that was uh, a very important part. The other aspect uh, was within the Mackay region. We decided that it was important to put this culture of the war in its place uh, and relate to the, uh, the students of the schools. So we ran a competition <coughs> which involved a lot of self-help, uh, whereby we said there'd be a prize for the first five place getters. Uh, in other words, there were going to be five winners uh, within the schools as to the manner in which they participated during, the, uh, during that year. It's interesting, uh, we made sure that we weren't going to be held up for any criticism by making sure that somebody outside did the judging. And as a result of that, while uh, we, did, we were probably disappointed in that the number of participant, uh, participating schools was a lot lower than we expected, the quality of those people who uh, did participate was very important. And I'd just like to mention some of the comments made by the judge on that occasion. Uh, he mentions in connection with Kalen School, a small school, a small community in the time of the war, where there would have been a very uh, uh, high percentage of enrolments in the armed forces. Uh, they had, uh, he had, the, the person had this to say. The school obviously steeped in remembrance of the 15th of August 1945. Inclusion of small goods, uh, of, uh, because it's a small school, it was great that it was included and good reporting of the effects of the war on civilians as well as service people. And uh, at Kalen, they also commemorated the arrival of the troop train, which was another central theme right through the region. Dundula School, I think, was impo uh, particularly important because that was the school that was involved very, very closely with the crash of the, um, the transport aircraft that I mentioned before. Uh, and they also prepared a role uh, of those people who did service and also prepared a video. And the comments made were, the school made excellent mileage of the activities in this area of the honour roll, VP Day, the Baker's Creek Memorial by photographs and video. Uh, they also presented an album, which I was able to uh, actually uh, see. Uh, the album was well presented. The handwritten submissions by the pupils at the end are almost, uh, although they said it was almost indecipherable, but when you had to look at it, it was a good effort with the video. Uh, supported by the Alban, and these, uh, a former student uh, made sure there's a 50th anniversary return to the school, the honour roll, the whole thing was beautifully done, and uh, I would understand that that, although again only a small school, Dundula will remember participating in this event uh, for a long time to come. Uh, Finch Hatton, uh, notorious because uh, that's the place I was born, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, I'm sure you'd be interested in that. And of course, it did receive a little bit of encouragement from the, uh, the local member. Uh, Finch Hatton, a well presented report. Anzac Day involvement in the address by the uh, principal, excellent. The visual reporting in the article, Memories, a Legacy of a Boys' War, uh, allied to the VP uh, celebrations, were very good. And uh, at the same time, I remember that I went back there for the 50th anniversary, uh, not, not of the remembrance, but uh, because it was the 50th anniversary of a group. Uh, when they'd left that school, that I was back there to, uh, and part of it. And the students of the day were uh, just going around with this tape recorder, uh, just speaking to the uh, oldies about what their memories were, and what the school was like at that time, and also what Finch Hatton did in the participation of the war. That was excellently done. Mackay North Primary, this entry is, I think, outstanding in achieving education of the children by their involvement in all activities. That's what we're looking at. All exercises were designed to do just that. There's a little set of the teachers taking direct participation, but they're obviously guiding in the right direction. Again, instilling in the young people's mind that their participation was the important thing, not those of the teachers, and so it was self-generating. And uh, the children also did an exercise on defence and also the efforts required to maintain peace, which was excellent. Uh, goes on to say, Marini State High School, an excellent idea to start working on the theme, generating interest and in collecting material prior to the 15th. An impressive VP Day Museum has uh, resulted. And I know that uh, on a Sunday uh, following, not the Sunday following, but a Sunday after the uh, VJ Day itself, they had their parade and ceremony, 
and the, uh, the war museum aspect of it was a great delight as far as I was concerned. It said it also gave the school the opportunity to talk about values, about what it means to be bound by a common purpose. And Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, I believe that was the, uh, what was the intended thrust of the, uh, the whole thing. Again, another very good result. Victoria Park State School, a well put together report, a large part taken up with the rats of Trebrook. Uh, and of course, the school, it says the school is fortunate in having a memorial pool and the memorial garden was part of their uh, celebration and commemoration of this event. Again, uh, the mention of the rats of Trebrook. I've got to say that those old diggers who were the original rats uh, made it a practice of adopting a school and talking to them to let them know what was happening. And again, you can imagine the effect of uh, a young child on somebody talking about those experiences. Not the blood and the gore and the sweat and everything else, but just the physical presence of why they went. And it gave a new meaning to a lot of these people about what the flag represents, what the monarchy represents, but more importantly, what the democracy that we now have represents and appreciated by those other people. It uh, also gave uh, other considerations to the Whitsunday Anglican School and uh, we ended up by giving not five prizes but seven. Uh, it was, I believe, something that was uh, particularly uh, uh, beneficial. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, just in the final uh, aspect, my memory of the war is of a King of England and a Queen who supported her at every turn during the Battle of Britain. And I believe that was the greatest inspiration that I had as a kid about what it meant to be a part of a democracy and in a big family. I have decided, and I will be doing it, is sending a certificate of recognition to the Queen Mother in her 95th year. I believe that of all those people who participated, her inspiration at that time, along with the King of England, was helped Australia to remember. And uh, it'll be my delight to be able to send that to her on behalf, not only of the residents of Dawson, but I hope because of all Australians. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, the question is that the House take note of the paper. The Honourable Member for Macquarie. Thank you, Mr Deputy <coughs> Speaker. It's a great privilege to uh, speak in this debate because I think this year has been a very special one, and I think everyone who's spoken on the, uh, uh, on the matter will agree with that. Um, it's meant different things to different people, but I think it would be hard-pressed to find a family anywhere in Australia uh, that hasn't in some way been affected by the war. Um, in my case, my father was in the Navy all his working life and, of course, he was away at that time. I was born just before the war, so my childhood memories are of war. Um, but even for uh, a lot of people born since then, uh, if not their parents, then their grandparents uh, were involved in the Second World War. So the memories run across families in Australia and each has their different memory. I think it's been a good time to be able to not only thank those who uh, paid a great sacrifice um, to, uh, for, for our democracy, uh, those who gave their lives, those who came back injured in body or mind, um, and uh, those whose families have been uh, destroyed often um, as a result of that war. That sacrifice has been enormous. It also gave us a chance to, uh, to thank those who worked on the, uh, on the home front. Uh, no war can proceed without that support at home, not just the manufacture of armaments, uh, but the growing of food, the provision of clothing, um, the medical services for those who've come back uh, who, are, who are injured. So it's been a time for pulling all of that together and to say thank you for, to all of those people. It's also been a time for those people involved in various aspects of the war uh, to get together again. Uh, we've seen in the newspapers a lot of people who've actually met up for the first time since their war experience with comrades. Um, I've had women in my electorate who've met up who were in the VADs together or the, uh, or the Land Army, and I think that has been uh, very rewarding. There have been a lot of television programs this year about the war, and I think that uh, has been very educational. Um, you know, as a child, I'd seen a lot of those things before, but there were new programs. And the two that, that stick in my mind the most were the one about the Kokoda Trail and the one more recently about the Sendark and Death Marches. Uh, I found that latter one extremely moving, and I, I think uh, most people who saw it would have had tears streaming down their face at the end. At the following day, I attended a, um, uh, the end of year lunch for our ex-service women's association, and I asked one of the women if she'd watched it, and she said, 
No, I couldn't. My husband was a doctor in the army and he went to that area after the war to, to look after some of those people that were left and to see what had happened uh, and he never was the same since. So even those who were not in the middle of it, who experienced the aftermath and saw what had happened to those people, uh, their lives were altered too. I think the part of that program that probably disturbed most of us were the, was the woman who was the daughter of one of the, the half dozen survivors and saying that her father uh, used to, uh, he became a soldier settler, walked around the house at night yelling out the names of German, of, of Japanese soldiers, uh, threatened her mother um, with a gun and in the end shot himself. And the, not being able to live with the results of something like that I think is just, um, uh, just too awful to think about. There have been people, I've only had one in my electorate who said, why are you doing this, you're commemorating war, you're, uh, you're celebrating war. Um, and I think it made me think about why we were doing it. And I think for all the reasons I've just spoken of, it was the right thing to do. But also, and more importantly, was to educate uh, the younger generation. And I think what the member for McPherson has said is absolutely true. And I'm glad he spent so much time talking about the schools. Because those young people, I think, need to appreciate the sacrifice that's being made for them and their, their families. Um, but also... Uh, to learn from that experience and see that we don't repeat it. And I think that's enormously important. Uh, there have been a lot of events. Uh, we know all know about the national ones. And of course, we all had our, our own committees for our commemorations. I had two committees in my electorate because my electorate breaks into two distinct halves decided, divided by a valley. So I had one in the Blue Mountains and one in the Hawkesbury. And, and they decided to do different kinds of events, the things that were suited their part of the, uh, the area uh, best. Uh, the events in the Hawkesbury included um, a, a concert of, of old-time songs uh, at the Windsor Function Centre, also a race day at the Hawkesbury Race Club. Uh, racing and, and horse breeding and is, is quite uh, um, uh, prominent in that area, so a race day was, uh, was the thing they chose. It was a wet day, unfortunately, so I have memories of trying to hold an umbrella up while presenting the jockey with, uh, with his award. Um, one of the, the best things, the most enjoyable things, I think, for me, and one of the most permanent things in the Hawkesbury was a tree planting exercise. And I know a lot of areas did this, and it formed uh, what is now known as the Memorial Drive, suitably, uh, uh, suitably marked on the road that links Richmond and Windsor and runs alongside the RAF base. Um, so every time I drive along there now, I see these plane trees growing and the, and the signs, and that is, I think, a permanent memorial. Um, there was a display at the uh, Hawkesbury uh, Council Library, a uh, school essay competition, which uh, I think, again, was very well supported. Um, and also, in both areas, there were school visits by um, members of the RSL and also um, uh, civilians from that time. Um, in, the, uh, in the Blue Mountains uh, school visits, I attended one myself. It was the only one I managed to get the time to go to but to talk about what it was like to be a child during the war. And um, when I talked about um, my mother making my knickers out of old sheets, uh, the uh, little girl squirmed a bit at the thought of what that must have felt like, and it didn't feel good, I have to tell you. Um, sitting around the radio at night with my mother uh, and my sister, um, singing all those songs. And of course now when those things are being played, I find that I can sing all the words to them, but can't sing any of the words in more modern songs. <laughs> so. Um, and of course we didn't have television and that was another thing that uh, the children found quite amazing. Uh, so I think the school visits were, were very important, the school essays and projects were a prominent part. Also in the mountains we had a most enjoyable evening, it was a cabaret called Songs of Survival and it had been previously performed at the Q Theatre at Penrith. And this was about uh, women in prisoner of war camps in, uh, in Asia and the Japanese camps and it was a, perform a backstage at a performance of the Songs of Survival by this group of ex-service women. And I, I found it, it very interesting because not only some of the songs, but also uh, talking about their experiences, um, the intrusion of people who were trying to promote this, this event but weren't involved and didn't have an appreciation. And I found it uh, very interesting. We also had um, a VE Day street party at Lawson. Uh, unfortunately, again, the weather wasn't too good, so we had to take a lot of it indoors, but that involved a service um, and, um, and again, a lot of children being involved, um, putting flowers on the memorial for people from their families. The big event in the, in the mountains was a VP Day parade, and that was organised by the Katoomba RSL, 
uh, and included RSLs from all over the district, as and well as. Oh yes, and the Vietnam veterans were there. Yes, and uh, Tim has uh, has visited our Vietnam vets, and they are uh, very important people. Uh, they certainly played their part. So that, those events, I think, were most important. There was another one that I found very moving, and this was actually at the RAF base in Richmond, and it was to launch a restoration project for a mosquito aircraft, which had been found derelict in a field somewhere in the district. And it's, it, there was enough there to identify it as the one that was flown by one of my constituents, Mr Harvey Armour, who is currently in a nursing home. And he was taken down in a wheelchair to this event and uh, the project launched and an appeal launched for the restoration. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, the Minister for Defence is, uh, is allowing the RAF base to, uh, to carry out that work. One thing it showed me looking at that aircraft uh, at how flimsy and fragile they were. Um, they were made of wood, and, uh, and it must have been very risky flying those sort of, uh, those sort of planes. Um, I also, like most people, had a visit from the Minister, uh, Minister for Veterans Affairs, and I think all of us join in congratulating uh, Con Shacker for uh, his enthusiasm, uh, which was unbounded during this year. The first thing we did on his visit was to visit uh, Blackstone East Primary School, where we looked at a display put together by the Year 4 students and they had done projects, they had done posters and projects in books, and they had done all the research themselves, very often from their, their grandparents, or they'd gone to the library and had cuttings uh, from, from books and pictures and so on. And they were excellent, and they really did show that they had uh, gone into this very deeply. Uh, we also had morning and afternoon teas with various RSL clubs, a service, and a lunch with my two um, Australia Remembers committees. And during that lunch, uh, the minister presented a civilian award um, to a gentleman on behalf of his, his deceased father, who was involved with the uh, Civilian uh, Construction Corps. And I've had the privilege of presenting several other civilian medals, mainly to women in the VADs and the Land Army. Uh, one of them sadly died a couple of weeks later. We had to bring the ceremony forward because we knew she, was, uh, she wasn't going to last much longer. So. Um, I think that was very important. I also had the privilege of being amongst a, a small group of members from both sides of the House uh, to travel from here to Sydney to see off the pilgrims going to, back to New Guinea. And among them was one of my constituents, Mr Bruce Buster Brown, uh, who was a highly decorated uh, uh, former uh, Air Force officer. And uh, he's featured a lot on the radio and television programs as well. So it was a great privilege for me to go with the Prime Minister and the Minister to see those people off. Um, one of the, uh, the things that I think has been a great hit later in the year for everybody who's taken part in it is the presentation of certificates of appreciation. Um, once we put out the application for these certificates, we've, I think all of us have been flooded with applications and they're still coming in. And um, I had um, a ceremony recently when I had the Deputy Prime Minister in my electorate. I wrote to all of the applicants at that time and asked them to come, and I was overwhelmed with the number of people who wanted to come. Uh, and um, with their friends and relatives, we absolutely packed out the Springwood Civic Centre. There were 800 people there, uh, so they were standing around the walls. And it took us uh, about an hour and a half to present these certificates, even walking ourselves down each row. Um, sadly, some people turned up who hadn't rung to say they were coming, so we had to get their certificates made up. We had the calligrapher on hand and, uh, and find them seats. And I've been flooded with letters and phone calls uh, from people saying how much they appreciated that ceremony. Uh, and I think that's been enormously important. I also presented some of the certificates at um, one of my RSL clubs recently. I think there were eight on that occasion. And at the end of the dinner and the presentation, five other people came up to me and said, I wasn't going to get one of those because you know I've got my medals and everything, but they are beautiful, aren't they? I think I'll have one. And fortunately, be prepared. Uh, I had a, a bag full of, um, of application forms in my handbag, so uh, so there'll be there'll be more yet. Um, and I know I've already delivered a few to people's homes of uh, people who I know are, are near the end of their lives, and it has been special to them to have their families there with a camera to uh, to receive those certificates. Uh, I'd like to um, pay tribute also to the, um, to the RSL clubs in my electorate. I think they have done a marvellous job. They have uh, carried out their own functions and own ceremonies and so on, uh, and they've cooperated uh, extremely well with the committees. Um, finally, I'd like to just uh, personally thank those uh, 
those committee members, if I can find the piece of paper, um, because I think they did a, a splendid job. The, uh, the Hawkesbury uh, committee uh, was chaired by Ms Alana Sledge, who's uh, a young woman, but she's the uh, public relations officer of Hawkesbury City Council. Uh, the general manager of Hawkesbury City Council, Council Gary McCulley, and I'd also like to thank him for allowing us to put the funds through the council and have it distributed from there. The other members were Mr Alan Dunstone from Windsor RSL, and he organised all the school activities in the area. Mr Keith Chu, Mr John Crook, uh, Wing Commander Grant Buggy from the RAF base, Councillor Chris Payne from, uh, from Hawkesbury City Council. In the Blue Mountains, the committee was chaired by Mr Tony Atwood, um, and also included Mr Pat Brook from uh, Katoomba, who organised the big VP march, uh, Ms Olga Olma Halpin, Ms Joyce Burrows, Councillor Joy Anderson, who was the Mayor of Blue Mountains at the time, Mary Caldbeck moore who organised the VE Day ceremony, uh, ably aided by Ms Alma King uh, and Councillor Anderson, uh, Ms May Howlett, who, um, who produced the Songs of Survival Cabaret, which I described and which gave us all such pleasure. Mrs Faye Wheatley, who was the uh, chair, uh, president of the ex Blue Mountains Ex-Service Women's Association, um, and they, the association did a window display uh, in Springwood um, for VE Day. Also Mrs Joy Bohm, who's a returned service person herself and, uh, and a member of the Ex-Service Women. Um, also Mrs, uh, Mrs Betty Chalvo and Ms Dorothy Tart uh, from Blackheath. Um, finally, um, we, the ongoing project that we have is an oral history, and we're asking people to come and record their experiences, um, which will be played over our community radio station and eventually put together in a book, which I hope will be uh, a living and continuing memorial to all of those who served from the electorate of Macquarie. Thank you. Well, the question is that the House take, paid, the House take note of the paper. The Honourable Member for Fisher. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I'm very uh, pleased to be able to join with colleagues on both sides of the chamber in applauding the Australia of Members program, which is probably the first time that one generation of Australians collectively has thanked a prior generation of Australians for being prepared to risk everything to ensure that today's Australians enjoy the freedom, stability and way of life that we do as a nation. And uh, as with many other electorates uh, in Fisher, we set up an Australia Remembers Committee. We called uh, for people from throughout the electorate to come to a public meeting which was held at the Caloundra RSL and a committee was elected. And that was a vigorous committee which worked very well on the Australia Remembers uh, program. And in a large and diverse electorate such as Fisher, uh, there would be many opportunities for disagreements between, um, among the various localities to occur, but it is to the credit of this committee that the range of projects which were recommended for seeding funding to the minister uh, came from all parts of the electorate. The chairman of the Australia Remembers Committee for the electorate of Fisher is Mr Gordon Corwell. Uh, the Secretary Dick Alchin, the Treasurer Bill Platten, and committee members were Jim Courtney, Bernie Barton, Bob Russell, Gordon Granzian, and John Hodgkinson. And that committee was broadly representative of the uh, former electorate of Fisher prior to the redistribution. I suppose um, when the minister announced that each federal electorate was going to receive the sum of 20,000, we were obviously very pleased because this 20,000, as seeding funding, uh, was able to encourage a broad range of projects from throughout the electorate. In Queensland, of course, as people continue to move from the Rust Belt areas of southern Australia to the Sun Belt, and as we continue every three years to have a redistribution and additional seats given to Queensland, because Queensland, of course, is where the people are moving to, it was regrettable that the government didn't find it possible to give an extra $20,000 to the new electorate of Longman. And I know that the uh, I know that the minister or the attorney general uh, would have uh, felt the same as I did in relation to this matter, but uh, because it would have been good for the 20,000 to also be given to that new electorate, uh, the minister said that the government had only been able to allocate $20,000 for each existing electorate as at the time of the last election, and consequently the Fisher Australia Members Committee uh, equitably allocated a proportion of funds to that area which has been lost to Longman. 
We had 19 projects recommended for funding to the minister, uh, and it ought to be remembered that those projects recommended for funding were recommended for seeding funding only, and the amounts which were expended uh, on the various projects uh, very much exceeded the uh, seeding funding which was received from the government. But I do uh, congratulate the minister and the government on making the $20,000 available to each federal electorate because clearly the allocation of that $20,000 to each federal electorate encouraged local communities to come forward with ideas, uh, ideas which of course uh, could be brought to fruition during 1995, the year Australia remembers the end of hostilities in the Second World War, which of course occurred in 1945. I must say that the Australia Remembers program was one of those uh, occasions throughout our nation where we were able to concentrate for once on those matters that unify us. And I would like to congratulate the minister, I would like to congratulate his uh, senior adviser, Greg Rudd, and also the minister's wife, Tina, who must have seen very little of the minister during the last 12 months. Some people initially thought that the Australia Remembers program might have been politicised by the government, uh, but I believe that any government in office in 1995 would have uh, given an appropriate uh, recognition to such a significant milestone in Australia's history. And so, in an absolutely bipartisan uh, way, uh, I would like to express my appreciation uh, to the minister and also, of course, to the shadow minister, uh, who worked very well with the minister during this important year. The minister, of course, uh, visited very many parts of the electorate. And I was uh, very honoured when the minister chose to visit my own electorate, a Fisher, which is not an electorate the government would expect to win at the next election. But the minister himself came to Caloundra to uh, formally uh, unveil a particular project, and I think that it, it was uh, a matter that not only did I appreciate, but also other people in the community appreciated. The minister did, on Remembrance Day, come to Caloundra to unveil the plaque, officially opening the memorial walkway, which was one of the many projects in the Fisher electorate. Like other electorates, we had uh, a balance of uh, bricks and mortar projects and projects uh, which commemorated uh, the end of the Second World War. And I must say that I have never before seen the community come together and work in the way that it has. We've had also hundreds of people who have applied for the Certificate of Appreciation, uh, which was given uh, by, uh, the, I suppose, the Parliament uh, to those people who served Australia in war, uh, either on the battlefield or at home. Uh, those who made a contribution to the war effort have been appropriately recognised through these Australia Member Certificates. And I would like at this point in time to, to thank the Caloundra City Council, which has given me the opportunity of presenting these Australia Member Certificates at public citizenship ceremonies so that uh, people who served their country were able to receive their certificates uh, in a public forum. And the Mayor, Councillor Dwyer, and, and councillors of the Caloundra City Council all cooperated in facilitating this, pub this public opportunity to thank citizens of the city of Caloundra for their contribution to the war effort. I'd also like to thank the Mayor, and, uh, the Mayor uh, Councillor Bob King, and the councillors of the Maroochee Shire Council, because similarly they gave opportunities at citizenship ceremonies and public events in the Shire of Maroochee. Uh, to enable presentations of Australia Remember certificates to be made uh, so that the community could see, in fact, that uh, the, these people to whom we owed so much were being publicly recognised. The Kiwana Waters RSL, uh, at its annual monthly meetings over the last couple of months, has also permitted me to present Australia Remember's certificates uh, at the meetings of the Kiwana Waters RSL. And we've had a very large number of people at those meetings, and I would like to thank the president of the Kiwana Waters RSL, Mr Kevin Grayson, for the way in which he and his committee have facilitated the presentation of those certificates. The Kilcoy Shire Council held uh, a, a major day of recognition, uh, remembering, of course, the end of the Second World War, and an opportunity at that event was also given to me to present Australia Remember certificates to citizens of the Shire of Kilcoy. And we, of course, talk about the $20,000 which each federal electorate received by way of seeding funding, 
but it should be recognised that a large number of unfunded projects took place right throughout the nation. Uh, for instance, I was privileged to be present at the unveiling of uh, memorial gardens uh, at the Boccarina and Bedina State schools on the Sunshine Coast. And it is a real credit uh, not only to these schools but also to the community surrounding these schools as well as to the Kiwana Waters RSL that it has been possible to create a permanent reminder for young generations uh, coming through sc our schools in the future of what we owe those people who went to war, what we owe those people who were prepared to risk mm. absolutely everything to ensure that today's Australians uh, indeed uh, enjoy the democracy and freedom that we do. Also, there was an Australia Remembers Ball at the, uh, at the uh, Caloundra RSL uh, War Veterans Home. And Noel Box did a wonderful job, along with the staff from the RSL uh, War Veterans Home, in arranging that ball. In fact, there was a, a lady there, uh, Mrs Roberta Campbell, who's well over 100 years of age, uh, who received an Australia Remembers certificate from me on that occasion at that ball. And I must say, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was particularly impressed with the way that uh, uh, Mrs Roberta Campbell was able to respond. She grabbed the microphone and she gave a, a speech. And, and that, I think, is absolutely wonderful for a lady who has aged over 104 years. And, of course, uh, uh, Mrs Campbell is someone who can remember a tremendous amount of Australia's history, and it was wonderful to have her present on that occasion. As I said, we have had a, uh, an enormous cross-section of both bricks and mortar projects and projects which uh, are not of a permanent nature in the electorate of Fisher. I've been impressed with the way that uh, so many people have made a contribution. I have, in fact, been so impressed with the way that our young people in the community have been involved with the Australia Remembers projects in the electorate of Fisher. Uh, it has been one of those opportunities for uh, all groups in the community, ex-service people, uh, people who were not ex uh, part of the ex-service community, uh, people who were too young to go to war, and our school children, all to make a contribution. In particular, I'd like to mention, though, Mr Deputy Speaker, the memorial walkway which has been established uh, at Caloundra. And there was seeding funding received from the Australia Remembers project for this particular walkway, and the seeding funding is only a small fraction of the total amount that will be expended. But there has, uh, the memorial walkway will stretch from Kings Beach along the headland to Shelley Beach. And stage one of the memorial walk will extend from the Centaur Memorial to the Anzac Memorial. And of course, the minister came to uh, officially unveil the plaque uh, declaring the memorial walkway open. And people who have had uh, uh, family members serve in uh, the Second World War uh, are able, uh, Mr. Speaker, to buy a plaque and the name of the particular person who served the nation, along with the details of that service, will be placed on that plaque, and that plaque uh, will be set in the memorial walkway. And that will be a permanent reminder for those who use the walkway in the future of what we as a nation owe those people who made such a contribution. We also had a situation uh, where in Mullaney the RSL put forward a very positive project, uh, and uh, the Governor of Queensland, Her Excellency Mrs Lenine Ford, uh, came along on Remembrance Day to uh, officially uh, unveil uh, the newly constructed memorial area and plaques. And we also there, Mr Speaker, have a perpetual flame so that those people who go past the RSL in Mullaney are able to recognise uh, the, the debt which today's Australians owe to those who served this nation in, in form of war. I was invited to officially launch the, uh, the Blackbutt Writers Group uh, uh, publication, uh, which indeed was a book which was produced setting out wartime reminiscences of a number of people in the Blackbutt area. And it's interesting when one goes into country areas, uh, Mr. Speaker, just how diverse the life's experiences are of those people. Uh, some people, of course, served uh, in New Guinea, uh, served in other spheres of conflict. There was even a, a contribution by a gentleman who was a boy in wartime uh, Holland. And uh, I, I was so impressed with the way that the entire Blackbutt community got behind this particular project, uh, came along, supported these people, 
and what has been produced using the seeding funding from the Australia Remembers program will be there as a permanent record of those experiences and reminiscences. The Bribey Island RSL was particularly active. Uh, it produced a book on the role played by Fort Bribey in the World War II. And Fort Bribey, of course, uh, was one of those establishments uh, on Bribey Island uh, about which very little is known. And I would commend, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, anyone interested in the war in that part of Australia really ought to look at that booklet produced by the Bribey Island RSL. And there have been a whole range of, of other projects. Time will preclude my mentioning each of them. But we have had the supply installation of water fountains, park benches, uh, park tables. As I said, we have uh, had the publication of various books. Uh, we have also had an exhibition of wartime art and photography. And uh, also, uh, we have had uh, reenactments of wartime dances. Uh, we have had RSLs uh, assist schools with the purchase of uh, CD ROMs. Uh, and memorial plaques. Uh, we've had the Caloundra City Council recreate a uh, cameo of life in Caloundra uh, during World War II. Uh, we've had honour boards restored. We've had uh, restoration uh, of uh, other wartime uh, memorials. We've had essay competitions. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, indeed, Mr. Speaker, also uh, many schools participating in a way that didn't cost anything at all, insofar as the schools and the local communities were prepared to put the funds in and they were prepared to create these permanent memorials. Summing up, Mr Speaker, I would like to congratulate everyone in this place. I would like to congratulate the community in Fisher, the minister, the shadow minister, on what has been achieved in the Australia Remembers program. Never before has one generation of Australians been prepared collectively to thank those who have gone before to whom we owe so much. Mr Speaker, uh, I, I, would also, I would also stress that it is important that whenever possible, as Australians, we work in a unifying way to thank those people who have helped to contribute Order. The towards our way of life. Time has expired. The Honourable Member for Lilly. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye to the contrary, and I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I ask leave of the House to make a ministerial statement on the future of Australia's forests. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, today I announce the government's broad policy direction on Australia's forests and forest industries. I am also announcing several related initiatives vital to the future of our native forests and the industries which depend upon them. Full details of these measures will be released tomorrow by the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, the Minister for the Environment, Sport and Territories and the Minister for Resources. Mr Speaker, Australia's forests are a declining feature of our landscape, a priceless element of our environment and heritage, a national resource of immeasurable proportions and a profound national responsibility. All Australians have a stake in these forests. All of us have a responsibility to insist that they are properly managed and carefully conserved. They are a national treasure and their management must be ecologically sustainable and economically clever. Our national forests are of inestimable conservation value. They are vital repositories of biological diversity. Indeed, new species of plants and animals are still being discovered. They are a haven for endangered species. They are vitally important as water catchments. They influence our climate and act as carbon sinks to limit greenhouse effects. Just as importantly, they are places of unique and unrivalled beauty. They are aesthetically and spiritually important to us. They are important to our sense of belonging to this land. Our respect for and enjoyment of them is part of our communion with Australia. Mr Speaker, the national interest quite simply demands that we protect our forests. The same national interest also demands that we use the forests intelligently for the things we need and with the communities that live with them. Our forests have economic significance. They are an important renewable resource, contributing to the wealth of the nation and providing us with essential commodities. Many Australians and many Australian communities depend on our native forests for their livelihoods. Whatever we decide are our priorities, their interests must be attended to. This perception of an irresolvable conflict between the environment and commercial values of forest has produced deep divisions in the Australian community. The debate presents itself as a conflict between absolutes. 
the absolute necessity to protect these priceless parts of our environment and the absolute necessity to protect Australia's economic interests and the well-being of Australian working men and women. The conflict is easily understood. No Australians want to see these forests destroyed or damaged beyond repair, nor they wish to see the economic interests of Australia damaged or the livelihoods of their fellow Australians threatened. We on the government side number ourselves among these Australians. I hope people on the other side of the House can endorse these objectives. No policy is going to satisfy everyone. Neither side of this debate can expect to get everything they want. The aim is to see that Australia is the winner and that the Australians of the next century are the winners. In the end, the essential goal is the protection of the long-term national interest. Mr Speaker, it is towards this goal that the government has steered a course. Our cause will be greatly advanced if on both sides the debate is conducted with the national interest in mind. We should all remember that no one in this conflict has a monopoly on truth or virtue or a mortgage on concern for the future of our forests. Those who presume they do and claim it exclusively will only debilitate the efforts of people of goodwill to find the best solutions. We recognise that this is a debate which will of its nature arouse great passions, but equally the solutions and the path to them cannot be other than rational. And we will not find solutions without cool thinking and a genuine desire to find common ground and a degree of shared goodwill. Mr Speaker, if the task of devising a national forest policy which meets community expectations is made difficult by polarised opinion and emotion, it is made even more complex by the fact that, under our constitution, the states have the primary responsibility for land management, including the management of our forests. Many in the Australian community expect the Commonwealth to take more responsibility for Australia's forests than the Commonwealth has the ability to take. It is expected of the federal government that we develop an effective national policy, yet the federal government does not effectively have the power to do so. What powers we do have can never deliver the long-term changes we are seeking to the reserves, to sustainable management and to the industry without the states. The recourse to the Commonwealth Government underlines the failure of interest groups to secure the appropriate undertakings from those who do, not, who do manage the forests in Australia, and that is, of course, the state governments. In lieu of actual powers, the government has taken the lead in developing with the states a cooperative approach to managing and protecting our forests. This policy is dependent upon the states recognising that there is a national interest to be served and success in the long run will, in large part, depend upon the states continuing to recognise this. Mr Speaker, we started on this difficult journey towards a common approach to forest management with the development in 1992 of the National Forest Policy Statement, to which all states and territory governments are now signatories. This was itself no easy matter, and some parties have only more recently joined. Embodied in that statement are the shared objectives, social and economic objectives, which all governments have made a, a commitment to achieving. Through the National Forest Policy Statement, the Commonwealth and the states agreed to the ecologically sustainable management of Australia's forests. Realising that we did not know enough about our forests, the statement provided the basis for thorough cooperative assessments of their values, leading ultimately to the concept of regional forest agreements with the states. These agreements offer the real possibility of a long-term framework for the protection and management <coughs> of these important national assets. As an idea, it is probably unique in the developed world. The policy provides for the development of a national forest reserve system which would ensure the protection of high conservation value areas required to maintain biodiversity, old growth and wilderness values. Earlier this year, the Commonwealth, through a panel of scientists, developed a set of criteria for determining which areas should become part of the system, and they include a, ben a broad benchmark of 15 per cent of the pre-European distribution of each forest type to be protected within the reserve system, retention in reserves of at least 60 per cent of existing old growth, increasing up to 100 per cent wherever practicable for rare old growth, and protection of 90 per cent or more wherever practicable of areas of higher quality wilderness. 
These criteria are recognised as at the leading edge in world terms. But, Mr Speaker, before we can arrive at a position from which we can negotiate regional forest agreements and, through them, a comprehensive, adequate and representative national forest reserve system, we must put in place interim protection measures for forests which might be required as components of such a reserve system. And the device we are using for this is a Deferred Forest Area or DFA process. The Deferred Forest Area process has been designed to provide the appropriate degree of interim protection needed for the longer term regional forest agreements. It is not meant to be the last word on which areas would be logged and which would be turned over to forest reserves. Rather, it was meant to provide an essential building block on the way to regional forest agreements. The decisions to be announced tomorrow, therefore, are but the first step in a longer, more rigorous process, but for the forests, a giant step. <laughs> for most of this year, the Commonwealth has been negotiating with New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and Western Australia to identify forest areas to be protected pending further assessments in the development of regional forest agreements. In cooperation with these governments, the Commonwealth has recently concluded a very extensive consultation process in which interested individuals and groups have had their say in an open and transparent process. Through their contribution, they have been able to influence the outcome, and I am pleased to say our deferred forest areas are the better for it. At the same time, I believe these consultations have underlined the fact that the policy approach we have chosen is undoubtedly the right one. Through the deferred forest areas process, we have delivered a positive and, I stress, immediate outcome for all Australians who have a stake in our forests, which is to say, albeit to varying degrees, every Australian. As a first step, the decisions we have taken this week offer sound conservation outcomes as well as predictability for our forest industry. We have taken a precautionary approach so as to ensure that future reservation options are kept open. Cabinet has agreed on the areas of state forest to be deferred. Detailed maps of these areas will be released tomorrow. Our objective has been to ensure that options for establishing the reserve system, based on criteria developed by the Commonwealth, are not foreclosed while longer-term assessments are conducted. Mr Speaker, I am confident that we have achieved this objective. In the next few weeks, the Commonwealth expects to sign deferred forest agreements with the states I have mentioned, and I will be writing to the Premiers later today, inviting them to enter these agreements. I have on a number of occasions talked about creating in Australia a forest reserve system the equal of any in the world. With the signing of these agreements, we will have taken a huge step forward, a huge step towards this objective. Mr Speaker, the management of those parts of the forest estate outside the reserve system is just as important as the reserves themselves. The government is committed to ensuring that the management of these areas, some of which will be available for, for harvesting, is truly sustainable. As part of the longer term process, we will be joining with the states in a thorough review of forest management and codes of practice. Our aim is to ensure that the full range of values we attach to our forests are maintained in perpetuity. We must adopt the view that these precious assets are held in trust for the future, that they are not ours to neglect nor ours to degrade. The forest industry should be a model of ecologically sustainable development, and our objective is to ensure that it is. Mr Speaker, it's worth reminding the House that the annual turnover of Australia's wood and paper industry uh, based on native forests and plantations is of the order of 10 billion, or about 1 per cent of gross domestic product. The government believes it is imperative to have a viable wood and wood products industry. Investments of between $4 billion and $6 billion are at present under consideration. Industry and unions predict between 15,000 and 25,000 potential new jobs over the next decade. The associated wood and paper industry strategy, also to be released tomorrow, sets out the government's long-term vision for this industry. It is the government's aim to transform it, to make it both internationally competitive and ecologically sustainable. As part of this transformation, we will be encouraging increased investment in value-adding processes for wood and wood pulp and give priority in issuing wood chip export licences to applicants 
who invest in domestic processing. We are determined to sharply improve domestic value adding of residues currently being exported as unprocessed wood chips. We will, through this industry, expand job opportunities in regional Australia. We will clear the way for value adding to forest residues by the release of strict environmental standards for bleached eucalypt craft pulp mills and through regional forest agreements to be developed with state governments will provide industry with increased assurance about resource supply and greater regulatory certainty. We will continue to remove duplication and environmental impact assessment processes at the federal and state level and reduce administration and compliance costs. Through us industry, we will provide additional funding for enterprise development to firms in the wood and paper industries and so promote best practice and competitive efficiency. We will provide additional assistance to small and medium firms in the wood and paper industry who are seeking to move into new markets or upgrade existing facilities. And through the Wood and Paper Industry Council, we will develop industry sector approaches to investment and improved import replacement and export performance. Underlying all these initiatives is a fundamental commitment to sustainable job growth and opportunities for Australian workers. Mr Speaker, while the government is committed to the long-term sustainability and prosperity of the native forest-based industry, special recognition will also be given to the increasingly important role of plantations and farm forestry. These sectors represent the best source of future growth in the wood and paper industry. Plantations already supply a significant proportion of our total wood and paper products, and major value-adding investment proposals are currently under consideration. In 1995, the industry set a target of trebling the current plantation resource by 2020. The government supports and welcomes this initiative. It will act to remove impediments to plantation establishment and establish a policy environment which will help industry to realise this target. Mr Speaker, every effort has been made to minimise necessary disruption to the timber industry arising from the deferred forest areas process. State governments have been asked to reschedule logging of operations away from deferred areas. However, the government recognises that in some cases rescheduling may not be possible and that logging operations will be affected. Accordingly, the wood and paper industry strategy contains details of a generous structural adjustment package which will provide financial and other assistance, including retraining to proprietors and to workers in the timber industry. Uh, those detrimentally affected by the deferred forest areas process. Mr Speaker, we are especially conscious of the disruptive effect on some operators and communities of these changes, and we will do all that we can reasonably do to help. Mr Speaker, let me turn now to the vexed question of the wood chip export licences. Applications for wood chip export for this year were about 9 million tonnes. However, as indicated last year, the government wants to reduce the amount of wood exported in this unprocessed form. The government has therefore decided on a much lower volume for this year, which will be 5.25 million tonnes. This amount is a fair and consistent down payment on that objective. Licences will be issued for 80 per cent of that volume. The remaining 20 per cent will only be available in regions where there, have been, where there has been significant pro progress towards regional forest agreements with state governments. Mm -hmm. Details of this year's sealing will be announced tomorrow by the Minister for Resources. The government has made a commitment to phasing out wood chip exports by the year 2000 from areas not covered by regional forest agreements. We remain committed to diverting these exports into further domestic value adding. The industry is on notice, Mr Speaker, that unless we get the progress and the agreements, wood chip exports will be phased out. Those on the extremes of the debate in the timber industry and among their more uncompromising opponents should understand that the government will not waver from this course or from these decisions. Mr Speaker, no Australian government has ever made such a conscientious attempt to resolve this huge and vexed issue. Most governments would run a million miles from it. We have been at pains to strike the right balance, to find the means by which environmental and economic necessities can be reconciled in the national interest, 
the means by which a profitable industry and prosperous communities can be reconciled with our responsibility to preserve a unique and magnificent part of our natural heritage for our children and the Australians of the 21st century and beyond. Mr Speaker, the government believes it can be done. This statement demonstrates that driving an intelligent course can reap substantial and permanent benefits for both sides of the debate and for the nation. More substantial and more permanent than any we might derive from pursuing one direction to the exclusion of the interests of the others. The moral comfort of extreme and certain positions may be warming to those who hold them, but they do not confront the real moral challenge to deliver real, worthwhile, lasting and democratic solutions, ones that everyone can respect. Mr Speaker, no one should be under the illusion that with these decisions the difficulties and sensitivities surrounding this issue will disappear. Of course they won't. But I hope the process will decidedly help to create a more cooperative and analytical environment, an environment in which the common goal of the protection and renewal of our forests can be achieved with a forest products industry that has a future based on sustainability and ecological decency. Mr Speaker, this statement will bring us much, much closer to ecologically sustainable management of our great forests and, with it, much closer to meeting our responsibilities to the Australians of the next century and thereafter. Yeah. Mr Speaker, a copy of my statement. Honourable Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that the, that the House take note of the paper. The question is the motion be agreed to. I will ask leave the House uh, to move a motion to enable the Leader of the Opposition to speak for 20 minutes. Is leave granted? Leave granted. I move that so much of standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition speaking for a period not exceeding 20 minutes. The question is that motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, on behalf of the um, opposition, can I say that we uh, welcome uh, at long last a statement from the Prime Minister on a very uh, difficult and complicated issue. It is, of course, not the first statement uh, we've had from the Prime Minister or members of his government uh, about the forest issue, and uh, it may in fact not be the last, and it's fair to say at the outset that the statement was very long on warm words and rhetoric, and until we actually see uh, the fine print of the strategies and the documents, it will be very, very hard to make a judgment. Now, Mr. Um, Order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. Those uh, are uh, my right. Mr. Speaker, um, no, uh, um, Deputy, me, the Leader of the Opposition will wait just a minute. I don't, I don't. No, no, you do now. I don't. I don't, Those I don't want any right protection from the Prime Minister was heard in absolute silence, as will the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, one of the reasons why this uh, has been a complicated issue for the government is that the government and the Prime Minister in particular set out from the very beginning to politicise this issue, to, to, to create expectations within the environmental community which could never be realised, to pander in one month to one side of the debate and in the next month to pander to another side of the debate. Yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister now appeals in statesmanlike mode to both sides to be reasonable, to be understanding, to be full of warm moral feelings and warm moral convictions, and yet he himself incited a rabid sectional approach to this issue. And it is therefore certainly not surprising that the issue has proved so difficult to resolve. Mr Speaker, the twin goals of a world-class forest reserve system and a sustainable forest industry are shared by all fair-minded Australians. However, the forestry issue is a classical example of a political dilemma where finding the right solution will inevitably entail some give and take on both sides. It is not an issue that will be resolved in the long term by imposing politically motivated solutions on either the industry or the environmental movement. And as over two decades of experience has amply shown, it is not an issue where the national interest will ever be served by relying on conflict and division. Mr Speaker, no Australian should be under any illusion about the importance of getting the forest debate right. Forests are a vital part of our heritage, and we do have a responsibility to future generations of Australians to preserve and sustain our unique and, by world standards, relatively unspoilt natural environment 
in as pristine a condition as possible. Just as importantly, we should not forget that forest products are one of our most important and widely used primary resources and that the forest industry is, and under a coalition government, will continue to be the livelihood of hundreds of thousands of Australians. The coalition fully, fully recognises that, as a nation, we have a duty to preserve our high conservation old-growth forests and wilderness areas. But equally, we cannot, as a nation, undermine the confidence of an industry which is worth nearly $6 billion a year, which employs over 70,000 Australians, mainly in rural and regional areas, and which has enormous potential for sustainable growth in the future. As I said, Prime Minister, your statement today is very strong on rhetorical flourishes, but is desperately short on the details that both conservationists and the industry want. For example, we still not know, do not know when or if the National Forest Policy Statement, which this government promised would be implemented this year, will actually be implemented. The reality is, Mr Speaker, that after this statement, the industry still does not know whether it will have a long-term security of supply. The conservation movement does not know the shape of the final reserve system. We do not even know the extent to which the government will fund the management of the reserves. What this statement today is designed to do, and it's very clear, is put off the difficult decision until after the election. It is not surprising, Prime Minister, that if over the next few days you do not find that your answer to this problem is believed uh, with unanimity on both sides, because both sides of this debate have seen the political stunts of this government before. Both sides of this debate have, raised their, have seen their inordinately raised expectations dashed by what the government has, has uh, actually done. And they are sick, therefore, if they're an environmentalist, of their genuine environmental concerns being used again and again for cheap political purposes. And after all, you have been in power for 13 years. And you made great play today, Prime Minister, of wood chips. The reality is that your government is the champion wood chip exporter in Australia's history. No government has exported more wood chips than the Hawke and Keating governments. And why has this happened? It's happened because your policy confusion over 13 years has made it increasingly harder for industry to have the confidence to develop value-added processing. Mr Speaker, I have great sympathy with all those Australians, conservationists and timber industry workers alike, who fervently believe that domestic processing is far preferable to wood chip export. In comparable countries around the world, there have been massive investments in downstream timber processing infrastructure during the last 10 years. But the total inability of both the Keating and Hawke Labor governments to focus on what are the real issues in the forestry industry has meant that Australia has missed out on most of that wave of investment, missed out to such an extent that one of the world's potentially richest forest product producing nations now runs a deficit in that area of $2 billion a year. We might ask where is the massive expansion of our softwood plantation industry? We might ask why are we not establishing new state-of-the-art environmentally acceptable pulp and paper mills? And it's not surprising if we look at the government's record with the National Forest Policy Statement. That was signed by the Prime Minister on behalf of the Australian Government in December 1992. It was meant to solve the problems we are facing today. It was the great solution that would satisfy all parties. It was meant to deliver a high quality reserve system and a sustainable timber industry. What in reality happened? That you failed, Prime Minister and your ministers, to implement the National Forest Policy Statement. And how many times has the Labor government over the last 13 years announced peace in our time in our forest industry? In 1988, in 1992, and now apparently in 1995, again another piece of paper is uh, waved at us by the Prime Minister. In his statement today, one of the belated solutions offered by the Prime Minister was to encourage more plantations. Once again, let us have a look at the government's record in this area, and it's not very impressive. The rate of softwood plantation establishment in Australia has reached a 30-year low at a time when plantations in neighbouring countries like New Zealand are expanding at a massive scale. 
And you don't have to be a genius to recognise that an expanded plantation and farm forestry industry can deliver major environmental gains while at the same time providing a viable additional timber supply source. This year it is estimated that Australia's rate of softwood plantation establishment will be between three and ten times that of a country the size of New Zealand. Clearly the timber industry, the major corporations and investment companies do not have the necessary confidence in this government's policies to be prepared to plant the trees that all Australians want and you now belatedly think are essential. Of course plantations and farm forestry are essential. They have been essential for the past 13 years. They are a resource with an extremely long lead time. And the tragic reality is that future generations of Australians will now have to carry the cost of this government's lack of foresight and concerted action in this vital policy area. Yet today the Prime Minister has been brazen enough to come to this parliament and tell the people of Australia that this tired and crumbling government has discovered the answer to the long-term sustainability of the timber industry. The reality is that you are one of the last people in Australia to understand the importance of plantations for the future of our forest industry. Prime Minister, with its huge potential in wood products, Australia has a massive and increasing forest products deficit. In the last year, this deficit amounted to $2 billion. As a nation, we exported about $1 billion of, in the main, relatively unprocessed wood, while importing $3 billion worth of mainly high-value added timber, pulp and paper products. Undoubtedly, some of those imports came from unsustainably managed forests in countries with neither the technical expertise nor the economic resources that we enjoy in Australia. Mr Speaker, no one would argue with the Prime Minister and the Minister for the Environment's quite genuine attempts to assist in the preservation of the pristine wilderness areas in places like the Morovo Lagoon in the Solomon Islands. But surely Australians have a right to ask where this government's priorities lie, when at the same time that it is preaching to our Pacific neighbours, it is sitting on its hands for two whole years hoping that the National Forest Policy Statement will implement itself. Mr Speaker, the Coalition believes that, as a fundamental priority, we must protect our high conservation value native forests. This objective will best be achieved by the expedited implementation of the National Forest Policy Statement. The two principal aims of that statement are, first, the creation of a comprehensive, adequate and representative reserve system which will protect the diversity of native forests as well as our high-quality old-growth forests and wilderness areas. And second, to ensure Australia has a significant, sustainable native forest-based timber industry. It is indisputable that we must have a world-class forest reserve system and the Coalition is committed in government to establishing a reserve system which is at least the equal of, and I believe with our much greater emphasis on revegetation, plantations and the importance of value adding considerably better than that proposed by Labor. As we are all aware, the government's criteria for a world-class reserve system includes a broad benchmark of 15 per cent of the pre-European settlement distribution of east forest type. Mr Speaker, I say on behalf of the Coalition that we support this as a worthwhile objective. There is a need to extend the forest reserve system to incorporate forest types that are not adequately represented at present. We acknowledge that for many forest types the government's target can be achieved relatively easily. In fact, in some cases it has already been exceeded or is likely to be exceeded with little or no disruption to the industry or to local communities. However, Mr Speaker, in other areas, as members of the government know only too well, particularly in northern New South Wales and in parts of Queensland, the 15 per cent will be extremely difficult or impossible to achieve, as the government well knows and the Prime Minister should have had the courage to acknowledge today. The Prime Minister calls for understanding on both sides of the debate. The prerequisite of understanding on both sides of the debate is a bit of candour and frankness from the Prime Minister himself. But by pretending once again that he can be all things to all men, 
he squanders the opportunity of getting that very understanding from both sides of this debate. All Australians would expect that in those areas where the biodiversity criteria is not readily achievable, full and proper consideration must be given to the potential impact on people's lives as well as the economic impact on the wider community. Prime Minister, very interestingly in your statement today, you said that the government wants to reduce the amount of unprocessed wood exports and that you have therefore decided on, and I quote, a much lower volume for this year, which will be 5.25 million tonnes. I have been advised, Mr Speaker, by the industry today that in 1995 a similar volume of wood chip exports, that is 5.25 million tonnes, will be shipped out of Australia. If this is the case, then the direct inference in your speech that the 5.25 million tonnes export quota in 1996 will mean much lower wood chip export volumes in the coming year was clearly misleading. You have told far too many porkies in this area on the forest to be believed by either the industry or the environmental movement. The Australian public, Mr Speaker, have also learnt the lesson of the LAW law tax cuts. The last thing they want is an LOG forest fudge which cannot and will not be delivered after the election. And one of the significant elements, Mr Speaker, of this statement that so much is predicated on negotiations and events and discussions that are not scheduled to be completed before the election is likely to be held in the first half of next year. The forest industry, like all industries, must have the confidence that governments will develop a clear and coherent policy and stick with it in the long run. That is why implementing the National Forest Policy Statement is so vitally important, not only to the conservation movement, but also to the forest industry. The Coalition is a firm believer that if the industry is given the confidence that it needs, it will react accordingly. There is the prospect of hundreds of millions, of, if not billions of dollars, being invested in new plant and equipment by the forest industry in the areas of value adding and other improvements. In New South Wales alone, I understand that the industry would invest up to $200 million over the next 18 months to two years if it was given the necessary incentive and confidence to do so. It is estimated that such investment would provide up to 1,000 new jobs, mainly in regional and rural areas. In Western Australia, West Farmers Bunnings are contemplating developing a state-of-the-art pulp mill, the first stage alone, which would entail an investment approaching half a billion dollars. Taiwan Pulp and Paper Industry is investigating the feasibility of developing a world-scale pulp mill in the north of Tasmania, which could be well, worth well over $1 billion. In Victoria, I am also aware of proposals for investment in medium-density fibreboard mills with a value of more than $100 million. The Coalition will not shy away from its responsibility to preserve Australia's high conservation value native forests. We are equally committed, however, to ensuring that major investments in a sustainable forest industry such as these are not put at risk. In the lead-up to the next election, the Coalition will sit down with all stakeholders and carefully assess the impact of the government's latest in a very long line of forest statements. We will closely examine the proposed wood and paper restructuring package and consult widely with the industry and other affected parties in assessing the extent to which it does or does not meet the challenges that lie ahead. The fact that such a package is required is in itself very clear evidence of this government's failure over many years to put sound policies in place which would have avoided much of the dislocation that its policy vacuum has now brought about. But nevertheless, Mr Speaker, the Coalition does acknowledge that as a result of the government's past errors, such a restructuring package is now necessary. There is little doubt, Mr Speaker, that the fact that Labor has politicised and polarised the forest debate in this country for so long will make it significantly more difficult for any future government to achieve the dual objectives of a world-class reserve system and a confident and sustainable forest industry. However, the Coalition is totally committed to delivering on these crucial objectives in a way that ensures that the forest industry achieves its full potential and the environmental values of our native forests are protected for the enjoyment of this and future generations of Australians. Yeah. 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 Uh, <coughs> the Honourable the, uh, 
Assistant Minister for Industrial Relations. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. The resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those that opinion say aye. The country no. I think the ayes have it. Okay, we've got a few minutes. We'll do a couple of things. Yeah, well. Order. I have received messages from the Senate returning the following bills and acquainting the House that the Senate has agreed to the bills as amended by the House at the request of the Senate. Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment 1995, Excise Tariff Amendment No. 2, 1995. For the information of honourable members, I present a report by the Parliamentary Education Advisory Committee on the operations of the Parliamentary Education Office, 1988 to 1995, entitled Parliamentary Education for Active Citizenship. Ian. For the information of honourable members, I present a schedule showing government responses to House of Representatives and Joint Committee reports for the period 9 December 1994 to 29 November 1995 and reports presented to which responses are outstanding. Copies of the schedule are being made available to honourable members and it will be incorporated in Hansard. I may as well present these reports. I present the following order to General's audit reports for 1995-96. Number 13, financial statements audits, results of the 1994-95 financial statements audits of Commonwealth entities, and number 14, performance audit, the sale of CSL, Commonwealth Blood Product Funding and Regulation. The Honourable Leader of the House. I ask leave the House to move a motion to authorise the publication and printing of the reports. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Minister. I move that one, the House authorises the publication of all of the General's reports, numbers 13 and 14 of 95 96, and two, that the reports be printed. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Tick, tick, tick. Uh, the Honourable Leader of the House. Uh, this papers are tabled as listed on the schedule circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in the votes and proceedings. Hansard. Move the House take note of uh, Commonwealth Disability Strategy, Tax Expenditure Strategy, 94 95 Annual Reports, Repatriation Medical Authority, AIDC, Government Responses to the House of Rep Standing Committee on Transport, House of Rep Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Affairs, House of Rep Standing Committee on Employment. Joint Standing Committee on Migration migra and Joint Standing Committee on Migration, Immigration Review Tribunal Appointments Process. Flinders. The question is most to be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Did you want those last papers, Leader of the House, to be presented? Not I present uh, papers on following subjects being petitions which are not in accordance with the standing and sessional orders of the House. School funding from the member for Hinkler, Mr Neville, 148 petitioners. Nuclear testing from the member for Swan, Mr Beasley, 816. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Ask, I ask uh, Leader of the House to move a motion of censure on the Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I'd better let him start. Oh. Yeah. I, I assume that means leave is granted. The Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr Speaker, I move that uh, this House censures the Prime Minister for one, his continued economic failure, which has created great uncertainty and burdens for families, individuals, young people, seniors, small business and farmers. Number two, his inability to uphold the standards required of a Prime Minister. Three, his failure of policy which has delivered nothing but false dawns. And four, his continued failure to deliver what he promises. Mr Speaker, um, um, at last, of course, the Prime Minister has accepted a motion of censure, and it is appropriate, as this, as this could well be the last uh, day, despite the fact that he told his caucus that he'd bring us all back next year so that we could limber up for the election. So that we could limber up for the election. Well, let's see if we can take the opportunity today to do a bit of limbering up for the election. But it is an opportunity. It is an opportunity, Mr. Speaker. For, to allow, to allow this House my right. to debate some of the issues that the Australian public will be wanting the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition to debate over the next few weeks. And it is an opportunity, Mr Speaker, Member for Northern for, Territory. It is an opportunity, Mr Speaker, for this House and for both sides of politics to crystallise what the election campaign is going to be about. Now, no doubt the Prime Minister has in his own mind 
that he wants to have it on a referendum, a referendum on this or that issue. And no doubt again in the course of his reply we will get some indication from the Prime Minister as to the sort of issues that he regards as being important in the election campaign. But can I put it to the House, Mr Speaker, and I believe that in doing this I will be speaking on behalf of everybody on this side of the parliament, and I believe that I will also be speaking on behalf of millions of Australians all over this country, including hundreds of thousands, including hundreds of thousands of men and women who, as you all know, as you all know only too well, as people like Sylvia Smith in Bass and Maggie Deham in Macquarie and Harry, Harry Woods in Page and George Gere in Canning and Mary Crawford in Ford and Peter Knott in Gilmore and Gary Gibson, yeah, yeah, Peter, you know this is true, Order. and Gary Gibson in Morton and Barry Cunningham in McMillan no, and right. Peter Dodd in Leichhardt and Gordon Bilney in Kingston, Neville Newell in Richmond and Peter Cleland in McEwen and Bob Kenneworth in Duckley. And can I say, can I say, Mr. Speaker, courtesy? Can, can, I, can I say, Mr. Speaker? Can I, can I? Oh, a few of you were feeling a bit lonely. Can I say, Mr. Speaker, that courtesy of Laurie Brereton, um, Mary Easton is going to be a bowler from behind the field, and she's going to be added to that list. But, Mr. Speaker, you know as well as I do, and all of those members. All of those members that I've, that I've named in, the, uh, in that list that I've just read out, and they are, of course, as you all know, the, the principal marginal seat holders of the Australian Labor Party, and they are the people who are going to be on the front line of defending the failed policies of the past 13 years. All of you know that there are hundreds of thousands of Australians who have always voted for your party, have always you have habitually voted for the Labor Party. There are hundreds of thousands of them, and they are literally aching for the opportunity to vote against you at the next election. And that is the way. And all of those people, Mr. Speaker, I mean, I mean, I can, I, I really, you know, one, one really shouldn't, one shouldn't have really have any sympathy for them. But, but you know, I can just understand, I can just understand how desperate many of those feel. Because, because, Mr. Speaker, just imagine oh, they, have spent, they have spent the last nine months watching the major battlefield of politics in Australia, being the major battle, battlefield of politics in Australia, being being over not over the middle ground of Australian politics, not over a constituency that normally belongs to the Liberal Party and the National Party, but the last nine months the main battleground of Australian politics has been over the allegiance of people who have habitually voted Labor all of their lives. And they feel so let down and they feel so betrayed and they feel so angry. And whether you go to the inner suburbs of Sydney, and you ought to go there occasionally, Laurie, if you can still find your way, whether you go to the inner suburbs of Sydney, whether you go to the rural areas of Queensland, whether you go to the rural areas of Tasmania or Western Australia, you find the refrain, Mr Speaker, you find the refrain uh, of, of, of deserted, uh, despairing, betrayed, true believers of the Australian Labor Party, and they are really wanting the opportunity to vote against this government. They are determined to vote this government out. They are determined to tell an arrogant, out-of-touch Prime Minister that he no longer represents their best interests, and they are determined to wreak their vengeance on the Australian Labor Party at the next election. And no matter how much, Harry, you and Maggie and all of those other people, no matter how much you will try and dissociate yourself from this bloke of the dispatch box, no matter, no, oh, never, oh, never, 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 never. No, but thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very. Good on you, Maggie. Good on you. No man, God, God. Hey, Harry, would you say that too? Would you say that, Harry? No, 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 Harry, Harry. Reserve the seat. Reserve the seat. Yes or no, Harry? Yes or no? Gee, the leader of the opposition will refer, refer to members by their yeah, electorate. Yeah. Hey, hey, Graham, will you say that? The Leader of the Opposition. But Mr uh, Mr Speaker, but I but I, I I tell you, can I can I tell can Order. I tell you, Mr Speaker? Mr Speaker, can I tell Order. you the Those reason? My right. Can I can I tell you the reason? The Leader of the Opposition has yeah. the call. Can I tell you the reason? The Member reason for Mr. Gilmore. Can I can I tell you, Mr Speaker, the reason the reason that they those hundreds of thousands of former true believers of the Labor Party are aching for the opportunity 
to vote against this government. There's one very, very simple reason. I mean, this, the, the leader of the government, the Prime Minister, has always paraded himself as a bit of a specialist. Well, in a sense, they recognise that. They see, they, see, they see Paul Keating very much as the foreign debt specialist. They see him as the high interest rate specialist. They see him as the high unemployment specialist. But most importantly of all, Mr Speaker, the people of Australia, not only those hundreds of thousands that are going to walk away from you whenever the election is held, but also millions of other Australians, Mr Speaker, they see Paul Keating as the divided society specialist. And, and, and the worst legacy of this man and of this government, when it is voted out of office, will be the extent to which it has divided the Australian community, the extent to which it has put one Australian against another, the extent to which it has presided over a widening of the gap between the rich and the poor, the extent to which it has sought to play uh, pressure group politics to the detriment of the interest of the mainstream of the Australian community. And this man will wear the mark of dividing Australian society, of being a leader who has wounded and wrecked rather than healing and, and uniting, as a leader who has seen partisan political advantage in setting one group against another. And if ever there is a demonstration, Mr Speaker, of the futility of that approach, if ever there has been a demonstration of the failure of that approach, it is, of course, in relation to the issue about which the Prime Minister and I have just spoken, and that is the wood chip debate. The reason that you are in a mess on forest is that you've politicised the issue to the detriment of the national interest. And that is why, that is why you, are in, you are in an absolute mess on this, on this particular subject. Mr. But Mr Speaker, as I look back over the last, um, as I look back over the last uh, eight or nine months, Mr Speaker, I am reminded of Member the infinite variety. I am reminded of the infinite variety of the attacks that have been mounted on me and on the opposition by the Prime Minister. I mean, when, when, uh, when I was first elected on the 30th of January, uh, they, the, the, the Prime Minister and all of his colleagues they embarked upon this, this tremendous campaign to talk about the past, to talk about the 1950s, to try and create the impression that the government stands for the future and the coalition stands for the past. Well, we had an oh, you say it's true. Well, I'm glad you say it's true. I'm glad you say that. I'm glad you do, because we had a marvellous opportunity a few weeks ago to see who's for the past and who's for the future in the dispute about CRA. And as I listened to that dispute, as I listened to that dispute, I heard, I heard words, I heard language. Order. I, had a, I heard a violence of language and a violence of words that I thought had disappeared from the Australian political and industrial scene. I heard people talk about drawing a line in the sand. I heard people talk about inflicting pain. I heard people talk about chasing companies down rabbit holes. I can say to you, Mr Speaker, there was a lot of pain inflicted. There was about $200 million of pain inflicted on the Australian economy. There was enormous pain inflicted on a leather exporter I know in Western Australia who, after struggling for years to win an export order in South East Asia, uh, suffered the ignominy of seeing his export order tied up on a, on, on a wharf that had been rendered useless by the MUA strike. And as a result of all of his years of work, he lost the order to a competitor in another part of South East Asia. Now that's the kind of pain. And when I listen to that, when I listen to the language, when I listen to the language of people like Jenny George, the language of people like Bill Kelty, the language of people like Doug Cameron and Tim Pallas, I thought I was hearing debates from years ago when I heard this old-fashioned, class-driven language of the trade union leadership of Australia. And where, where was, and of course, and of course, that brings us inexorably to the Prime Minister. Now, where was he? He was in Japan. I mean, where was, I mean, there he was in Japan, stranded in his irrelevance, so far as this particular dispute is concerned. Absolutely stranded. I mean, I mean, Mr. Speaker, it really did put me in mind of the opening over of a test match. You get the opening over of a test match, and the 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 the, 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 the bowling was being Order. opened by, by Bob Hawke and Jenny George. And you have Bill Kelly keeping wickets, and you have Tim Pallas and, uh, and Doug Cameron in first and second slip. And where's the Prime Minister? He's been consigned to fine leg. And don't you feel, lo you feel lonely, Laurie? You were left to bring out the drinks. <laughs> but, Mr. but Mr Speaker, 
I mean, I mean, one of one of the interesting things in life, of course, of course, one of the interesting things in life is is to study people's self descriptions. I always find, as I'm sure many other members of the House find, I'm sure they always find self portraits and self descriptions as being very revealing. They are revealing not only of delusions, but they are also revealing of vulnerabilities. And you know, the Prime Minister has his own sort of self description, and I think I've got it right when the Prime Minister says, Well, you know, they may think I'm a bit arrogant, they may think I'm a smidgen out of touch, but gee, you know, despite all of that, I do get the mail through. I mean, I mean this is the self portrait he paints of himself. I may be a bit arrogant, grant that, but gee, I get things done and I get the mail through. And I think that reveals both a vulnerability and it also reveals a delusion, because the great delusion this Prime Minister has is that in some way he does get the mail through. People often say to me, I want to vote against the Prime Minister because he's arrogant. And I say to them, don't vote against the Prime Minister because he's arrogant, vote against the Prime Minister because he's been a failure. Because the real, the real, the, the real reason why this man should be voted out of office the real reason why his government should be voted out of office is that this government has been a failure. And those, those on the other side may Gilmore. use their noise, they may use their numbers, they may use anything they like in order to, um, in order to interject and to cry down what I'm saying. But the reality, Mr Speaker, is unquestionably that it is not the arrogance of the Prime Minister that deserves censure, much of those, much that there is a lot of that. But the reason that he deserves censure is that he's been a failure as the Prime Minister of this country. And that is the reason why he deserves. And, and you ask why I put that proposition, uh, Mr Speaker. Let us look at unemployment. I mean, if ever there was a social concern that you would think a Labor government would want to have the most pristine credentials on of all, it would be unemployment. I mean, aren't you ashamed that after 13 years unemployment is now going up again towards 9 per cent? Aren't you ashamed that youth unemployment sits now at 30 per cent? Aren't you ashamed, despite all the talk about turning corners and bringing home the bacon, and this is the one that's going to deliver it all, despite all of that talk, you still have a situation where the unemployment rate in this country is starting to rise again? that we still have almost one in three of Australian young people who want to get a job can't get a job. Is that the sort of legacy that you want to take to the true believers in an electorate like Hughes? Is that the sort of, electorate, is that the sort of legacy you want to take to Labor voters in other parts of the Australian community? Of course it isn't. And then, of course, we get to the Prime Minister's sort of piece de resistance, and that is the current account deficit. Of all of the extravagant claims that the Prime Minister, oh, he says, here I go, well, can I tell you, I'll be going a lot more on the current account deficit between now and the election. Do you think you've heard the last about the current account deficit? Now, wasn't it in 1986, Order. wasn't it in 1986 that Mr. Mr. Speaker, that the that the Prime Minister said, the Prime Minister said that if, uh, that if you know, we have a current account deficit, uh, which now is much worse than what it, it was then, we'd be headed towards becoming a banana republic. And we now have the current account deficit that is the worst in the OECD. It is worse even than Mexico. We have a foreign debt that's risen from $23 billion in 1983 to $180 billion today. We have interest rates. Australia has amongst the highest real interest rates in the world. Inflation is now at 5.1 per cent, which is one of the highest in the OECD area. Um, economic growth, very interesting, Mr Speaker. The Business, Council the, today, the Business Council today has produced an analysis of the Australian economy, which is recorded, and I quote from the analysis, and this has come out only today, the lowest average growth rate for a five-year period since at least 1960. So you have to go back 35 years to find an average growth rate over a period of five years, which is lower than the growth rate of the last five years. And also significantly, that same report demonstrated that in terms of national income per capita, Australia in the international rankings has fallen from 10th in 1983 to 22nd, Mr Speaker, from 10th in 1983 to 22nd in 1995. Now, if, if the government and the Prime Minister want to take that kind of 
economic record to the Australian people, if they want to campaign on that, if they think that is as good as it's ever going to get, if they believe that nobody has any reason to complain or object about that, well, I could say, and all of my colleagues on this side of the House could simply say, oh, that we could be so lucky, that people could be so deluded about their own performance, they could be so out of touch with what Australian people think at the present time that they could believe that that is the kind of thing that is going to secure them election. But the other reason, apart from his economic failure, Mr Speaker, that I believe the Prime Minister deserves to be censured by this House is his failure to uphold appropriate ministerial standards. His absolute failure to sack Carmen Lawrence for having deceitfully misled the Australian people. I mean, it really is a remarkable party. They throw Graham Campbell out for saying what he believes. They keep Carmen Lawrence for lying about what she's done. Order. Now, that is a very, Order. very no, no, strange— No, no, no. The Legal Opposition will withdraw that last comment well, and replace it with other words. Well, Mr, Mr. Speaker, if you, if you ask me, I they am. throw Graham Campbell out for saying what he believes. They, uh, they keep Carmen Lawrence in for, for deceiving the Australian public about what she has done. And everybody on this side of the House and everybody out in the Australian community knows that if the Prime Minister had had the standards of Gough Whitlam, if he'd had the standards of Ben Chifley, if he'd had the standards of Malcolm Fraser or Bob Hawke, he would have had the courage to sack Carmen Lawrence. And, and, and you know, he, he, parades this, he parades this fiction, he parades this myth, Mr Speaker, that in some way it's been a conspiracy of the Liberal Party. Just remember, Mr Speaker, I mean, they never, he talks about the Burke squad, he talks about the conspiracy, but everybody knows that Carmen Lawrence burnt not because of the Liberal Party, she burnt not because of Richard Court or anybody on this side of the House, she burnt because her Labor colleagues in Western Australia, the old Burke squad, could no longer maintain their conspiracy of silence. And if it hadn't been for the fact that Keith Wilson spoke to Paul McGeeck of the Sydney Morning Herald in April of this year, if it hadn't been for the fact that all of her colleagues lined up to give evidence against her, if it hadn't been for the fact that Jim McGinty, one of them, who actually told the Prime Minister that Carmen Lawrence was deceiving the Australian public, he warned the Prime Minister not to back Carmen Lawrence. In other words, he told the Prime Minister that he'd be sending good taxpayers' money after bad if he promised to pay the cost of Carmen Lawrence. If it hadn't been for the actions of those people, all of whom are members of the Australian Labor Party, then Carmen Lawrence would not now be in the predicament that she's in. She's there because she was exposed as being deceitful and dishonest by her own former Cabinet colleagues in Western Australia. She was undone by her own deceit. She was undone by her own dishonesty. She was undone by her own deception. It was Labor mates. It was the Burke squad. It was Order. all of those who brought, those, who brought her down. Nobody else. Member and this prospect. man sitting opposite stands condemned for not upholding the standards of Prime Minister Order Demand. And it is a mark of the standards that he's had. It is a mark of his failure to set those standards as a Prime Minister, which is one of the other reasons why he should be censured. Mr Speaker, I hope in a sense that the Prime Minister was right when he said we will be coming back next year, but I don't think we will and I look forward very, very much to the coming encounter in the election campaign. Is the motion seconded? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, three times he's tried to get up and move this motion. Three times, it, three times he's prepared. On. Order, uh, order. And Mr. Speaker, Prime there Minister not, will be heard. There was not even a flicker of political life in it. There was not a flicker of political life in it. Mr. Speaker, my great fear is he'll die. In order. The, he'll die in the straight on me. If I stretch him out or may, he'll die on the straight on me. Because if this is the best he can do, I've only had to make him run February, February to the end of the year. And, and God, you know, he was. At, he was up the front of the field and he's dropping back, you know, as you can see the line coming up. I mean, if that's a sensation of a fighting opposition leader in the last days, as he sees it, of, of this parliament, well, God help you all over there. God help you all over there. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. Mr. Speaker, and, and just, to, just to reveal, Mr. Speaker, the fact that he has not a clue about where we are now in the world or what we're doing. 
He thought putting together the largest free trade area in the world had me stranded in Japan. <laughs> that is, in, in, in one of the greatest post-war initiatives of Australian, order. Of Australian foreign policy— Order. The House will come to order. Stitching together a Pacific Rim stadium community, we were stranded in Japan. Stranded in Japan. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker I want to move the following motion to speak to it. That all words after that be omitted and the following words inserted. That the Leader of the Opposition be censured for his failure to stand for any consistent policy principle or issue of substance before the Australian people. Order. For his failure to imbue the Federal Coalition with any standards of integrity and in, in responsibility in policy development. In policy Order. development. No, no, the Prime Minister will be heard. Those on my left. Leader of the Opposition was heard. For his failure to imbue the Federal Coalition with any standards of integrity and responsibility in policy development. For his Member refusal for Parks. to engage the Australian people in serious debate on matters of policy importance. Yeah, right. And his preference for political stunts, empty headland speeches and smears over policy rigour and substance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Order. Mr Speaker, it came to Member all this week Flinders. when the paper which has supported him most finally came and said, how ducks are hard decisions. Exactly. And the Financial Review, in a, in, a, in a long editorial, how ducks are hard decisions. And why did they say it, Mr Speaker, that on the basic issue of management, on the basic issue of management he said in his uh, speech at Competitive Australia on the 18th of July, we will make significant public savings. The overriding objective of our fiscal policy will be achieved over the economic cycle, a structural budget surplus, so that rather than contributing to debt Order. creation, the government will be adding to the national savings Prime bill. Minister will in receive a, seat for, in I, a sense I, of motion, yes, Mr. Speaker, it. Well, the, member, the member for Warringah, report of order. The amendment was a negation of the original motion. There is no point. I want to resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Prime Minister has the call. I remind Speaker, members of Standing Order 55 while I'm about it. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, I made clear made, he made clear that he stands for a structural budget surplus. But when asked this week, on a, the first, one of the rare times he's been questioned on television, when the compare, Mr. Cassidy, said it sounds as though it won't be on big program spent items, the government seems to be gleefully awaiting announcements of savage budget cuts into programs. That isn't going to happen. I think there's a lot of things the government is gleefully awaiting that aren't going to happen. And he kept backing away from that point onwards, Mr Speaker. Then he got a order. Yeah, okay, we'll get to it. Order. The member for Mr. Speaker, and the Deputy Leader. He got asked leader. repeatedly at a press conference about whether he's will you still commit yourself to a structural surplus after accounting for asset players? Well I haven't seen the starting point, he said. Then he got a repeatedly asked the question. And then finally he said, but you, the questioner Order. said, but you talked about substantial public savings in the past. In July you mentioned substantial public savings. Let me say again, our commitment is that if we promise to spend money or forego revenue, we will say where the money is coming from. I have never said that we are going further than that. In other words, Mr Speaker, a complete denial of the fact that he intends to get a budget surplus that he intends on using cuts in program spendings to get it. In fact, Mr Speaker, at the end of, of uh, this year, after a year back as Leader of the Opposition on fiscal policy, he stands for nothing. Exactly. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Mr Speaker, then he says, Mr Speaker, Order. that he has uh, he falls back to this question, he falls back to this stuff about overlap with the public, uh, public sector between the Commonwealth and the States. And Mr Speaker, I'd, I'd, I'll just tell him that the Department of Finance's assessment is that the total cost of administrative specific purpose payment savings is around 60 million or 0.33 of a percent of the total value of specific purpose payments. So, in other words, Mr. Speaker, by getting rid of the, the so-called overlap and duplication and administrative efficiencies, he's going to save 60 million. He's only got the balance of 11 billion to go to meet his deputy's target. A balance of 11 billion to go, Mr. Speaker. Uh, now, Mr. Speaker, that's, that's, he's not going to, he said, change tax rates. Right. He's not going to put up uh, tax, Order. Mr. Speaker. Order. Then he says the that he's not going to make big spending chance. cuts. In other words, Mr. Speaker, he's made himself so small a target 
He stands for nothing at all. There is, there is no, he stands for nothing whatsoever in terms of the modern management of the Australian economy. Nothing whatsoever. Then take industrial relations, Mr. Speaker. He mentioned this in his, uh, in his, in his address. Take industrial relations. He said on so many occasions, I would like to see throughout Australia an industrial relations system that is largely similar to what the coalition government has implemented in Western Australia. I supported the IR laws that have already been enacted in Western Australia. Then he said earlier, in 1992, I, I feel very comfortable with IR Minister Goode's policy. I think it is an excellent policy. We have had a lot of discussions before it came out. We have had a lot of discussions before it came out. Give or take a comma here or there, the Coalition's policy was the same as Victoria's, he said, at the National Press Club. The main thrust of Victorian legislation is on all fours with our approach. And after, of course, they introduced their policy, 400,000 Victorian workers transferred to the federal system. Mr Speaker, I've always been a passionate advocate of workplace contracts, he says. Uh, then he said, our proposals are not a mirror image of the New Zealand proposals, but they are in the same category. They are of the same type. Now, Mr Speaker, this is the, uh, this is the Leader of the Opposition who believes in Senator radical Gilmore. labour market reform. This is the Leader of the Opposition who believes in no flexibility downwards, who believes in contracts without the Commission, uh, who believes in bargaining without a no disadvantage test who believes and is on the record over and over again of saying there is no place for the Arbitration Commission. Amongst other things, he said he would stab it in the stomach. He does not see a role. It's outside. He said, I am irrevocably committed to an enterprise approach with voluntary agreements outside the reach of the Industrial Relations Commission. No commission. Under our policy, the Act will be amended to prevent the Commission having any jurisdiction over these matters covered by voluntary agreements. He sees no arbiter in it. He sees flexibility down. He doesn't believe in compensation for penalty rates. He makes that very clear in a number of statements he's made about this. But what is he saying, Mr. Order. Speaker? Order. What's he saying now? He's out there trying to say our policies are the same member as the for government. Flinders and the member for Gippsland. We believe that there up. should be a no disadvantage test of some kind. We will have certain minima. We will have the commission. Uh, we will uh, now. We will we'll still have a role for the commission in all this, Mr. Speaker. Someone who is committed to savage cuts in the working uh, works of uh, of all of all Australians, uh, who believe in all these things, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. Those on my left. Uh, he believes in all these things, but now he's trying to say, Mr. Speaker. Now he's trying to say that I know he's really got a cuddly wuddly IR policy. He really believes it's the same as the government's. In other words, on the big thing he staked his whole career on, the great reform, as he calls it, of industrial relations, the importance of radical labour market reform, where is he? He's now trying to wimp away to uh, a policy which he's always regarded as wimpish, and that's, of course, the government's policy of protection for people who are disadvantaged and low pay. So on fiscal policy, Order. he stands for nothing. For Kennedy, on fiscal for policy, Mr Speaker, he stands for nothing. Uh, on industrial relations policy, as the wait goes on, he's moving back nearer to the government's policy. And what I've said to the Australian people, don't believe him. Don't believe him. All he wants to do is to get into office and say, you know what the players are, you know who the Order. team is, you know what the play who the players are, my left. you know what the team is. He said over time, having laid out an industrial relations policy over such a long period of time, is that if I win the election, nobody can deny I have a mandate to change industrial relations. So I say to the Australian people, don't believe him. He's weak and he's sneaky and don't believe him. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker he's weak and he's sneaky and don't believe him. Order. Now, Mr. Speaker, I promise this wait. I remind you again of standing order 55. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is the same person Member who Broke said Connor. Medicare is a failure in his 87 policy document. We will end bulk billing, which produces a scandalous waste of money. Medi Order. Medicare is an administrative quagmire, quagmire, a financial monster, and a human nightmare. This is what he said about Medicare. In the fight back policy, he's changed. I warn includes the member for Kennedy. Medicare for pensioners and cardholders only. Bulk billing abolished for Medicare except for welfare recipients, and that was only three years ago. And I warn the member for O'Connor. Mr Connor. Speaker, here's his policy launch, allowing opting out of the Medicare arrangements, abolishing bulk billing, 
Medicare is a failure, he says, in his 87 policy launch. Then he said, we'll pull it right apart. The second thing we'll do is get rid of bulk billing. It's an absolute rort. Yes, he said, the best we can, we'll go completely back, but I'd love to go right back. Mr Speaker, and now he says he believes in Medicare. Now he believes in bulk billing. After all of these years, Mr Speaker, he's weak and sneaky and the public shouldn't believe him. Yeah. Mr Speaker, on these big, on these big policies, Mr Speaker, Mr Order. Speaker, you see, the problem Order. about John Howard, he's missed the whole message with the contract with America. At least Newt Gingrich put his program down and got his majority elected on it. You have Order. no program down. You are now walking away from your program, yet you want to claim a mandate on the basis of the fact you know the team and you know what they'll do. Not a mandate on what you're now saying, but what you've said in the past. And what you've said in the past is, is that you'll make Member massive cuts Aston. to government spending, you'll cut, the, you'll cut the heart out of Medicare and you'll cut the wages of working Australians as you push them back to individual contracts. So, Mr Speaker, this is where the great brave John Howard's finally ended up, a parliamentary and policy whip, trying to sneak his way through to polling day so the public won't notice that he's really got the same draconian policies he's Member always Stur had, instead of standing up and saying, if I believe that we ought to have radical change in the labour market and I'll stake my political career, career on it, he wants to get it by stealth. He wants to sneak there and take it from them take them from them after he's elected to office. Instead of saying, I don't believe in Medicare, I don't believe in the concept of universality, and standing on it and seeing how he goes in the marketplace, he wants to pretend he supports it when he doesn't. And instead of saying that he actually Aston, doesn't believe the in the Commission, that he doesn't believe in a no-disadvantage test, that he doesn't believe in the no-disadvantage test, that he, does, that he believes in flexibility upwards and outwards, but in reality, flexibility down, Instead of saying these things, knowing they will be unpalatable, he won't say them, and so he seeks to go to a poll without a mandate. He finishes the year having walked past the parliamentary press gallery of slipping and sliding with basically uh, slippery words through television and radio interviews over the year. He's come to the end Order. of the parliamentary year without Order. credibility, without integrity, without honesty and without a mandate. That's where, he, that's where he's finally ended up, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and Mr. Order. Speaker, what does he, how does he go out? How does he start his censure motion? Pointing to the members opposite, he says, won't be here after the election. I can do the same with the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven sitting members who are over there before the last election, who are not there now. That's right. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, after huffing and puffing to censure the government. What did he come up with? One of the weakest performances I've seen in a censor motion in all the years I've been here. Mr Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I swear blind I'll have to prop him up to keep him as an opponent before polling day. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I'll have to put splints on him. I'll have to get the splints on him to keep him in the straight. Because I swear blind, Mr Speaker, he's going to die on me. He's like, the last guy died on me in the last 10 days of the campaign. You know, uh, Labor's got to go. I said, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Labor's got to go, sure. And we saw the big rally at the Circular Key. And I thought, this is right in the bag, right in the bag. I said to my wife, this thing is one. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Order. Mr. Order. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, Order. what we're seeing from what we're seeing now from this fellow. Is he won't even stand where Houston stood with some decent policy. Order. He wants to pretend he's got policies and then claim them out. He stands condemned in the terms the I wrote the amendment in. Has concluded. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, what a weak, boring, soporific, pathetic performance that was. Oh, nah, those are my rights. There he was, sort of meandering the through deputy his speech, leader of the opposition has the reminding call. one of, a, of an athlete coming down the straight with, with spindly legs turning over but not getting any distance. And we're watching the clock, wondering whether he'll make it to the finish line by the time the clock runs out. And this was supposed to be from the man who's got the next election won. And, and, and what was his big point? His big point was that the Leader of the Opposition stands for nothing, but if we're wrong about that, he's a vicious ideologue. <laughs> you know, 
The leader of the opposition's got no fiscal policy, but we've we've counted up his fiscal policy, and we can put it out at eleven billion dollars. You know, they've got a secret policy to drive wages down, but just in case we're wrong about that, there's going to be a wages explosion. You know, these are the lines, the tired old lines that he rattles out from a tired old Prime Minister. And, and what does he say? He said, oh, look, look, you're not like Newt Gringrich. That was his other one. Well, I remember you saying a few months ago that because the Pope wouldn't meet Newt Gingrich, the Pope was on your side in the next election. <laughs> hey, was I wrong about that? You know, I, I, I've got the reserve in one pocket and the treasury in the other and the Pope in the back pocket as well. You know, these are the monstrous delusions that you come out with. Monstrous delusions. And what it illustrates is that somebody that has been in power for so long has not only lost all grip on what's facing Australia and the problems that Australians are facing, but you've lost all grip of reality on yourself. <laughs> on yourself. You know, and how does he finish it up? I said to my wife, we won it. <laughs> we won it. Prime Minister is showing his seat. Order. We want it off. Order. Order. Right. The deputy leader don't, has the Don't you worry about the McCarris pendulum. I said to my wife, we won it. <laughs> and what did she say? What did she say? Bad luck. I was looking forward to the job in Europe. <laughs> I think that's probably what she said. But you know, here's the Prime Minister who began his big censure speech by saying, oh, I guess I'd better take it. I guess I'd better take it. It's a, it's a real effort for you, isn't it, to actually come in here and take a censure and debate anything? You could, have had, you could have had an opportunity to come in here and debate on Thursday of last week. You could have debated here on Monday, but you scuttled out like a rat, like a rat out of the chamber. This is a Prime Minister alone. Alone of the 24 Prime Ministers oh, no, that Australia has right. had, who refuses to come into the House every day and answer questions, alone of all the 24 Prime Ministers that we've ever had in this country, this is a Prime Minister that has no respect for standards. This is a Prime Minister that describes the Senate as unrepresentative swill. This is a Prime Minister whose Prime Ministership was conceived in the deception of the Kirribilli conspiracy. This is, this is a Prime Minister who has used the privilege of this House to smear reputations around Australia and most recently to smear reputations of Royal Commissioners in Perth, under privilege in this Parliament to use expressions like cat's paw and hanging judge and lackey. This is a Prime Minister that is unable to discipline a minister who on every account cannot be trusted with the truth, as found on the sworn evidence of all of her former colleagues. This is a Prime Minister that presided over the forest fiasco and had this Parliament House blockaded for days on end. And I've got to say that was a pretty funny experience too, seeing the Zegna suit trying to walk through the blue siglets. People that he hadn't seen for a very long period of time coming into work at 10.30 and 11 o'clock in the morning, the part-time Prime Minister, who's presided over the ANL disaster, the ANL disaster, the shipping line that's going to be sold year after year and vetoed by the unions. This is a, this is a Prime Minister whose government's been enmeshed in the Civil Aviation Authority scandal. This is a government that was going to privatise the AIDC and rather than selling off the remaining shares, it now wants to buy them back. Rather than getting money in, it's now paying money out in relation to the AIDC. This is a Prime Minister who enmeshed himself in the Colesmeyer board, who went out and attacked the superannuation funds of this country as donkeys and lemmings because he didn't like the... Quite proper, was it? Quite proper. Okay. You are forcing people to put money under the management of donkeys and lemmings. Donkeys and lemmings. Quite right. Quite proper. Quite Member proper. for Northern Territory. You know, you've got a Member system where you Territory. are taking nine percent of employees' salaries from the employer and three percent from employees. And who do you want to pass it over to manage for 20 and 30 and 40 years? Donkeys and lemmings. Donkeys and lemmings. Quite right, he said. 
one of the genii of the Labor backbench. Quite right, he said. This is a government that's been protesting that it would do something about unfair breath. dismissal laws and has done nothing. And he stands up and he says, oh, but look at me in APEC. I was some modern-day Metternich or Talleyrand. You know, Henry Keating, I was over there in Tokyo. It was all my work. The fact is the Prime Minister went off to APEC to lecture on the virtues of free trade at a time when you couldn't move anything in or out of Australia. <laughs> what do you think our APEC neighbours thought of that? Free trade with Australia when you can get nothing across a wall? And, 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 and the whole dispute was going to be solved in, uh, by lunchtime. And here you had up at Weeper, as the Leader of the Opposition said, people who were working better for better pay. And this was a government that could not hold the line in relation to that, that got its orders, that couldn't solve the dispute. And in the ultimate humiliation, who is brought in to solve the dispute? Not the Prime Minister, not the lorry over there, who's the responsible Minister for Industrial Relations. We've got to bring back, you guessed it, Bob Hawke. And you know, it was a very good illustration to the people of Australia why they brought Bob Hawke, because the truth is this. This Prime Minister is great at dividing, but he can never heal. He can never heal. He is the great divider of Australian society. He has divided it between the rich and the poor. He has divided it with his rhetoric, and he is now dividing the Labor Party in his desperate attempts to try and close down all dissent opinion. And Jim Snow was absolutely right about that. Absolutely right. Well, Kim would agree with that. There used to be a strand of the Labor Party that represented blue-collar thought. <laughs> and represented blue-collar people, but there is no place in it in this modern Labor Party. The blue-collar has been replaced by the Zegna suit, and as a result you see people like Campbell, who did once represent a strand of Labor Party thinking, being told there is no place for them and no place for their views. And the Deputy Prime Minister himself, of course, absolutely humiliated in relation to that, at a conversation with Campbell assuring him he was going to be all right just before the phone call came, I've got to tell you, mate, your time's up. And, and if, you want to take, if you want to take an example as to what the situation is in relation to ministerial standards, this is a government which has the lowest ministerial standards of any government in Australian history. This Prime Minister stood up in this House of Representatives on the 28th of August and he said, quote, I insist that in the performance of their public duties, in their dealings with the public and in the parliament, ministers tell the truth and behave honestly at all times. That's what he said. I insist that in their dealings with the public and the parliament, ministers tell the truth and behave honestly at all times. But the fact is he doesn't. The fact is he doesn't insist on his ministers being honest. The fact is you have a case study which proves it conclusively. You have a royal commission which has made very clear findings. You have, seen a, you have seen a royal commission that gave the opportunity for every one of the former colleagues of the Minister for Health to come in, and you have seen the royal commissioner make his finding that in relation to the evidence that was before him, when Dr Lawrence denied she knew anything about the contents of the Eastern Petition on the morning of 5 November 1992, she did not tell the truth. Kovacs, Willoughby, M, Sullivan, Estelle Blackburn, Marcel Anderson, seven cabinet members and Kabulki support that the briefings took place. This is the finding. It means that 14 persons, all of whom supported Dr Lawrence's government and or worked for it, contradict her claimed non-involvement and unawareness. Only one of those 14 witnesses needs to be believed to confirm the truth of the contradiction. The chance that each of these 14 persons fabricated their evidence is so remote as to be non-existent. That was the finding. So remote as to be non-existent. And even in relation to that commission, the original argument, of course, was that it was all some kind of fit out by the Liberal Party until it's and it was, was it? So let's just remind who the Liberal Party conspirators were. Kovacs, Willoughby, M. Sullivan, Estelle Blackburn, Marcel Anderson. Kabelke, McGinty, Ian Taylor. You know, we've been running both sides of politics in Western Australia. We, the Liberal Party, had a majority in the Lawrence Cabinet, I suppose. And the fact was that the evidence that damned her, the evidence that came to light, was Keith Wilson, 
a Labor minister, Pam Beggs, and when, of course, the Liberal conspiracy theory completely disappeared, we had a new theory. This time it was a Labor conspiracy, the Burke Squad. And we had the introduction of the Burke Squad as a reason why the Prime Minister could walk away from that assurance that he was going to insist on his ministers telling the truth. And of course, the Burke Squad police would have you believe all of these people were somehow being manipulated out of prison by Brian Burke. They all went in and they gave fabricated evidence. But the truth is, as the Commissioner found, this minister could not tell the truth to the West Australian Parliament. She could not tell the truth to the National Press Club. She could not tell the truth when she was asked about it in this parliament. She could not tell the truth to the parliamentary press gallery. And any prime minister worth his salt, any prime minister with any decency and respect for standards in Australia would have taken the, the action which any previous prime minister would have done and would have dismissed her. But this is, in fact, a weak prime minister, a weak prime minister who is prepared who is prepared to pull down the standards rather than enforce them. Whitlam had the guts to sack Connor, but this Prime Minister has never had the courage to deal with or discipline one minister. And it's that failure which is eating the heart out of standards in Australian public life, eating the heart out because we now know there are no standards. Any minister on that front bench of the Labor government knows that they can mislead the public they can deceive, they can do it at the press club, they can do it at the House, and there will be no discipline whatsoever from the Prime Minister. This Prime Minister has effectively given a green light to all of his ministers in relation to their dealings with the public. And the awful truth is that this Prime Minister cannot discipline dishonesty without demanding his own commission. Because if this Prime Minister now started to insist if he now started to insist that ministers deal honestly, where would that leave him? Where would that leave him? Where would that leave him in relation to the legislated income tax that cuts the LAW, the cut tax cuts which are due to take effect on 1 January, in four weeks' time, on 1 January? The people of Australia who had legislated for them a $10 per week tax cut from 1 January and will not receive $1 for one day in relation to those tax cuts. And not only was it the income tax LAW that turned to an LIE, it was all of the other taxes as well. It was the 2 per cent increase in the wholesale sales tax, the wine tax, the company tax, all of those other taxes which show that the platform that you were given this three-year term was essentially fraudulent, a platform which you did not have any intention of introducing, which you have not introduced and which, if you have your way, you will try and do again in relation to the next three-year term. The fact is that this is a government that has presided over a massive increase in foreign debt, an 800 per cent increase in foreign debt over the last 13 years. It is a government that has put Australia into recurring crises on its current account. It is a government which now is facing rising unemployment. And when you hear them talk about this wonderful period of economic growth, a wonderful period of economic growth which had as its high point a low of 8.2 per cent unemployment, and over the last four, years, four months, 8.2, 8.3, 8.5, 8.7, with more to come. This is a government that has lost sight of ministerial standards. It is a government which has tried and failed. It is a government which must meet the final finishing line and the verdict of the Australian people at the next election. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Well, that's a whinge from somebody dragged, kicking and screaming from the tart shop. If you are going to censure a Prime Minister that has presided over the most massive change in the regulatory environment in the Australian economy, open us up to be at our most competitive Order. position internationally, presided as Treasurer and then Prime Minister, over the creation of two and a quarter million jobs exactly. in this community at the rate of 160,000 a year in comparison to 55,000 a year when your now leader as treasurer was in office. If you are going to censure a prime minister who has presided over an increase in the productivity of our workforce on an annual average rate of 2.9 per cent for the last five years, who has uh, done that 
in the face of our industrial, with our industrial relations system as opposed to that which you advocate from New Zealand, where the productivity increase there has been 1 per cent. If you are going to censure a Prime Minister that has presided over the creation of superannuation opportunities for every worker in this country that has taken a position where there were 40 per cent covered by superannuation arrangements to now, where virtually the entire workforce is covered by superannuation arrangements. If you are going to censure a Prime Minister who presided over the healing process of Mabo in exactly. the native title legislation, if you are going to censure a Prime Minister who presided over the creation of the Working Nations Statement, that statement, which is now with programs acknowledged around the world as the correct way of tackling unemployment in a situation where massive technological change has produced circumstances where you require an enormous training effort by the government. If you are going to censure a Prime Minister that as Treasurer presided over the establishment of Medicare and universal health coverage for all Australians, with, a, uh, with you in solid opposition right the way through it, if you are going to censure a Prime Minister who has created a situation where pensioners in this country get 25 per cent of average weekly earnings, <coughs> if you are going to censure a Prime Minister who has presided over a substantial restructuring of our taxation system, taking the top rate down from 60 per cent to 47 per cent and, and moving middle income earners down from about 35 per cent to the mid-twenties, you have got to do an awful lot better than that. And above all, if you are going to do those things, one thing that you absolutely require absolutely require, and I'm glad to see you've all disappeared because you don't want to hear it, the one thing that you absolutely require is a policy. <laughs> a policy. You actually need... Order. Order. You actually need... I've said before, it's hard enough controlling them on the floor without the there is a policy. <laughs> there is a real problem as far as that is concerned. A few of us on this side of the House suspect you might actually have one. We, we have been. Oh, we do. We do. Yes, we know about black yours. Spots. Yours black is our policy on black spots. <laughs> <laughs> we know about Tim's policy, and uh, we uh, and we know also about the industrial relations policy. Many people here will not comprehend this, but many people here ought to know, and many people, if there are any listening outside this place, ought to know this: that a week before the last election campaign, John Howard came out like one of those chaps that you occasionally unfortunately see around the marketplaces in a big great coat. He said, under this great coat, I have an industrial relations bill. It's all worked out. That industrial relations bill is there, ready to go. line by line, ready to go. The moment we get into office, a reasonable question was asked by the Prime Minister at that point of time. Uh, uh, could we see it? Um, it's a week before an election campaign. The public might like to know what actually is in this bill. Oh, no. A fellow in leadership in the party is entitled to keep a little bit in his back pocket to be revealed afterwards. Well, it's three years. It's three years since then, and we just haven't seen that little bit of policy, which just happens to affect the livelihoods of every Australian, in potential at least, if you get into office. We get hints about what it might be like. When a chap turns up in Western Australia, now my home state's a long way away, and it's two hours behind in time, and you can occasionally hope the, the journalists over here will take no notice of what you say over there. <laughs> and, you, uh, and you get over there and you talk to Richard Court, who's introduced a massive array of draconian legislation. And you say to Richard, now, Richard, we think that this is a, uh, a pretty good proposition that you've got here on the table, knocking workers out of a right to organise, putting them in the place where they have to get contracts, which will suppress their wages, we are going to take you as a model. A model that's, right. that's what we that's say when we stand before West Australian business. What Mix the Court proposes is our model. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we will be putting that model in place when we get into office. Now, in Western Australia, it is the habit of these groups nurses, teachers, senior public servants, I am afraid to say, in majority, to regularly vote Liberal. It's an unfortunate thing that I have to leave, live with in Western Australia, but it is the case that in majority, not all of them, in majority they regularly vote Liberal. 
Right throughout the course of this year, every one of those groups has effectively been on, in some form of industrial action for months and months and months. You talk about shutting the water side. Yeah. Uh, what happened in Western Australia was a yeah. series of bodgy contracts were put up with a bodgy Steve Adoring organisation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happened from that was a shutdown in Western Australia that did the state enormous damage sent out, of course, to be investigated, this particular Steve Adoring contract, and the poor civil servant who had to do that investigation came back. What was his conclusion? Well, that aspect of his conclusion that we were permitted to see, that aspect of his conclusion, was that a crook contract had been let. And so what happened after that, in this great industrial relations nirvana that the Liberals wanted to impose on the rest of Australia, was the state government took its bat and ball home. They stamped their foot. And they said, all right, we won't put out another Steve Adoring contract. What we're going to do as we, as we march out of this place is shut down state ships. And now somebody said, well then, how are we actually going to keep the North West supply? The old, the old National Party Minister raised his hand and said, how are we going to actually keep the old constituent supplied up? No, well, we hadn't thought of that. <coughs> that was a matter which hadn't struck us, not forcibly enough anyway at the time. So they've been scrambling ever since to try and put a contract in place that would do the job. Now, while we're on West Australian subjects, the Liberal Party said, or at least Mr Costello, before he vacated this place, uh, like a rocket the moment I got onto my feet, yeah, that's right. Mr Costello said to, of us, you suppose that we in the Liberal Party run both sides of politics in Western Australia? Now, actually, what we think you run in Western Australia is what Mr Filing says that you run. See, up the back there sits Mr Filing. He is the member for more. He has sitting next to him usually Mr Rocha, who is the member for Curtin. Have they had policy disagreements with their leader? Any policy disagreements with their leader? No. Have they been disloyal to their leader? The answer is no. They in fact were two of his strongest supporters when he became the leader of the opposition for the third time of asking in the course of this parliament. They were the leaders of his West Australian brood. This man of strength, this non-weak and sneaky man, could not protect in Western Australia his two strongest supporters. And from what? From what? Well, let me, let me now say who Mr Filing feels he fails to have been protected from. I could conclude but by saying that this episode, and what Mr Filing is analysing, is what he describes as organised crime. At the top positions in the Liberal Party in this area, which has produced from that organised crime two or three members of parliament in uh, Western Australia strongly supportive of the other side. And he says this, I conclude by saying that this episode in the Liberal Party's history in Western Australia is one of the most darkest and most unsavoury ones. I must say that the Liberal Party is a great institution. It is a great party. It has a great history. Unfortunately, in the case of Western Australia, not just in the case of his electorate, in the case of Western Australia, its affairs have been dominated and taken over by a bunch of people who should be nowhere near public office. Yeah. They are a disgrace. And the sooner a proper open judicial inquiry identifies and sets in train the prosecution of those responsible for Wanneroo Inc., the better. The better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, this is the state government, of course, that can find a load of public funds, five million dollars worth of public funds, to put the kibosh they hoped on a federal minister over here over affairs that have Member nothing Frank to do, has nothing to do with her contemporary position here in this place and the way in which she administers authority. They can spend five million dollars on that, but can they spend a cent? on a proper judicial inquiry oh, no. into those sorts of things which judicial inquiries are classically conducted into, can they spend one cent on that? Not on your Nelly. Yeah. Not on your Nelly. A proper, open judicial inquiry with the powers of a royal commission is not going on in Western Australia. And it is deliberately not going Member on in Frank Western Honor. Australia because, as Mr Filing points out, as Mr Filing points out, the paper trail on those massive bribery scandals, Straight even mentioning in, case one, in the case of one particular individual, uh, a person subsequently involved in this process, subsequently serving six years in drug convictions in Western Australia, 
If you have you got that situation where with all of that, with all of that serious ongoing contemporary criminal and political issues not on your nelly, will the leader of the opposite, leader of the government in Western Australia institute a proper inquiry on that? So when we just dismiss, as we do, the motivation, the terms of reference, the conduct, the intensely political conduct of that Royal Commission into West Australia, in Western Australia on Carmen Lawrence, when we just dismiss it, we do it on the basis of detailed, intimate knowledge, detailed, intimate knowledge, courtesy of the Liberal Party, of what its own affairs are in Western Australia, a most shameful organisation which has seen the dismissal of John Howard's two strongest supporters in Western Australia without so much as a whimper from the Leader of the Opposition. Not a whimper. Weak and sneaky, said the Prime Minister. Other people might have stronger terms to apply to somebody who has left his principal supporters in Western Australia in the lurch like the, uh, like the Leader of the Opposition has. It is no wonder that since the day he took over office, when he replaced the so-called Dream Team, you remember the Dream Team? For us. There was John Alexander Downer, Peter Costello. This was the new Liberal Party, new ideas, as I've said on other occasions in this place, all jeans and prams out there telling the public around this country that the Liberal Party stood for new things and worthwhile things dead within eight months. Dead within eight months, the Liberal Party's one shot at renewal in the entirety of this parliament. What did they get back in? The old war horse. The bloke who has the hide leaving Australia with 11 per cent unemployment, 11 per cent inflation, has the hide to rock back into this place and say, please have a 24-hour memory, everybody, and make me Prime Minister again. I have an 11 per cent inflation rate. The Prime Minister presides over one which has broken the back of inflation in this country now lying at about 3 per cent, and that's as high as it's been for about five years. The, uh, the, with the Prime Minister presiding over that, he says he has the hide to be an alternative manager. He has the hide to criticise the level of unemployment now when it was 11 per cent when he left office. But that's not the story, really. The story on unemployment, of course, relates when you go to those statistics at the participation rate. In the depths of the recession in this country, we had more people as a percentage of the working community in employment and in the best year of John Howard's treasurership than in the best year. I don't mean that in absolute terms. I'm talking about that in relative terms. Of course, in absolute terms, there are two million more. But in relative terms, more than at the best point. Indeed, if now we had John Howard's participation rates, we had John Howard's participation rates, the unemployment level would be three and a half per cent. That would be the contemporary unemployment level. Why is it Member higher? I'm not because we believe in equity again. in this country, and part of equity means that women can join the workforce. And when women join the workforce, they get supported. So we have, instead of 40,000 places in childcare, we've got 280,000, and we're headed to a promise several hundred thousand more than that at a very rapid rate. We have an ability, and again, to go back to those points I made earlier, you have the hide to preside over a Prime Minister who, is in, who has as Treasurer and Prime Minister. You have a hide to try and censure a Prime Minister who introduced the greatest change in the Australian workforce, made it happen with decency, made it happen in circumstances when the children got properly looked after in that process, and you want to throw all that out for what? For what? A policy vacuum Confining a mound, confining, con hiding a mound of deceit, a mound of deceit which conceals a set of prejudices, not policies. Prejudices aimed at the ordinary Australian working man and woman. Order. You deserve dismissal and censure, and that's what the House is going to give you. Exactly. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Mr. Speaker, let me begin. Let me begin by quoting, Order. quoting a letter to. Mike Kaiser, State Secretary of ALP in Brisbane. Order, those on my right. Let me say, Mr. Speaker. Those on my right. This is a very interesting letter from Middle Australia. It's a very interesting letter from a blue collar worker in central Queensland. And it's addressed to Mike Kaiser, and I quote for the benefit of the House. And it says, Dear Sir, 
I inform you of my resignation from the Labor Party, and do so because of the inability of your administrative committee to come to terms with what the ordinary people in remote areas want. It goes on to say, amongst other things, from the fallout after the last election, the ALP has been accused of not listening to people. This claim is valid. He goes on to add, these problems have to be addressed, not just in rhetoric or token gestures, but by a concerned, consultative process, from there to diagnost diagnostic determination and early enactment of sound policies. He ends by saying in this letter to Mike Kaiser, Queensland Secretary of the ALP, this, however, is the end of my predicament. And with all this said, I resign from the Labor Party. My name is to be taken off all records, mailing lists, etc. Former Labor member. Now, I'm not going to give you the benefit of a witch hunt of this person, but I'm going to say, I'm going to say that's just one of many letters that are coming to the coalition reflecting the true reaction from middle Australia who have had enough of this federal Labor government and have not had enough of the Queensland Labor government. And on the matter of policy, to answer the Deputy Prime Minister, it's a reasonable uh, thing that he proposition that he put forward to the House. Let me tell the gallery, let me tell the House that I accept absolutely, I accept absolutely the obligation to provide a policy comprehensiveness associated with the next election, to provide portfolio policies, and the Leader of the Opposition accepts that fully and they will be done, to provide a set of campaign initiatives to be properly released when the Prime Minister has the courage to give us an election date, and to provide and in fact build on policies already announced, which even the Deputy Prime Minister conceded has been done with regard to industrial relations. But I must say, here and now, what our policy will not do. It will not divide Australia and increase the gap between rich and poor. It will not add to high levels of unemployment, particularly record levels of youth unemployment, over 47 per cent in the electors uh, Page and Richmond. It will not add to uh, rising inflation. We will not be about record net foreign debt. We will be about giving Australians a fair go, a legitimate job opportunity, and giving Australians a Prime Minister who will unite the nation rather than divide the nation. It is indeed, Mr Speaker, an absolute commitment that at the right time, and now the election is in 1996, we were absolutely right with this strategy, uh, at the right time, and early on in 1996, and those policies will be produced and will be able to be fully examined. And I must say, uh, Mr Speaker, the problem is irritating to the government, very irritating to the government. It is the right strategy because we want the people to have the opportunity in the election year to evaluate those policies, and that we will do. But on the matter of comparisons, which we had from both the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister, we heard a list of names of members who uh, are not here today who were here in the last parliament. Well, can I put two more names down before this House? I happen to remember a certain Brian Cortis. Uh, he's not here in this parliament. He was in the last parliament. What's he been doing since? Collecting $300,000 of the taxpayers' funds, pursuant to a series of job opportunities which are a disgrace when properly examined. And then that was paid for by the government. $300,000, nothing to do with superannuation, nothing to do with retrenchment pay. $300,000 plus has been paid to Brian Cordes, who the people of Hinkler decided to defeat at the last elections as then sitting ALP member, and quite properly replace him with Paul Neville, a National Party member for Hinkler. There's another name I just happen to have. Someone who was here last time, not here now. It's Rob Hulls. Remember him? I think he was a member for Kennedy. And he's been well replaced too by the member for Kennedy, Bob Catter. But guess where he's ended up? I mean, he hasn't left the public purse. He's decided to go down there to Victoria. And he's had over $200,000 of taxpayers' money since the election. With regard, to, uh, with regard to his particular work job at this time, something to do with the Victorian opposition. So I want to say uh, to the House in loud and clear terms that we have reached a stage, a turning point in the life of this government. This government and this Prime Minister may well thumb his uh, finger at the House of Representatives last Thursday and again last Monday, 
This time he's decided to condescend and allow the censure motion to proceed. It is when a Prime Minister thinks himself above the procedures and proceedings of the House of Representatives in a Westminster uh, parliamentary democracy, then that is when the government is going to change. And that's what this Prime Minister has done in the course of this last fortnight, reached the zenith of his arrogance, and that comes before a fall. Because what we have indeed is shades of 1975. Shades of, and I saw Clyde Cameron wandering around the corridors earlier this week, but the division is now spilling out. We have members now attacking the Prime Minister over the matter of the member for Kalgoorlie. We have former Minister Senator Peter Walsh coming out and saying tonight it will be a kangaroo court here in Canberra, which will strip the member for Kalgoorlie of his pre-selection, and that the member for Kalgoorlie, currently a member of the government, should take litigation against his own party, against his own Prime Minister and against the proposal of the Prime Minister with regard to these matters. Well, it is a bitterly divided government. But interestingly enough, who has been left out of the loop on a number of key occasions during the course of these matters? None other than the Deputy Prime Minister. I mean, the Deputy Prime Minister was not told, and it's now publicly on the record, was not even consulted, notwithstanding he's a West Australian, in relation to the uh, stripping of the member for Kalgoorlie of his pre-selection. The Deputy Prime Minister was way out of the loop on that decision, and the Deputy Prime Minister was way out of the loop on another decision, and that was, you might remember, Don Russell, and bringing Don Russell back from Washington uh, to Canberra. And there he was, caught down at the National Press Club. I know nothing about this. I'm out of the loop yet again. It is a government which, after 13 years as a, of hard labour, has now got a record of complacency, of arrogance, of division. It is a government which should now be rejected by the Australian people. It's a government which has created that record net foreign debt, $23 billion. $23 billion. That was what was on the Australian bank card when Keating first got the keys of the Treasury, when John Howard departed the Treasury, a net foreign debt of $23 billion. Today, what is that figure? A net foreign debt of $180 billion a seven-fold increase in the course of the last 13 years. It is a government which has given us that record youth unemployment and record overall unemployment, a record set of interest rates driving them up 20 per cent back there in the early 90s. We warned the government. We put the national interest first. We warned the government repeatedly. We are being driven into recession. And what do we get from the then uh, Treasurer and now Prime Minister? This is the recession we had to have. Forget about the heartache created by the bankruptcies. Forget about the heartache created by the agony conferred by that recession, leading right through to May of this year. And they've tried everything this year. You remember they tried a budget. They tried a Republican statement. They tried this document. Do you remember this document? Shaping of the Nation. It was launched by the Deputy Prime Minister. I mean, National Press Club. They even deferred it a week. Where did it go? It dropped without trace as well, as well it might. But I have another document, this document, and this document says it all in a nutshell. It says, in fact, what the Prime Minister himself said on the 11th of May this year. And occasionally, you, <coughs> Mr Speaker, listen to Brisbane Radio, I know, particularly in busy budget weeks. And it was two days after the budget that the Prime Minister went on Brisbane Radio. And in speaking of small business, he said, this is as good as it gets. It will never get any better. And the heartache that that created for many of the small business operators uh, listening on that occasion and the ripple that put right across the nation was a legitimate reaction of total anger of a Prime Minister so out of touch that he had no idea in relation to what the real situation is at the coalface. And now the Treasurer will follow me and he will uh, dish out statistics and figures here in Canberra, quoting ABS, ABARE and the like. Well, I've got to say there is now a slippage, a gap and a lead time with regard to the official statistics. I don't suggest they're uh, in, in terms of their parameters, they are a correctness as far as they go, but you cannot just rely on those without getting out there and making a fundamental assessment of how things are so different in the standard of living and job opportunity of the 47 per cent of youth unemployed in Grafton, Lismore, Mwilumbar, Coffs Harbour 
versus the youth unemployment right here in Canberra. In the small business closures and shopfront closures in Burke, Balranald, Baduri, Bullia and beyond, and indeed in the suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne, versus what the situation might be here in Canberra. Now it's time we got back to reality, and that is what the approach of the coalition is. So let me just deal then with two other matters related to this area of microeconomic reform. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, we have a situation where we've been told and promised that the government has made great strides. The waterfront, the member for Hume has spelled out just how disastrous and high cost that is. But on the matter of aviation safety, just one little item. I mean, the minister went a whole year without once visiting the then CAA headquarters. The Minister for Transport, the Laurie of Lies, the Minister has in fact allowed a lot of slippage in that portfolio area. Right now, at great expense to the federal taxpayer, a massive inquiry is reaching its culmination, its conclusion, on the matter of the horrific <coughs> Sea View air accident between New South Wales and Newcastle, a flight between Newcastle and Lord Howe Island that in fact crashed into the sea with a huge loss of life. That Sea View inquiry had terms of reference issued by the Minister for Transport on behalf of the government. That inquiry has taken thousands of hours, many witnesses, and is about to reach a final report. That inquiry is denied the right to give a determination of reason with regard to that air crash because the minister wants to cover up. It is a disgrace that he has truncated those terms of reference to prevent a full and comprehensive response on that particular aspect of aviation safety. It is a track record which builds on the mascot uh, saga and the disgraceful transition that we've had to the third runway and all that the Leader of the Opposition has correctly pointed out in that regard. So I want to say to her that the government has failed on the big issues and the government has failed on a lot of the small issues as well. But above all else, it has failed with regard to the accountability of senior ministers on the front bench here in the House of Representatives. And I can do no better than quote Pam Beggs, not a member of the Liberal Party, not a member of the National Party, but a former Labor minister, who earlier this week said with regard to Carmen Lawrence, and I quote, well, was Jim McGuinty motivated by an act of ven vengeance? He supported everything that I said prior to the Royal Commission in the Royal Commission. And so did several other ministers who were present at that cabinet meeting on the 2nd of November. So I mean, if they're going to start saying, if the Prime Minister is saying that there was the motivation, well then he's going to have to examine the motives of a lot of people. And I would say that that would just totally discredit his statements in the House. And I just find it amazing that he should say it. I was motivated by one thing, and one thing only, inter alia, with regard to Carmen Lawrence. And that was to protect somebody who was telling the truth from the malicious and vicious statements that were being put around. It is, uh, questioner, Ross Solly, you are also, though, a close friend of Brian Burke's, weren't you? And listen to the reply of this former Labor minister with regard to Carmen Lawrence. Reply, I quote, I am a close friend of Brian Burke, and I had to go to the Royal Commission into WA Inc. I was never asked to lie for him. And I would never lie for anybody. And that doesn't change the fact I'm a close friend of Brian Burke. I've always also considered myself a friend of Carmen too. And I am not motivated by vengeance. I'm motivated by the truth. History records that Pam Beggs gave evidence that Carmen Lawrence's version of the situation with regard to the Eastern Petition was wrong, was false, was misleading, and seven other former Labor ministers backed up Carmen Lawrence. We now know the Prime Minister knew before the Royal Commission was set up that that was so. That is why the Prime Minister deserves the centre of the House this day, for his reason of failing to stand up for Cabinet uh, standards and sacking the Minister Carmen Lawrence at the outset with regard to her disgraceful conduct. That is why this House should carry this censure motion today. This Prime Minister has had his turn. He's had his time. It's time for a change. It's time to make a difference and get this country back on the rails the sooner the better. The original question was the motion be agreed to, to which the Honourable Prime Minister has moved as an amendment. All words after that be amended with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, if this uh, debate is supposed to be a preview of the election campaign, I must say we're a shoo-in because the opposition has not laid a glove on us. Mr Speaker, this has been the most appalling effort by the opposition to censure a government 
uh, at the end of the uh, parliamentary period, uh, or perhaps the end, and, and to say that, uh, that they are making any headway in this debate would be a travesty uh, of any uh, fair judgment of what has been occurring in the last uh, hour and a half. Mr Speaker, what we have been seeing uh, in the course of this debate is how bereft the opposition is, how totally bereft of any uh, policy, but also how totally bereft even of making uh, legitimate and fundamental criticisms. They simply haven't got the magnitude or the fortitude, the intelligence, whatever, to produce uh, substantive criticism. And of course, to take a motion on the basis of economic failure is itself an evidence of stupidity, because there is no way that they can show that this government has been an economic failure. How can you possibly argue? that a government that's done far better than its predecessor government is an economic failure. How can you possibly argue that a government that's been doing much better than most other comparable countries in the Western world is an economic failure? How can you rationally argue such a point? You obviously can't. You can, it's just rhetoric and nonsense. It's just assertion. There is not a scrap, an element. Of, uh, of substance behind that kind of allegation. And any fair-minded judge would say that that was the case. I can tell you that when I go to international conferences, people say to me, people in my position in other countries, how envious they are of our performance. How envious they are of the fact that we have growth, such growth with low inflation and strong employment growth, and they wished it was occurring in their country. And of course, if you look at the records, the, the figures, there, it's all there for you. You can see that this government has done far better than most other countries in, the, in any period you'd like to go back during the period we've been in office. And certainly it's done far better than its predecessor government. And just bear in mind the facts I gave to the House the other day, that if the growth rate of the previous government had continued, that is, in the time that the now leader of the opposition was Treasurer, five and a quarter years, if that had continued for the next uh, period till now, then we'd have had 50, over $50 billion less of GDP than we have. And that's because we've had much higher growth rates than the John Howard uh, Treasurership could produce. We've had 3.7 per cent per annum against his lousy 2.2. And that's meant we've got a much bigger economy. The size of Western Australia and more has been produced by the difference between our growth rates. And you say that's economic failure, particularly when it's been associated with three times the rate of growth of employment, three times producing an additional 1.3 million jobs over what we would have had had the previous government's employment trend continued. And, which, and of course, without that 1.3 million jobs, what would the unemployment rate be today? 23 per cent. 23 per cent. And it's because this government has uh, produced enormously strong job growth that, despite the fact there's been an increase in the participation rate, we have an unemployment rate around uh, a bit over 8 per cent. That without the increase in the participation rate, without the increase in the participation rate, it would be less than 4 per cent. Well, let me say, let me say we're proud of the 2 million jobs. We're very proud of the 2.3 per cent job growth. We're proud of the 2 million jobs, and it's, it's 1.3 million more jobs than were coming from the performance of the previous government. So we're proud of that, Mr Speaker. And we're also proud of the fact that that growth has been associated with very low inflation, uh, about half the rate of the previous government. Half the rate. And if we'd continue with their inflation rate, which was just on 10 per cent in the period that John Howard was Treasurer, those five and a quarter dreadful years, if we'd done that, then we'd have inflation price levels today 70 per cent higher than they are. 70 per cent. That's an indication of the enormity of the difference between the inflation performance of this government and the inflation performance of the government it replaced. Infinitely better in, in, inflation performance. And of course, even on foreign debt, John Howard presided over enormously rapid growth in foreign debt. 35 per cent per annum was his uh, foreign debt growth rate. And, uh, and if uh, the growth rate of foreign debt had continued like that, then we'd have uh, foreign debt today as a percentage of GDP at 186 per cent of GDP, instead of just under 40 per cent. And yet they say, look at this terrible growth in foreign debt. He presided over a rate far greater than this government, and he produced, uh, if, he, if his uh, performance had continued, this nation would have been a total economic shambles. 
And of course, it's uh, to the credit of this government that those economic trends have not continued, that we've had far better economic performance, and that the nation therefore can look proudly to the rest of the world and say that although, of course, it's not a perfect economy, it's not a perfect world, there are always uh, things that one can do better. But nevertheless, by the standards of the past, it's certainly much better, and particularly when you take account of the enormous restructuring that the previous government never had the guts to start, all the deregulation and microeconomic reform, which has given us great competitiveness, given us growth of manufacturing industry, given us a much more diversified uh, array of exports, given us a, a, a capacity to compete with the rest of the world, to relate to our Asian region economically but also politically, enabled us to get APEC off the ground, enabled us to uh, produce uh, what will eventually be the largest free trade grouping in the world. I mean, these are just enormous economic uh, substantive performances, and to suggest that that is economic failure it just defies any sense of credibility. As the Speaker, if looking more closely just at the last few years, we've had that growth of, uh, over the last uh, 17 quarters, a record performance. There's never been a time since there's been statistics uh, produced in this country for quarterly national accounts when we've had 17 quarters of continuous economic growth. Is that economic failure? How can that possibly be economic failure? It's been 17 per cent growth in 17 quarters, 1 per cent per quarter, 4 per cent per annum, a terrific growth rate by the standards of most Western countries, and a terrific growth rate almost twice what uh, Mr Howe was able to produce when he was Treasurer. And so you've had that good growth associated uh, with low inflation, the underlying rate under 2.5 per cent well, no higher than 2.5 per cent for almost all that time. Even with the national accounts that came out uh, uh, yesterday, we saw that the uh, private uh, consumption deflator, which is often looked at as a guide to inflation, 2.8 per cent after 17 quarters of strong growth. Of course, what we've made a great structural change on inflation. We've broken away from the John Howard uh, legacy of double-digit inflation and double-digit unemployment. We don't have anything remotely resembling that kind of disastrous outcome anymore. What we have is an economy that can grow and produce good jobs with low inflation and can do it quarter after quarter after quarter, year after year after year. And there is every reason to believe it can go on doing it. And if you don't believe me, believe the private sector forecasters. The Economist magazine has a, a table at the back which shows uh, the economic performance as assessed by private sector forecasters for 15 major uh, developed countries. And it says in 1995 that Australia's growth is, is expected to be the third highest of all those 15 countries. And in 1996, next year, it's expected to be the highest of any of those 15 countries. So we are not looking at some doom and gloom future. We're not looking at an economy that's sagging. We're not looking at an economy that's not, being, not able to grow in the future. It's expected by these private sector forecasters, not the government forecasters, that we're going to have growth in, in Australia in 1996, the highest in the Western world. That's, the forecast, that's what the private sector forecasters say. And yet we have a ridiculous motion about economic failure. I mean, it's, it just defies uh, any sense of uh, logic, Mr Speaker. Now, of course, we have an opposition which has been desperate for economic failure. It's been praying every week uh, since uh, we've been in office that, we'd have, they'd have economic, that the country would experience economic failure. And, of course, every time there's good numbers, they feel terribly remorseful. They you know, God, oh, we've got to deal with some more good numbers. And so uh, what they uh, do is sort of find some element uh, to uh, complain about and forecast that it won't last. And they've been forecasting that it won't last year after year, uh, and it's still going on. We've had them, remember, before the last election, we had John Hewson and John Howard both going around the country saying the country was facing a recession. Uh, a depression, a depression, and, uh, and Mr. Speaker, what have we had since the last election? We've had growth in employment of 620,000. Is that a, is that a depression? Is it recession? Is it uh, anything but a good economic outcome? And of course, we've had very strong growth uh, over all that period. And so the, fourth, the the doom and gloom merchants that we hear from the other side have been just totally. Uh, 
uh, shown to be uh, without credibility, Mr Speaker, with all those failed forecasts. And of course, they're really wishful thinking. They just want to see economic failure because they think then they will have a chance of sliding under the wire, will we'll sort of get into office because if there's some, uh, some basis upon which the people can vote against the government. But the people of Australia cannot vote against the government on the basis of economic failure because there has been none. And, Mr Speaker, we see also a complete failure on the part of uh, the opposition to even uh, face up to the facts in areas where they think they've got a, a winner, like youth unemployment. And what they're saying about youth unemployment is 29 out of every 100 Australians, young Australians who wants to get a job can't get one. What they don't say is that the numbers of young unemployed today are far less than they were when Mr Howard was uh, Treasurer. When he went out of office, the number of young people, this actual number of young people looking for full-time work and unemployed, was 158,000, and uh, today it's 95,000. 95,000. About uh, 60,000 less in actual numbers than it was uh, when Mr Howard was Treasurer. And Mr Speaker, what that shows, I think, is uh, just the credible capacity of the opposition to distort uh, uh, the, the reality. I see they have a youth unemployment truck rolling around Canberra. And, of course, it just, has, just portrays this lie to the Australian people. Uh, Mr Speaker, I notice also that the Leader of the Opposition said today that, uh, we ha that, that Australia had the lowest average growth rate over a five-year period since uh, the 1960s and that this was uh, something that the Business Council had, uh, had uh, said today. Well, Mr Speaker, all I can say is that I, I haven't been, seen the Business Council article. What I can say is that over the last four years, that we have four and a quarter years, those 17 quarters, we've had growth of 17 per cent, and in Mr Howard's five and a quarter years as Treasurer, the economy grew by less than 12 per cent. So uh, if you will match our four and a quarter years against his five and a quarter years any time, and it's a far better performance in terms of economic growth. As the Speaker, what we've also seen from the opposition has been a total failure to, uh, to articulate a coherent economic policy, a complete incapacity to say what their policy actually is, certainly a complete in inability to criticise ours effectively, and of course the absurdity of saying they want tighter fiscal policy whilst voting against it all the time, whilst trying to block our measures in the Senate, whilst voting against $11.5 billion worth of fiscal tightening in the Senate and effectively blocking, with the support of the minor parties, $3.5 billion, whilst at the same time going around the country saying we need tighter fiscal policy. I mean, how can you regard any such organisation as having any substance when that's what they do? What they, what they do has no relationship to what they actually say. It is just a, a, a shambles of an opposition. How could anyone possibly think that this could be a group of people that could act effectively in government? You can't trust their word at all. If they believe in tighter fiscal policy, why don't they support it? But they've been voting uh, daily against it in the Senate just all this week and last week. We've seen occasion after occasion when, then, when that has happened. And of course, they are totally incapable of articulating what their own policy is. They said in the headland speech of the Leader of the Opposition that uh, we needed to have uh, tighter public or greater public savings. And of course, that means net public savings. But now he's denying that that's what he really said. And yet the headland speech was supposed to be the great economic policy, the answer to the current account problem. Uh, if anyone asks him about that, he says, go and see my headland speech. The headland speech has on economic policy about one substantive item, and that is uh, to uh, increase public savings and, of course, uh, the Audit Commission, which is where he might get some savings from to pay for the billions of dollars of promises that he's making and uh, without any idea of how he's going to fund them. If he is going to fund them, it would have to be through this Audit Commission. The Audit Commission has been a device used by Liberal governments around Australia, state Liberal governments, to delude the Australian people into, into thinking that uh, they, they can get some nice, easy expenditure cuts. After the Audit Commissions have uh, reported, we have seen very substantial cuts in expenditure, and in Victoria we have seen enormous cuts—300 schools closed uh, by the Kennett government. We have seen the massive withdrawal of, funds, uh, withdrawal of funds by the Victorian government 
on hospitals of 22 per cent in real terms, the whilst this government has been pumping in additional money. Time has expired. The question is, the amendment be agreed to? The Honourable Deputy Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A uh, recent edition of the Bulletin uh, carries a, an interesting article which gives a lie to some of what we've just heard and uh, justifies uh, the very concerns which underline our putting forward this uh, essential motion today, now amended, of course, by the Prime Minister seeking a way around it. But the article uh, says some interesting things, although I can't help noticing as a precursor to that uh, that, uh, that uh, we have a picture here of uh, the Prime Minister. Keating. Keating, it says underneath, watched by an admirer. And the admirer is Keating himself in a, in a poster headed uh, Paul Keating. But the article reads in part, and I quote, underlying Mr Keating's problems is a resurgence of some old economic demons. Having got out of recession and into a period of low inflation before most of the rich world, Australia is now seeing prices rise again. Consumer prices are rising at an annual rate of 5.1 per cent, the highest for five years. Underlying inflation has hit 3.1, breaking the target of 2 to 3 per cent set by, set by the central bank. The latest figures also show unemployment starting to rise again to 8.7 per cent. It goes on to say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, a recent report from the Bureau of Industry Economics, a government body, has also undermined the government's claim that 12 years of deregulation and labour market reform have transformed Australia. Now, we've just heard all of that rerun in this place. We've got it right, they say. And I'll come to an example of that in a moment. We've got it all fixed up under our industrial relations policies. We're doing dramatically better. Yesterday it was better than some other country. I think it was New Zealand. But usually it's better than we've done historically. Now that's always done deliberately. We're coming off a pretty low base. But more importantly for the government, it ignores the far more important, the far more significant uh, criteria or comparison, if you like, that of how we are doing vis-a-vis -vis our competitors abroad. And we are a trading nation. We do have to be efficient. It's not our past performance that we have to match or better. It's the performance of those that compete against us. And the Prime Minister talks endlessly about our role uh, in this new, the largest ever free trade negotiation or uh, scenario ever been negotiated, that he personally, of course, has masterminded, is putting into place, will ensure succeed. And yet the reality is that one of the greatest obstacles to that succeeding will be our domestic competitiveness. If you can't compete at home, what hope have you got competing abroad? And you know, to quote again, to continue from this, uh, the Bureau of Industry Economics body, or a, a, a government body, has undermined the government's claim that 12 years of deregulation and labour market reform have transformed Australia. The report compared Australian energy, transport and related industries with those of foreign competitors. It found that Australia approached the best practice in only two. Only two, Mr Deputy Speaker, and they were uh, road freight and coal handling at ports. Coal handling at ports had nothing to do with your mob, and road freight didn't either. In fact, you've done your best to cripple that sector. In aviation and waterfront, it goes on, waterfront container handling, it has actually become less efficient while the rest of the world has moved ahead. Australia's docks are among the slowest to move containers, which often hang around for more than 40 hours before being shifted. And I heard just the other day from, a, from an export company, uh, Agricultural Exports, high value added, a company that has absolutely given up. It's given up because they are so sick to death of uh, container loads of valuable agricultural product, perishables, being left lying around when they're supposed to get out to Asian destinations, mainly Japan, promptly. They don't get there. Product left lying around in the heat to the point where it becomes unsaleable. They have given up when in reality they have enough product to send a container load a day, a day, 365 a year to Asia. Capacity to earn enormous uh, foreign exchange for a country in desperate need of just that. And Mr Deputy Speaker, let me come to another industry that's hot on, uh, on the agenda today, forestry. Now, forestry is an area where uh, you know, you've got a classic example of failure on the part of the government, who now accuses us of being unable to hold a line and to communicate a line and then to stick with it. The government on this one has been utterly appalling. There is no excuse, and no excuse whatsoever, 
for their incapacity in recent years to do anything other than to pander to whatever opportunism might best present itself as most useful at any given time. Forestry is a vital industry. That was actually acknowledged in here today. And yet how often have we hear, heard the government fail to openly and honestly explain the fact that in this particular case Australia is amongst the most fortunate people in the world. Australians are amongst the most fortunate people in the world. We can have our cake and eat it too. We can have a magnificent conservation reserve system equal to or better than any other in the Western world, any other in the world, at the same time as we can have a sustainable, ecologically sound timber industry employing people, contributing to our economic well-being and offering a great deal of job opportunities for future generations. That message has never got across. Why? Because this is the government that believes in political opportunism. It believes in telling whoever it thinks it might need in terms of votes at the next election, whatever it is that they want to hear so that they can be offered the comfort necessary to get over the line. It never lasts, of course. They never deliver. Consequently, nobody's ever happy, and the government's ended up in an appalling mess, which it now is belatedly trying to address with what I think was its seventh forestry statement today as a precursor to the detail which we supposedly see tomorrow. But what has been the result of this policy inertia? What has it actually done? What has it achieved for this country? This year we will import something like $3 billion in other people's forest and paper products. $3 billion. We'll export less than $1 billion, a deficit of about $2 billion and growing rapidly. It is an appalling outcome. And those, uh, those who often uh, sound so self-righteous on this might stop, might stop and consider might stop and consider where that imported paper and timber product comes from. Might stop and think about Australia's international obligation to ensure that no, it's not just us who are managing our forests properly, but that other people are as well. Now, part of the reason we've got this massive deficit in a, small, in a country like ours with a small population, with a lot of agricultural land where we could be growing plantation timber and value adding and so forth, part of the, 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 the explanation for this scenario, of course, is that uh, we export low-value wood chips. Wood chips are basically low-value. We bring them back. You know, we export them for a couple of hundred dollars a ton. We bring them back in for eighteen or nineteen hundred dollars a ton as paper. What absolute absurdity! What have you done about it? Sat on your hands. You accuse us of failing to deliver a policy line and then stick to it. Where have you been on this? Your record is a disgrace, an absolute disgrace. The frightening thing is that, of course, the projections show quite clearly that unless we do something about this, it will get much worse. Why will it get much worse? No one's going to invest. That's why. There's a couple of billion dollars that we can believe the financial experts in this country on hold in terms of the, the investment in value adding of Australian timber product in this country, because nobody is brave enough in the current climate to go ahead and make it all happen. Now, what happens if that, far, that investment goes somewhere else? What happens if it isn't made here? What happens if, uh, if we don't secure those opportunities for this country? Quite obviously, our deficit continues to grow. The 70,000 people that we've got employed in forestry today continues to shrink. If, on the other hand, we actually do something, even belatedly, even now, about this issue, the opportunities are enormously exciting. A recent report showed that uh, with the right opportunities, including more hardwood plantations, environmentally friendly pulp mills and other value adding, Australia's current uh, nearly $2 billion a year deficit in forest products could be turned into a 413 million surplus within five years and a $6.5 uh, billion annual surplus by the year 2030. What's more, the job opportunities will see employment rise from around 70,000 at the moment to over 200,000. Is there anyone in this House, anyone in this nation, who believes that those opportunities can afford to be missed by this country? Is there anyone? And what has the government done? It is only now that we see some action. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I come to another issue, this, and this is the question of parliamentary standards and respect for this the people's institution. And, you know, a fundamental po uh, point has been highlighted again this week by the Prime Minister's refusal to sack his health minister in the wake of the Marx Royal Commission. And that is that this man, 
has absolutely no regard for the elementary proprieties of our democratic system. He treats the parliament and therefore by extension the Australian people with contempt, with absolute contempt. And his arrogance is nothing short of an insult to the Australian people. That is the bottom line. Not since Gough Whitlam paraded this place have we been saddled with a Prime Minister who so totally thumbs his nose at parliamentary conventions. And you know, the frightening aspect of this is that it is having a very serious effect, a corrosive effect, as a, as a journalist put it in this country recently, out there in the broader Australian community. Because what is happening is that that, that endearing quality of the Australian people to treat, if you like, uh, their leaders and their public institutions with a, with a degree of scepticism is changing. It is now rolling over into a hostile and open cynicism, a corrosive and hostile and open cynicism. And I often talk to school groups, and I never seek to politicise my conversations with them in any way, but I ask them in good faith when I have school kids, stick your paw in the air if, you heard, if you've heard your mums and dads say that they lack faith now in our parliamentary institutions, if they think the politicians make a mess of it and they think behaviour in this place is no good. And you know what invariably happens, Mr Deputy Speaker? The whole lot of them put their hands up. The whole lot of them put their hands up. And they say, put your hands down. How many of you think that we ought to be doing a better job of it? And uh, they almost invariably always put their hands up again. That is a very frightening thing. Not only is it reflecting the fact that the current voters are openly hostile and cynical about what we're doing, it's a clear indication that the next generation will as well, unless we do something about it. And there's no doubt about it that the prime driver in recent years of that hostility and that cynicism and that distrust is the man who currently occupies the lodge. And for that reason, that reason alone is sufficient to mean that those who have governed over there for 13 years must go at the next election. A parliamentary democracy is dependent upon faith and trust between the elected and the electors. And if you go beyond the certain point, if you corrode that relationship excessively, then you bring the whole thing undone. The whole great blessing, if you like, of parliamentary democracy starts to unravel. And I'm delighted to see journalists starting to draw some attention to this in recent days. And I do like that word corrosive. It describes it well. And we are well warned. The Australian people, I believe, will act on that as soon as they're given the opportunity. And that ought to be as soon as possible. But then we, let's just return to this issue of the Marx Royal Commission again. We had a total of 14 people testifying there to the effect that the recollection of the events relating to the table of a petition in the Western Australian Parliament concerning Penny Easton in 1992 by Carmen Lawrence were not accurate, but they were not accurate. And no fewer than eight of those people were former state cabinet ministers in Carmen Lawrence's government. Now that's extraordinary, Mr Deputy Speaker, to be dumped on by eight of your own former cabinet colleagues. The law of averages says there has to be a greater chance that these people are right and that Dr Lawrence is wrong. That's what the commissioner concluded. He found that Dr Lawrence had not told the truth about the extent of her knowledge of the petition before it was tabled. Now, the logical and unequivocal, unavoidable consequences of such a finding, according to all accepted parliamentary standards, should be for Carmen Lawrence to offer her resignation, or if she fails to do so, for the Prime Minister to sack her. But it hasn't happened. Under this administration, such proprieties are simply not respected. Carmen Lawrence did not offer her ex resignation. The Prime Minister did not seek it, and the Prime Minister didn't sack her even though the Western Australian opposition leader, Mr McGinnity, person, Ginty, personally told the Prime Minister six months ago that Dr Lawrence's recollection of events was wrong. We still get no action. We still get no action, even though the Prime Minister knew six months ago that his health minister was not being not accurate being in her reflection of the truth. He knew because he'd been told by Jim McGinty. He knew. Even back then, he should have demanded that she stand down. But no, nothing of the sort. And so this question of standards has now become so important that the Australian people cannot ignore it. This is their house. This is their uh, institution. And here we're seeing this sort of story, the incredible shrinking house. The fact is that the parliament is prevailed over by a man who has so demeaned not only his own position but that of the office 
that he occupies that this country must have a change in order that people's faith can be rebuilt, in order that we can cooperate together as one people under a government designed, uh, concerned and determined to pull them together as one people instead of ruling as this man does whilst he talks about us as one Australians by the old and nasty trick Order. of the Order. The honourable member's time has expired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Minister for Transport and Industrial Relations. Mr Acting Speaker, I'm pleased, to participate, I'm pleased to participate in this debate and the government's censure motion against the Leader of the Opposition. A Leader of the Opposition, I can say, who has diminished by the day this year, diminished almost every day since he became Leader of the Opposition, and who has diminished by the minute during this miserable performance that he's put on today. Mr Speaker, this, this is an Opposition Leader who, in 1995, has set out to disown everything he's ever stood for who has gone back on every commitment he's given the Australian people for 20 years and who thinks he can slink into office by disowning all of his own principles. Mr. Mr. Sp Acting Speaker, it doesn't matter which area you look at. It doesn't matter whether it's industrial relations reform. The industrial relations reform that he held out <coughs> as being the most important single challenge facing modern Australia and facing contemporary politicians. It doesn't matter whether it's the question of Asian immigration or whether it's a question of his views on the monarchy, or whether it's his views on cutting government expenditure, or whether it's his views on slashing Medicare. In each and every one of these areas, we have seen the backflip after backflip. We have seen him back away from every single principle he's ever enunciated over 20-odd years in this parliament. Mr. Speaker, and if there's one fundamental reason why he'll never, why he'll never be the leader of, of Australia, it's the fact that he's shown absolutely that he's not up to the job, not big enough, not, not big enough, not big enough for the job, not able to stand for principle, and not able to mark out a clear ground in Australian politics. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to take part in this debate and to draw attention to the to the deceitful manner in which the leader of the opposition has 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 sought to have Australian workers believe that they will not be any worse off under a Howard government. He, he has set out. He has set out with the able assistance, I might say, of the member for Flinders to pull the wool over the eyes of the Australian electorate in a pretence by borrowing the government's rhetoric about no disadvantage tests that they will not be worse off. And he pretends at every turn that the opposition's no disadvantage test is uh, really a rough equivalent of the government's no disadvantage test, when all the time their no disadvantage test, of course, is not against the existing circumstances of the worker, not against the total award entitlements of the worker, but against an unspecified list of minima being dribbled out by the member for Flinders. The last one dribbled out, I might say, equal pay for work of equal value, something that's been entrenched in the Australian workplace for more than 20 years. And people are now supposed to sit back and say, isn't it wonderful? They've given us this marvellous, generous concession. One of the minima is actually going to be equal pay for work of equal value. But wait for it. When it comes to CRA, when it comes to practice over the last two weeks, what do they propose to do there? No, there's no support for the union movement in their call for equal, equal pay for work of equal value. What they propose to do is to rip order, away— Order. The minister on a point of order. I've been counting the interjections across the table from the member for Flinders. When, I've, when I got up to 25, I wonder if you could protect the minister at the table from order. this, this, this order. sleazy interjection. Order. I thank the honourable minister. That the Mr. minister has the call and the minister Mr. should be heard in Mr. silence. Mr. Let, Mr Speaker, let me say nowhere more so than in the area of industrial relations and transport do you see illustrated in the, in the greatest possible fashion the deception, the absolute deceit of the Leader of the Opposition. And no more so in this area of the no disadvantage test, where day after day the member for Flinders and the leader of the opposition are trying to deceive Australian workers into thinking they'll be protected, when all the time they know that under their policy any worker changing employment will face the contract or not get the job. And that's been the situation at CRA for the past two years. I might say a situation at CRA that's been addressed by the Industrial Relations Commission using powers provided under the Industrial Relations Reform Act, powers of compulsory arbitration to force the parties to the table to see a return to work, to see an end to the national maritime dispute, to see an end to the national coal dispute, and to see already awarded an 18 months backdated 8 per cent pay increase to the workers who have been so badly disadvantaged as a result of the policies promoted by CRA, the sort of policies that the opposition would see the length and breadth of the Australian workforce. 
Mr. Speaker, there's no way that these people can pull the wool over the eyes of the Australian electorate as far as the no disadvantage test is concerned. Because Australian workers love their awards, and rightly so. They know that the fundamental protection of the award system is at the very heart and the very soul of what is necessary for them to have guaranteed security, not only for themselves, but for their wives or husbands, as the case may be, and for their whole families. And this opposition that pretend to talk about the values of the family, what would they do in opposition? Rip away the single most important provision, that is the guaranteed protection of an award safety net to provide absolute protection, protection enforced by the Industrial Relations Commission through the application of a strict no disadvantage test. Mr Speaker, the other thing that the opposition leader should be condemned for is this miserable effort of his of, tr of trying to disguise his absolute intentions in this respect. Because, of course, day after day, he turns up, says one thing, and then immediately backs away from it. He turns up uh, uh, on radio this week and says, to be an effective reformer, you've got to be a practical reformer. You've got to understand the mood and the temper of the community and the temper of our people. Of course, what this is is simply hiding the true intention. It's trying to skate into office on the basis of a blatant, bare-faced lie. That's what it's all about. And, and of course, and, and of course, oh. when you test them in these Order. areas, if, if that comment was attested to an honourable member, it should be withdrawn. Yeah, well, it, I, I, I withdraw it accordingly, Mr. Speaker. We saw it best of all illustrated well, what in. About point of order? I've withdrawn it. Or the honourable member Flynn is on a point of order. Yeah, well, the minister has also accused the leader of the opposition of deceit, and uh, given that we're now now, now that we're upholding now that we're uphol no 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 now that we're upholding standards, Mr. Speaker, then I invite you to also require that. Uh, that allegation to also be withdrawn. Lord, I've, no, I've that's asked, fair enough. No, 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 Lord, no. The, un, the honourable member of the said, I've asked the, the minister to withdraw the word lie, and that is as far as I intend to go at this stage. The honourable Mr. Minister, Speaker, this is the leader. This is the leader of the opposition, who two months after Graham Kirith had announced his second wave of legislation in Western Australia, went out there and said, "Terrific, wonderful, our very template," he said. This will be our model, and we all remember the headlines in the West Australian newspapers. Howard WA is our model, and of course, Order. the honourable mem member for Flinders will withdraw. He knows that he can't get away with that, even by way of interjection. Well, of course, I withdraw. The minister, M Mr. Mr. Speaker, oh, so, this, uh, this, 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 this is the second. This is Order. the second the wave, for which was will cease interjecting. the most reactionary piece of politics in the industrial relations arena ever introduced in the history of this country. A piece of legislation that would have wrecked, wrecked bedlam as far as IR in, in Western Australia was concerned. A piece of legislation that would prevent a worker from having a stop work on the basis of an occupational health and safety issue, exactly. which would outlaw and in its original exactly. form would have seen trade union leaders potentially having their goods and chattels, having their houses confiscated on the basis of, 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 penalties, of penalties provided in the, in the instance of encouraging workers to go on strike. Mr Speaker, and of course it was withdrawn. And the opposition said, oh, we, don't, we didn't endorse the second wave. We never endorsed the second wave. We were only for the first wave. But when you look at the first wave, what have you got? I'll tell you what you've got. You've got to take the contracts or you don't get the job. You've got a miserable minimum of $301 per week in Western Australia. That's the first wave. That's what you've endorsed. And that was a wage, of course, which would have been higher but for the fact that the Western Australian IR Minister Graham Kirith intervened and knocked over the decision of the West Australian Industrial Relations Commission. And of course, what have you got in Western Australia? No, no disadvantage test whatsoever. No, no, safety, That's, net. no safety net. And that, that of course, and that of course is the first wave that they say they're endorsing. The first wave that they're very proud, even today, to say is a very good thing for Western Australia. The first wave that's seen nurses paid five thousand dollars per year less when they change employment. Because they lose all of the protections of the award system. Mr Speaker, let me let me say let me say this. When you turn to the other area of my administration, transport, you see you, you, you see again the bare faced deceit of the Leader of the Opposition. A leader of the opposition who would deceive the electors of Sydney into thinking that they're going to get some relief from aircraft noise, who day after day has said all he wants to do is share the burden. All he wants to do is see the noise spread over a wider area of Sydney, when all the time all he really wants to do is prop up his personal support in Benelong, prop up his own votes to save his own miserable electoral skin. And of course, <coughs> in the process, absolute 
and utter dishonesty as far as his true intentions or the effect of those intentions, because the reality in this area is very, very simple and it's very, very sweet. He is saying, and indeed the Senate committee majority today said, that they would leave it to Air Services Australia to determine what the flight paths in and out of Sydney Airport would be. And I might say that's a big change from what they were saying up until a few days ago, when they were saying one of their first acts in office would be the reopening of the east-west runway. But this week we've seen the Senate committee, the majority committee chaired by the Shadow Minister for Aviation, say we're going to leave it to Air Services Australia. And of course, this is Air Services Australia, who not once, not twice, not thrice, but now four times, have spelled out their view, have spelled it out in the clearest possible terms, spelled it out in their position papers, each and every one of them. The Civil Aviation Authority, um, as far back as the 30th of November in 19, 1994, spelled out uh, again, I might say, uh, on the 3rd uh, of August uh, 1995, spelled out a third time on the 14th of August 1995, and spelled out a fourth time by Mr Bill Pollard, the new Chief Executive. Of, uh, of Air Services Australia, clearly stated that the Air Services Australia organisation believed that parallel runways give capacity and give safety. That's their view, and yet the opposition would seek to pull the wool over the eyes of the electors in Sydney, saying, elect us, and suddenly this noise burden will be lifted. And of course the opposite will be the case, because there's no doubt that if they had their way, the parallel runways, Air Services Australia have made it very clear, would receive more use, not less use. This isn't really a case of reopening the east-west runway. This is a case of takeoffs to the north on the new parallel runway. And of course, that's where Senator Pera had himself well and truly tripped out last Sunday and spent most of this week backing away from. But I've had the, I've had the advantage of asking Mr Bill Pollard of Air Services Australia what he believes would, he, he should do. I said, if you had the choice, and I had him in yesterday, I said, you're now the boss of this outfit. If you had the choice of reopening the east-west runway or takeoffs to the north on runway 34 right, which would you choose? He said, well, undoubtedly. He said, we'd take 34 right, takeoffs to the north, exactly. because that would give us greater capacity and greater safety. safety. Right. If we're going to have any change that's of runway better. configuration, that's what we would do. That would give us 85 takeoffs and landings with optimum safety in each direction, irrespective of the wind. That's right. And of course, that's exactly what the door is left open for by Senator Pera's report brought down in the Senate today. It's not less noise, it's more noise. It's no protection from noise. And yet all the time the opposition say, oh no, trust us. We're just for sharing the noise burden over that's Sydney. Right. You know, um, we're, and of course, what's been, what's been sacrificed on the way through, and this is the fourth point I want to make, the fourth point where the Leader of the Opposition has been absolutely derelict in his duty and has betrayed the interests of Sydney, has betrayed the interests of all Australian citizens, and that is the manner in which he used and abused his Senate numbers only this week to see the airport's bill, the bill to provide for the leasing of the airports, knocked over most viciously and maliciously in the Senate, a $2 billion hit on the budget forward estimates and, at the very same time, the destruction of the chance of a completion of Badgerys Creek Airport in time for the year 2000 Olympics. That's what it means, because we all know the critical path and we all know that we are right hard up against it. And I tell you, I'm like the opposition. I've built a few things in my life. And I, know what it takes to, I know what it takes to build things. I'll tell you what it, I'll tell you what it takes to build. It takes to build things. It needs a darn lot. It needs a darn lot of momentum, and, and it needs some imperatives. And I might say, and I might say, we have had the momentum, because in Badgerys Creek, during the time I've had responsibility for it, we have seen it drawn up from an 1,800-metre taxiway to a 2,900-metre runway. We have seen the provisions made available for the funding of a terminal, of, of a control tower of a general aviation facility, of firefighting facilities. We've seen it taken further and expanded to provide for the future development of a 4,000-metre runway. We've seen some $500 million committed to this purpose, and we've seen almost $500 million committed to building the road infrastructure to link that airport to Badgerys, Badgerys Creek to Sydney Airport. All told, almost a billion dollars worth of momentum that this government has built and built in the course of the last 18 months. And what have we seen? We've seen that destroyed 
by the decision of the opposition to block the airport leasing bills. And what, and what happens when you lose momentum on a great project like this? And when you lose the imperative? And have no doubt, when you have, have no doubt, the momentum and the, and the imperative was to get this thing done in time for the year 2000 Olympics. That has gone. That is destroyed. And in spite of all John Howard's preaching down through the years about microeconomic reform and the absolute essential nature of this development of parallel runways at Kingsford Smith Airport, today that has been thrown into a complete spin and destroyed as a result of those sitting opposite. Order. And if ever there was an example the that shows that they're expired. unfit to government, that is it writ large. The Honourable Member for Flinders. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, uh, Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to uh, support the motion of censure moved by the Leader of the Opposition, uh, which in its first paragraph uh, censures the Prime Minister for his continued economic failure, which has created great uncertainty and burdens for families, individuals, young people, seniors, small businessmen and farmers. And I must say the performance we've just had from the Minister for Industrial Relations, the pathetic performance we've had from this Minister, is in fact one of the reasons that this government is a failure. I mean, he is the minister who, you might remember, was previously in the New South Wales Parliament. He was the minister in charge of the monorail. He was such a disaster as a minister that Barry Unsworth, when he was the Labor Premier of New South Wales, would not have him on his front bench because the people of Sydney knew what a complete and absolute failure he was. He is the minister in federal politics. They switched him out of New South Wales because they knew what a failure he was. They put him into federal politics. In federal politics, he's been the minister responsible for the fiasco at the third runway. He's the minister for ANL, Australian National Line, which is basically run by the unions, which has been one of the greatest loss-making enterprises in the history of the Commonwealth government. He's the minister uh, basically responsible for the system that has allowed Weeper to, 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 to happen, which has been one of the great humiliations for this government particularly when Bob Hawke was brought back by Bill Kelty to uh, solve the, the issue that the Prime Minister himself was unable to solve. The man who was uh, responsible for a lot of that is, of course, none other than the minister who's just spoken. And, of course, he's the same minister who's responsible for the failures of this government on the waterfront. The waterfront in Australia is an absolute disgrace, an absolute disgrace. Mr Deputy Speaker, did you know that today on the Australian waterfront we still have what's known as nick-off time. You know what nick-off time is? Nick-off time means that you are allocated as a wharfie to work certain hours, and yet the union organisers allow for you to take time off, not to turn up at work, in other words, but still to be paid for the time uh, that you're basically at home. In other words, you get paid even though you're not at work. It's called nick-off time. This minister is responsible for that system. Uh, on the Australian waterfront today, we have a system which requires every machine to be operated by at least two people. So if you have a forklift, for example, under the award, under the arrangements with the unions, which is endorsed by this government, you, you need one bloke to run the, drive the, uh, the uh, forklift truck, but under the system there must be another bloke standing side beside him, even though there is no job for that person to do. It is an absolute outrage, and these people are on 75 grand a year on average. This is the minister responsible for waterfront reform, and yet he has the gall to come in here, uh, as he did, and as both the, the treasurer and the minister for finance both started their contributions to this uh, debate and this censure, Mr. Deputy Speaker, by boasting about the government's economic success. The uh, treasurer said that. People overseas looked at Australia and were envious of our growth. That's what he said. I mean, it's just a sick joke, a sick joke. And the Minister for Finance, uh, he uh, more generally boasted about Australia's economic performance. Now, quite frankly, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, this is so obviously and easily contradicted by the evidence uh, that I could spend uh, a lot more time on it. But I just want to go to an independent source just to show you the extent of the problems in Australia. Now, we don't say that nothing has happened in the last 15 years, and I don't mind saying that there have been some things that the government's been do that has done, that it's done by way of economic reform, which has been beneficial. But the real question is, have they done enough? Now, this is a report by McKinsey's, uh, you know, it's the world uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, international 
uh, economic uh, consultants, management consultants. This is a report they've put out today. I'll just read the first uh, few, few uh, first paragraph. It says, the Australian economy has undergone, undergone significant and extensive reform in the last 15 years. Major government-led changes have transformed its financial system, business regulations and industrial relations environment, and reduced trade protection. There's also been much change in business practices and in the relationship between employers, employees and unions. Yet despite these efforts, Australia's relative economic prosperity has not changed since 1970. Its GDP, that's our national production, per capita, is 30 per cent behind the best performing country, the United States. Most of this gap is due to lower labour productivity and the remainder to lower employment per capita. In other words, the difference between us and the United States, which is a far better and far more efficient economy than ours, uh, the difference between us is put down to two things by McKinsey's, the uh, international uh, consultants. One is that we, basically we have a much higher unemployment position, so therefore a lot of our people aren't working, so we're falling behind on that score. And the second is that we have very poor a very poor productivity performance. And the, if you look at it, if you look at it, it's that poor productivity performance across the Australian economy. Uh, yeah, well, this is this. Well, can I just respond to that? I mean, that is the sort of smart aleck comment we have from a minister who basically could not care less that we have 29 or 30 per cent of our young people who are unemployed. Uh, no, that is a fact, minister. I mean, you 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 come from a family with a interest in public service, but you ought to, in your private moments, acknowledge that economic management in the last 13 years has been an absolute Order. failure, an absolute and dismal failure. And if you look at the, you, t you say tell the truth, you look at what some of the things that last minister said, which are patently not true. And let me just demonstrate a couple of them. He said, oh look, under the coalition, you'll face the contract or not get a job. And then he said, but that's been the case for the last two years at Weeper. I mean, what a nonk, what a drongo. I mean, that is the situation oh, under Labor today. I don't think that's that is, that is the position. That is the position under the Labor Party today. That is your law today. I mean, to be attacking the coalition over what is your policy is just incredible. He then says that we will remove protection. Labor gives a guarantee of security. Well, I say to uh, those listening, what does Labor's guarantee of security actually mean? What does it mean for those 28 or 29 per cent of young people who are unemployed? What sort of guarantee do you give them, Minister? I mean, it's a sickening hypocrisy to talk about us reducing people's wages. What has happened in the last 13 years? Well, if you look at the official statistics, average weekly earnings uh, in their totality have actually declined under you people. You go down to the Industrial Relations Commission and you support every wage increase for the last 13 years, and what has happened? What has happened? Those wage gains have been lost through, the, through inflation, principally, and as a result, people are actually worse off under you. So much for your guarantee. I mean, one, if you're lucky enough to have a job, but even if you do have a job, the truth of the matter is people have been falling backwards. And he also said uh, another uh, blatant untruth. He said Western Australia is our template in respect <laughs> to the, uh, the second wave. I mean, that is just a joke. I mean, I don't mind debating these issues, but why not at least sort of debate them on the basis of what has actually been said, Ra rather, rather than just, well, he didn't say. He did. Look, oh, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't respond to your silly interjections, but it, just shows, you, but it just shows you the poverty there is on that side when it comes to you know, some substantial debate. And he also said in respect of he said in respect of Western Australia, he said that Western Australia has no he said that Western Australia has no safety net. Now that is just not true. That is ba that is basically not true. And okay, the interjection is in respect of the minimum wage in, in Western Australia. Well the very interesting thing about the minimum wage in Western Australia is that the Western Australian state Order. minimum wage actually is member higher Pinelli. is actually higher than a, than a number of federal awards operating in Western Australia. And as the Glimmer twin is from Queensland, it is of course also higher than the minimum wage set by the state based arbitral tribunal for the southeastern division of Queensland. Now Mr uh, Deputy Speaker on economic performance alone, 
This government deserves to be censured. And when we get to the next election, it won't be a referendum on our industrial relations policy, as claimed by the Prime Minister the other night. What the next election should be is a referendum on Labor's economic mismanagement. And if people focus on, those, uh, on that very simple basic issue, then there's no doubt what the result will be. They will be thrown out. But they should also be uh, censured, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, on the basis of the Prime Minister's failure to sack the Minister for Human Services and Health. This must be one of the most open and shut cases I've seen of uh, a minister failing to match appropriate standards. And to support my case, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to refer to some of the remarks of Commissioner Marx, uh, who has examined the minister's conduct in the Eastern Affair. Now, let me just uh, go to one aspect of his report, which uh, was in a sense unrelated to the petition, because it I think it gives you an example of the lengths to which the minister herself has gone to, basically to cover up her position and to defend her position. And I refer you to uh, page 60 of the, uh, of the report uh, and paragraph 4.210. It reads as follows. Dr Lawrence even more clearly told an untruth to the press club at Canberra on the 19th of April 1995 when she said that she knew on Wednesday the 4th of November that she would be exonerated in regard to the impressed account. And he quotes from what she said. I clearly want to debunk the claim that I seized on this petition as a way to deflect attention from a police inquiry into my impressed account. The fact is that by the day before the tabling of the petition, I was already aware that the inquiry was completed and that I would be exonerated, and I checked that detail with the lawyer involved yesterday. And that's what she said to the National Press Club. This is what Marx then proceeds to say in the next paragraph. On the day before the tabling of the petition, Dr Lawrence could not have been already aware that she would be exonerated because the decision not to charge her was not made by the police commissioner until the day following the tabling. This is an open and shut case. She made an allegation that she was aware that she would be exonerated by the report, but the report had not been handed down. It is a blatant untruth. Don't worry about the rest of the Eastern matter. This minister is caught absolutely cold just by that set of facts. You don't have to believe anybody on this issue. The facts are there, clear, absolutely uncontradicted. The fact of the matter is, as Commissioner Mark said, watch, and this is the quote, what she said to the press club was untrue. This minister does not tell the truth. Now, even last night, Mr Deputy Speaker, there's this, all this uh, uh, debate about her legal costs. Last night she was uh, uh, in the media saying, oh, look, if she'd known that she might have to foot the bill on some of the legal costs, then she wouldn't have proceeded with it. Now, that's just not true. She knew exactly at the time that she proceeded with her legal claim to try and stop the Commission from you know, inquiring into the truth of her remarks. She knew exactly there was going to be a controversy about it. And there she was, old Madam Innocent, uh, attempting to suggest that when the decision was made to proceed with the legal claim, that she was uh, somehow unaware of the controversy. There were press releases flying back and forward between the opposition and the government the day that that decision was announced and the day after. So for her to say last night, oh, she was an innocent, she didn't realise the controversy, is just plainly untrue. Plainly untrue. I mean, you'd have to come to the conclusion that the minister is a compulsive liar Order. when it comes to uh, these issues. The honourable member will withdraw that. Well, I, dr I draw your attention. Uh, well, no. on the point of order, Mr. Uh, Deputy no, Speaker. No, you on the withdraw point of order. There on is, the point of order. There is no point of well, order. I have I've pressure. directed that you withdraw. Right, well, the... I withdraw. It. I withdraw it, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But I also draw your attention uh, to uh, the previous use of exactly that term against the member for Chisholm, which was not required to be withdrawn. Order. Uh, Order. A, I think the honourable member is about to, uh, to reflect on the chair. Whatever ha may have happened in another context is to be regarded entirely in that context. Let me uh, continue on, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the, the Marx Royal Commission, the, the Marx Royal Commission uh, concluded that the minister had failed to tell the truth. And the really damning thing about the Marx Royal Commission is that it relied on evidence, not from anybody in the Liberal Party, but it relied on evidence from her own people. Now, the minister had the gall to say that she didn't remember any discussions. 
And yet we know there was a meeting of the Labor Party shadow cabinet in Western Australia in which they decided, each and every one of them, to tell the truth about what happened. And the reason that she is under the political pressure she's still under today and why the Prime Minister deserves to be censured is because virtually every last one of them has tes testified against her. And it's no good the Prime Minister blaming the so-called Burke squad. The fact of the matter is that there was no conspiracy. As one of the ministers uh, said in the last day or two, the reason she spoke out is because it was about time the truth was told. Now, in a sense, Mr Deputy Speaker, that's enough to censure the Prime Minister. He has a responsibility beyond his own political interests in the national interest to uphold standards. He has singularly failed to do so. Order. He ought to be censured the by this House today. The Honourable Member's time has expired. The Honourable Minister for Employment, Education and Training. To Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the amendment moved by the Prime Minister and to totally reject the proposition moved by the Leader of the Opposition. It's an opposition, Mr Deputy Speaker, which is bereft of talent. It's prepared to hide the nastiness of its policy prescription, knowing that it's been rejected before. It's pretending today to be different, more compassionate and more capable. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's none of the above. And today's performance in this House, I think, attests adequately to the lack of talent on that side of the parliament. It's also an opposition prepared to resort to deceit, not just in the cover-up of its own policy prescription, Mr Deputy Speaker, of its own hidden agenda, but in also depicting the government's record of achievement. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to concentrate on the area of employment because it seems to be an area that all on that side have alluded to and make this point at the outset. There is no stronger commitment by this government in any policy area than to getting the unemployment rate down. It's a commitment we're pursuing through sustained economic growth, which has seen 621,000 jobs created since the last election. And it's also a, a policy prescription pursued through the massive commitment of, of resources to target this time around in the recovery those groups that otherwise would get left behind, the people for whom the economic recovery would pass over, the long-term unemployed, the long-term youth unemployed. And it's those groups, Mr Speaker, that we have allocated specific attention to, as well as, I might add, ensuring that the skills level of the country is raised, that we're not just employing people but we're training and skilling them at the same time, because we know that the jobs of the future are increasingly going to require levels of skills. And unless we address the skill formation agenda sensibly, our capacity to grow as a nation in any sustained basis is severely, uh, would be severely restricted. Now, on both counts, the economic growth and the resources, this is a government that's delivered, Mr Deputy Speaker. We have just seen yesterday the 17th quarter in a row of economic growth, 51 months of economic growth on the trot, and that's the best record achieved since the war. So in terms of achieving the economic growth, which is producing the job activity, Mr Speaker, that is a record of significant achievement. But on the question of job creation over the term of the government, Let's just look at the uh, figures between 1983 and today. The labour force has grown by close to 30 per cent in that period, and employment has grown 31.3 per cent. It's the fastest labour force growth and the fastest job creator of all OECD countries in that period. Some failure, some failure, Mr Deputy Speaker. And in terms of the performance since the last election. Remember the election commitment we made gave primacy to the creation of 500,000 jobs over the term of this government, a promise that was ridiculed by the opposition, ridiculed by the current leader of the opposition who said it's unachievable and it's an insult to the intelligence of the Australian public that the Labor Party should get up there and promise it. Well, promise it we did and deliver it we did. We passed the target six months ago, Mr Deputy Speaker, and we have produced 621,000, not 500,000, 
621,000 jobs in less than three years. Some failure. In terms of the commitment that the government's made through the Working Nation program, the most significant commitment ever made by a government in terms of resource allocation to lifting the employment and labour force of the country, to lifting the skill base, a commitment of $9 billion over the course of four years, and we're only one year into it, look at what that's achieved. We've seen the unemployment rate fall. It's at 8.7 per cent, but it was at 11.2 per cent. In trend terms, I might add, it's steady at the 8.5 per cent figure. So far as the long-term unemployed are concerned, the people that we said we would re-engage, we wouldn't leave behind, of the 621,000 jobs created, over 100,000 of them have gone to the long-term unemployed. You compare that to the economic period 1983 to 1989, when we also presided over a long growth period in this economy, of the 1.6 million jobs then created, they only picked up 100,000 in the 1.6 million. We've bettered that out of the 621,000 in two years compared to the, five, the six years before. That shows the importance of targeted measures. It demonstrates that by focusing on the real issue and directing resources, we can achieve results. Now, on the question of youth unemployment, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a critical area for activity. And the reason I say that is because when you look at the opposition, they've got no policy in terms of solving youth unemployment. They want to send round first a bus to say it will consult with youth, the coach of Kant, and then they've got a truck that's going around now highlighting the high level of youth unemployment. But as the Treasurer indicated earlier in his uh, address, Mr Speaker, to say that youth unemployment is at 27 per cent is just a nonsense, because what it's saying is that 27 out of every 100 are out of work. Well, the reality is it's not 27 out of, every, out of the 100 of the total of the youth cohort, the total of the youth population, because the vast bulk of them remain in school or in training. It is 27 per cent of those that are not still in school or in training. And the reason it's so high is for the obvious fact that training and education improves a person's employability. If they have dropped out of school, if they're not undertaking training, their chances of getting employment are significantly reduced. They are harder to place, and we acknowledge that. But the simple fact remains that when John Howard left office, there were 158,000 young people unemployed. Today, it is 95,000. It is still far too high, but it is a significant improvement on what we had. Now, I might say yesterday the member for Canberra uh, asked me a question in this House in terms of why we were no longer publishing the quarterly figures in terms of youth unemployment. My response to the House, which said, in essence, that we weren't publishing because of the unreliability of the, of the data, was greeted with some derision by the opposition when I uh, said that in the House yesterday. But maybe they should listen a bit more carefully to what some of their own Liberal colleagues have to say on this point. Senator Tierney, listen to this because I think it's important for you when you go around running the lie again, said this in relation to quarterly unemployment figures in the Senate um, Estimates Committee back in May. These figures, he's talking about the same ones referred to yesterday, come out every month. Do you have any view of the confusion that they're creating? This applies fairly obviously to a small region, he says. The ABS figures tend to bounce around a fair bit because of small samples. He then goes on to say, we have confidence in the ABS figures as quoted for New South Wales, the whole of the state, but ABS's sampling techniques become very inaccurate at lower levels. Unfortunately, some of our parliamentary colleagues tend to quote these figures if they look favourable in a particular month, which tends to be misleading. Hear, hear. We have found, this hidden, the, 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 we have found a Liberal that's prepared to tell the truth. 
but not the member for Canberra yesterday when he sought to exploit that issue yet again. But in terms of the same issue, Mr Speaker, what did the Chief Minister of the ACT, um, Kate Carnell, have to say when the Canberra figures came out on youth unemployment under the same analysis? She called on the Australian Bureau of Statistics to rethink its methodology. Mrs Carnell said it was almost impossible to identify accurate trends because of the data used by the ABS in compiling unemployment levels among the 15 to 19 year olds in the ACT. Another Liberal, but they're hard to find, who is prepared to tell the truth. Now I accept, Mr Speaker, that people on the other side want to use figures and they can still have access to the data and produce whatever figures they want, but they at least should be honest enough to acknowledge the unreliability of the data because of the small samples. And if I just go on to uh, say, because it was a point that I made yesterday, I'm not trying to address this question of youth unemployment from the basis of just looking at the statistics, but I think we do have to put the issue into some perspective. And that's why I've spent some time in terms of the stats. But this government has a huge commitment in terms of addressing youth unemployment as a discrete and targeted measure. We know that training improves a young person's employability. The simple statistics, Mr Speaker, are that you're twice as likely to be unemployed if you haven't got year 12 than if you've got year 12 or better. 84 per cent of people that go through a traineeship are still in employment 12 months after the traineeship. So if those facts are right, what do we need to do to open up traineeships and training options for young people much more effectively? Well, we've done it under Working Nation. We've opened up traineeships in a whole range of industries and areas that hitherto <laughs> didn't have them. Areas such as the environment, areas such as arts and sport and the media, areas such as information technology, areas such as the traditional craft industries of automotive and construction, where we're offering options other than just the apprenticeship. And the fact that we've opened them up, Mr Speaker, has seen a huge jump in the demand for traineeships in this country. So the demand for that type of labour is responding. We are offering new opportunities, new opportunities for our young people. But I'm prepared to go the next step. I'm prepared to say, Yes, it is a legitimate expectation that if young people go through the training, they be entitled to a job. And what we're working on at the moment is making that link, putting together the programs that deliver the training on the one hand and give the job offer at the end. And that's an initiative that was launched recently and I'm looking to expand upon. I believe that we as a community do have an obligation to the young people of this country. We've got to give them new hope confidence that they can pursue a rewarding career with some dignity. The, recent, the report that was tabled uh, earlier this week that projected where the jobs would be in the year 2005 holds great promise for young people, in my view, because it says that the jobs are there—2.1 million of them are capable of being secured over the course of the next 10 years. The real issue is how do we prepare young people to better able to compete for them? Just as we've created the 621,000 jobs over the last two and a half years, the issue is not can we produce the jobs. The issue is how do we get young people into them. And the sort of programs I've been talking about, Mr Deputy Speaker, will achieve it. I believe that it's not just important that we address this uh, uh, position from the point of view of good policy for young people. I also believe it's good family policy because the most important family policy that we can produce as a government is a policy that ensures the children have an opportunity for a rewarding career and a secure future. And that's what this government is setting itself to uh, ensure, Mr Speaker. Now, I just want to go, because I've talked about our record, uh, Mr Speaker, but where does the opposition stand in terms of its policy? They've given up. They have actually said the 5 per cent target, which is our target for getting unemployment down by the year 2000, they have said it is unachievable, just as they said our 500,000 job target was unachievable. Well, we achieved it, 
and we will achieve the 5 per cent as well. But the reality is it's only this government that's prepared to commit itself to a target. The opposition has given up. What's the point of sending a truck round the country talking about the problem of youth unemployment if you've given up in terms of a target? You've also given up in terms of committing the resources, because the only program nominated for cuts by the shadow treasurer when they, if they were to get into office would be the working nation programs. They have not recanted on that commitment. Yet it's these programs that are bringing the long-term unemployed in, creating these new opportunities for youth, looking for the opportunities as a school-to-work pathway. You can't just say you believe in these things unless you're prepared to commit the resources. This is a government, Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, that's not only prepared to set its targets, it's prepared to stand on its track record of achievement and commit itself to going further. And it's a government that's prepared to commit the necessary resources to achieve that objective. We will not be beaten in the race for getting Order. unemployment down. The we Honourable will achieve Minister's our objectives. Time has expired. The Honourable Member for Gippsland. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister for Employment, Education and Training would have us believe that the solution to youth unemployment is a growth rate of 5 per cent. Then why is it that the man sitting directly behind him at this moment, the Treasurer, has conceded after the release of the national accounts figures that we can hope for a 3 to 4 per cent growth rate? A 3 to 4 per cent growth rate, he said, and we're set for his, his exact quote from yesterday on the release of the national accounts was, we are well set for continued growth in that 3 to 4 per cent range. So was Ian Salmon, the President of the Business Council of Australia, wrong when he said this morning, in response to the national account figures and the Treasurer's concession, that the government will not meet its grandiose target, again reiterated by the Minister for Employment today, when Mr Salmon said there's every chance that it will dip below 3 per cent, and of course the difficulty taking the longer term is when it will come back. Mr Deputy Speaker, that means the government will not achieve its target of 5 per cent unemployment by the year 2000. The Treasurer has conceded it. The Minister for Employment, Education and Training has again attempted to hoodwink the parliament that the government is keeping to its 5 per cent growth rate. And indeed, the Treasurer went on to say in regard to yesterday's national account figures that, and I quote, if you can bottom out somewhere around the 3 per cent mark, as we are at the moment, it's a damn good outcome. If that's what we're softened to, who can complain about that?" Unquote. Who can complain about a 3 per cent growth rate? Those unemployed who are depending on the government living up to its boast of a 5 per cent growth rate to achieve that 5 per cent unemployment uh, target by the year 2000. So, it's a fact that the 3 per cent growth rate will mean that unemployment will continue to rise from its present very high level. So the Treasurer asks us who can complain about that 3 per cent growth rate? What about Australia's 787,000 unemployed, 600,000 underemployed and 500,000 hidden unemployed? Aren't they entitled to complain about the failure of the government's economic policy to achieve sustained economic growth? That's exactly who should complain. So the fact that the Minister for Employment, Education and Training could come into the parliament and stick to, its, to his well-worn script of a 5 per cent growth rate as the solution to all of our economic problems, particularly the tragedy of youth unemployment, is exactly the reason why we are censuring the government. We are censuring this government a, for the failure of its economic policies and the economic hardship that, that has befallen so many small businesses, working men and women and uh, farmers, and we're also uh, censuring the government because of the inability of the Prime Minister to uphold the standards required of a Prime Minister of that office. The, the Prime Minister and his government has done nothing, as we cite in our censure grounds, but to deliver false dawns and to a uh, failure to deliver what he and they collectively promise. Mr Deputy Speaker, the performance by the Minister for Education, uh, Employment and Training just summarises what's so uh, corrupt about this government, that once they've got hold of a lie, they will never let it go. They will uh, restate it endlessly. They may redress it, 
But the fact is they will hold firm rather than make any concessions because once a concession is made, then the whole uh, sorry mess will begin to unravel. And, the, and one of the most revealing, if not the most revealing, uh, statements we've heard from members of the government today was from the Prime Minister himself when, towards the end of his uh, address on this censure motion by the opposition, said this. I told my wife, Anita, we've got this one won, this one being the election. We've got this one won. Well, how self-delusionary can you be? Of course, the Prime Minister's got a track record for deluding himself. Remember, he thought he won the last election on the basis of his own personal following and, of for, and on his government's policy. Rather, as we concede on our side of politics, we lost the election. You never won it, and almost every member of the government, with any modicum of common sense and political judgment, knows that to be the truth. They won because they lied and distorted the public policy debate. And yet the Prime Minister to this day will cut off without a second thought anybody he believes wasn't a true believer. And you know how he defines a true believer? Anybody who credits him wholly and solely with winning the last election. Mr Deputy Speaker, we welcome this self-delusionary complex that has enveloped the Prime Minister. He's so out of touch. I mean, how many other members of the government are prepared in this place or outside to corroborate the Prime Minister? Who is going to stand up and say, we've got this one won? Come on, where's your courage? The minister's at the table. Will you say you've got this one won? Are you going to walk away from your Prime Minister? Honourable He's member, very fond of Honourable Member will questions. address his remarks through the chair. Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, the Minister for Communications, Arts and Tourism is very fond of posing questions during question time to the Leader of the Opposition. Now I'm asking him one. Will you corroborate the Prime Minister in that you've got the next election oh, won? Address your remarks through the chair. Mr Deputy Speaker, will the marginal seat holders of uh, Page, Richmond, uh, Macmillan, McHugh and Leichhardt, are they going to say we've got the election won? The moment the Prime Minister said that, it resurrected—you could see it on their faces—resurrected their greatest fears of him, that he, that he is so out of touch, so removed from ordinary Australians and the political process that he will follow blindly the uh, economic destructive policies at present and will, and will believe that he can retain incompetent ministers and untruthful ministers such as the Minister for Health without any political retribution. We're happy for you to believe that. We don't believe we've got the next election won, but we're going to earn the, the votes of the Australian electorate. We don't take them for granted like the Prime Minister. We're not going to conduct a campaign of fear and loathing like the Prime Minister will with uh, the, the, the concert of the uh, trade union movement, as their leaked documents have revealed. I mean, this Prime Minister has stood in this place this week and said, no matter what the Leader of the Opposition says on social security and on health, on industrial relations, don't believe him. Don't believe a single word he says on any of those subject matters. So how in this country is there going to be informed political debate when the Prime Minister sets out from the start to totally debase the exchange of views and the, and the airing of policies for the Australian people to choose on? So Australians must understand who is entirely responsible for the erosion of, of standards and, and principles in public life today. He will not credit the opposition with even the beginning of a public debate, let alone at the conclusion of one. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, you have to ask, if, if the members of the government are so confident, are so sure with their Prime Minister that they've got the next election won, why are they all running as independents? Why have almost all of them but those in safe blue ribbon Labor seats disaffiliated their, themselves on their advertising material from the Australian Labor Party? Will somebody in the government's marginal seat band stand up and produce some material which has some identification with the Labor Party and its titular head, the Prime Minister of Australia, Paul Keating? Of course not. They, they want to distance themselves from the Prime Minister uh, to the greatest extent humanly possible. 
So the, uh, there's no doubt that the Prime Minister is complacent and, and megalomania, megalomaniac description of the result of the next federal election will have sent a, 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 a shiver up the collective spine of the Labor backbench. Mr Deputy Speaker, and that's why, because he's so out of touch, the Prime Minister doesn't recognise the failings of the Minister for Health. Nobody in Australia believes that she has told the truth over the Eastern affair. How can they, when eight of her ministerial colleagues, several of her personally appointed staff, the whole lot of them paid up members of the Labor Party, uh, 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 took a completely opposite point of view to the Minister for Health and her recollection? Now, the Minister for Health's defence, consistently in and outside this place, has been that her recollection has been different to all those other people, but that's fair enough with the passage of time. And the Prime Minister has very lamely repeated this defence at the dispatch box. But you've got to remember that the Minister for Health, three days after the death of Penny Easton, set out that defence in the Western Australian Parliament. Only a few days after the famous cabinet meeting, where she said the Eastern petition was not discussed, she stated in the Western Australian Hansard that it was not discussed. We're not asking her, nor did Justice Marks, two, three years after the event to set out her recollection and compare it to that of her cabinet colleagues and staff. No. Her recollection was set down only six or seven days after that infamous cabinet meeting. So there's no possibility that her recollection was, was dimmed with the passage of time. She was caught out telling an untruth, and yet she remains a senior member of cabinet under the leadership and prime ministership of Paul Keating. So the fact that he wants her to remain there, it, of course, serves the political advantage of the, uh, and purposes of the opposition. The, the longer she remains there, the more angry the Australian electorate becomes and the weaker her contrived and specious attacks on our health policy. But because we adhere to the standards of ministerial responsibility, we want her removed, Mr Deputy Speaker. So the, the, the government is not doing itself any service in a political sense in retaining her. It should remove her so that we can again entrench this concept of political and ministerial responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, of course the government will lash out in all directions to protect her. We had the Prime Minister and again you saw the colour drain from the faces of the Labor benches when he said that it was a Burke squad attack on her that brought her down. Uh, on the one hand it's a Liberal Party conspiracy but on the other hand it's really a Labor Party conspiracy. The Burke squad. Well, which one do we believe? We know very well it was the Labor Party members honestly and genuinely stating the truth as it was that brought her down. She was the instrument of her own destruction, Mr Deputy Speaker. So the Burke squad, of, of which the Deputy Prime Minister is a member, is, there, is it any wonder the Deputy Prime Minister has exploded with rage over the dumping of the member for Kalgoorlie, a good friend? It was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Firstly, he had to sit there in humiliation to hear the Prime Minister accuse, uh, uh, attribute the downfall of Dr Lawrence to the Burke squad, of which he is a paid-up and leading member of. He was the one who gave a reference for a disgraced and, and uh, jailed Brian Burke in court. So, of course, he's a close friend, then and now. That's not the issue of his personal loyalty. The issue is that he's been tagged as a member of the Burke squad, which conspired together within the Labor Party to bring down the Minister for Health. Then, two days later, he is not consulted in, in, the, in the stripping of the member for Kalgoorlie's pre-selection and all of the political consequences that will have for the Deputy Prime Minister's Western Australian division. So, of course, it's been made known that he angrily confronted the Prime Minister, because he knows the Prime Minister thinks so little of him that he did not bother to ring him, any more than Bill Kelty bothered to ring him to consult Paul Keating on Bob Hawke's appointment. So there's a total lack of communication within the Labor Party, 
The Prime Minister doesn't ring the Deputy Prime Minister on the sacking of the member for Kalgoorlie. Bill Kelty, supposedly the Prime Minister's closest friend, uh, certainly in the trade union movement, possibly outside politics, and uh, his key witness at the Kirribilli Agreement, doesn't ring him as he's about to humiliate him with the appointment of Bob Hawke. So what is this? Bob Hawke sort of paying out on Kim Beasley, humiliating him deliberately in the eyes of the party and the press girl in the general public as some sort of weird payback for his own humiliation by Bill Kelty. This Gov Prime Minister is not fit to lead this country. He has brought down the standards of the office of the Prime Minister and, by extension, the, the standards of the elected chamber of the people of Australia, the House of Representatives. We censure the Prime Minister. Order. The Honourable Minister for Communications and the Arts. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, it's uh, always interesting to hear a contribution from the Honourable Member for Gippsland. He is uh, usually a cheery little fellow who sits over there with nice interjections, but you've got to make the comparison between the Honourable Member for Gippsland and the person who he followed into this chamber. Just think back to the people like Peter Nixon and the contribution that Peter Nixon made to this chamber in the old Parliament House. You wouldn't have had Peter Nixon supporting the privatisation of Telstra or the deregulation of Australia Post because of what that would have done to people who live in the bush. You wouldn't have had the National Party of, Ian, you wouldn't have had the National Party of Doug Anthony lying over and letting the Liberal Party tell them that they're going to, national, that they're going to privatise Telstra or they're going to deregulate Australia Post. And you certainly wouldn't have had the member for Gippsland's predecessor, Peter Nixon, tapping the mat and letting the Liberal Party say what they're going to wreak on rural and provincial Australia if they have their way. But it is good to have the member for Gippsland here in this chamber, Mr Speaker. It's probably an alternative to having the boys run the, run the family business. And for that reason alone, we're pleased to have him here. But the point I'd like to make, Mr Speaker, is that this censure motion is, gives us a chance to look at the comparison between the the policies and the achievements of this government versus the alternative which the opposition have tried to put forward in the last three years they've been in opposition. And if you take a quick snapshot, Mr Deputy Speaker, of what's been achieved by the government in the last three years, you can't help but be impressed. Mabo, the first federal government that's been prepared to address an issue that's of national importance to this country. I know it upsets you and the National Party that the government had the, had the courage to address it, but we did, and we've provided more stability for people who want to invest in mining and other development issues, as well as giving Aboriginal Australians their right to proper recognition of native title. We've been able to address the issue of unemployment. Through Working Nation, we've put a, a massive amount of resources into making sure that more Australians have got a chance to get a job, more young Australians are better trained to get a job, and in particular those who have been out of work for the longest get the greatest assistance from the government in getting back into the workforce. We have been able to, through the efforts of the Prime Minister, pull off the Bogor Declaration, pull off a, a free trade area in the Asia-Pacific region that will ensure that Australia, as a country that benefits from free trade, continues to get greater access in markets in the Asia-Pacific region. We have been able to make sure that through Creative Nation we are looking after our cultural industries and we're making sure that Australia remains at the leading edge in the development of new forms of communications technology. Through the, through the reforms in superannuation, we're building up Australia's national savings. We're making sure that more Australians have, a, have enough money behind them on their retirement that they don't have to rely only on the pension. Through the drought relief package, we've made sure that those farmers who were hurt hardest by the drought received assistance from the federal government. We've led the debate on the Republic much to the outrage of a few people on the other side of the House. We've had the telecommunications review, the most important review that's been released this year. And, of course, next week we'll have the Prime Minister releasing the innovation statement. So a whole series of measures, month after month, indicating the government taking forward the policy debate, making sure that Australia is ready for the important issues that are uh, before the country. And the alternative, Mr Speaker, I think was adequately explained in the fr on the front page of The Australian today. The risk of becoming an invisible man was the headline, Mr Speaker. And I quote, John Howard has managed to make himself so small a target for Labor that he runs the risk of becoming invisible to the electorate. And that sums it up, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition, the incredible shrinking man. 
The Leader of the Opposition, the man who says the truth is so important to him, the man who said on the 25th of August 1995, and I quote, we want to assert the very simple principle that truth is absolute, that truth is supreme, truth is never disposable in national political life. The man who says he supports truth, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the man who doesn't want to tell us what his policies are, the man who refuses to outline the policy details of the Liberal and National parties in the lead-up to the next election, the man who refuses to take the Australian people into his confidence. And let me just run through a few of the issues that we, where we don't know what the opposition will, will do. And the first is on Telstra and their bland commitment to privatise Telstra. We had, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition making it clear that, as far as he's concerned, he'll have the foreign telephone companies having a large chunk of Telstra. We've had, we've had Senator Alston, the official spokesman on communications, making it clear that there will be significant foreign telephone companies owning shares in Telstra when they privatise it. Now, the, the, the shadow minister with responsibility for privatisation, she happens to have a different view. She was in the paper a week ago saying that she won't let the foreign telephone companies own any shares in Telstra, even if it means that she gets $10,000 million less for the sale of Telstra. The $10 billion smaller, lower price, the $10 billion lower price because she won't, she won't let the foreign telephone companies have a, a chunk of Telstra. A totally different position to that from the Leader of the Opposition and Senator Alston. But I think what the Australian people have got to ask is, do they want British Telecom to own 49 per cent of Telstra? Do you really want American Telephone and Telegraph to have 49 per cent of Telstra? Do you want France Telecom to have a big chunk of Telstra? Because I can tell you this, if they do, if they privatise Telstra and the foreign telephone companies have got a large chunk of Telstra, I don't want them making decisions about Australia's future telecommunications infrastructure. I certainly don't want them deciding whether or not Telstra will be up in Asia winning business for Australia, making Australia the telecommunications hub for the region. And why would British Telecom let its part-owned subsidiary, Telstra, be up in the region competing with British Telecom for business? That's the important point you've got to ask. And you can certainly say, Mr Speaker, that if they do privatise Telstra, even if the shadow minister at the table has her way and there is no foreign telephone companies owning Telstra today, what stops them owning it in the future? And what stops the new owner of Telstra, once it's privatised, breaking Telstra up and selling off the most profitable bits, selling off the mobile telephony, selling off the international business, leaving nothing but an unprofitable, leaving nothing but the, the loss-making areas in the bush? Because I can tell you this, Mr. Speaker, if you take away the cross subsidies for Telstra, the people in the bush are the ones who'll be hit hardest by the privatisation of Telstra. The people in the bush will be the ones who want to know what, what the Leader of the Opposition means when he says he will privatise Telstra. And we've seen, Mr Speaker, on Australia Post that the Leader of the Opposition has said that he wants to implement the Industry Commission report on Australia Post. He wants to deregulate our postal services. I'll tell you what that means, Mr, Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker. It means 1,300 post offices will close. It means that there will be nine, at least 9,000 jobs lost. And it means that the Opposition, the Liberal Party, is arguing to walk away from the standard letter rate across the country. It means that if someone, if, if, if someone in the gallery sends a letter to some relations in the bush, you'll be, paying, you'll be paying more than the standard letter rate, more than 45 cents to send a letter to the bush. And imagine if you happen to live in the bush and every letter you send to, your, to, to business colleagues or every bill you pay that gets sent to the capital city, you've got to pay the real price for sending that. That's going to cost an absolute fortune. John Howard, when he says he wants to implement the Industry Commission report into, into deregulating Australia Post, is saying that he supports the introduction of what they call the maximum affordable price for postal services. And that means that John Howard thinks, the Leader of the Opposition thinks, that, that once you deregulate Australia Post, they should be charging whatever they think the consumer can afford to pay. Now, it certainly means, Mr Deputy Speaker, we'll no longer have that standard letter rate. We'll no longer have the freeze that we've had from 1992 that's going to stay there until 1997 on that 45 cent standard letter rate, and it's going to mean that all those post offices will close, it's going to mean that the jobs will be lost. Why? Because they're obsessed with this dry, rationalist economic agenda. And the shadow minister at the table is the one who fights hardest for that Thatcherite policy, who believes most strongly in privatising and deregulating. So perhaps the onus is on her to tell us uh, why they believe in implementing that industry commission report. And again, Mr Speaker, if you turn to cross-media ownership, we've had the government uh, state very clearly we stand by the limits on cross-media ownership. 
We had uh, the member for, uh, for McKellar and the Leader of the Opposition in 1991 sign a petition saying that they were against any further increase in media concentration. They were against Mr Packer getting control of the Fairfax Group. And yet, in, uh, in more recent times, we've had the Leader of the Opposition walk away from that commitment in 1991. And when he was asked about this by Ray Martin, he was asked, uh, what about the suggestion that, in fact, you were party to a petition in 1991 that called for tougher rules? This is to the Leader of the Opposition, and he, and he said, well, that was the Opposition's policy at that particular time. John Howard says, I wasn't the leader then, and I wasn't the spokesman on communications. I, I went along as a team player. Now, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, what happened to, to truth? What happened to truth is supreme. Truth, truth is never disposable in national political life. Well, apparently it is disposable on cross-media ownership because the Leader of the Opposition has a very different position today than he had in 1991. And he refuses to answer that very specific question. Do you think someone should be able to own a newspaper and a television station in the same city? He says he'll have a review. He says he'll do anything but give us a clear outline of the opposition's policy. Well, come the next election, Mr Deputy Speaker, we're going to have a very clear choice. A leader that's introduced the reforms with Mabo, Working Nation, Bogor, Creative Nation, the Republic, the Innovation Statement, the Drought Relief Package, superannuation, or a furry ball. The choice is a leader like Paul Keating, a leader like the Prime Minister, or a man who's rolled himself up into a cuddly little furry ball that refuses to tell the Australian people where he stands on these issues. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't think the people of Australia want a furry ball for their Prime Minister. Order the Honourable Member for McCullough. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I look at the motion that was moved by John Howard earlier this afternoon. And the censure against the Prime Minister deals with these topics. The Prime Minister's continued failure to give economic prosperity, that he has created great uncertainty and burdens for families, individuals, young people, seniors, small businessmen and farmers, that the Prime Minister has failed to uphold the standards required of a Prime Minister, that he has failed in his policy to deliver anything but false dawns and that he has continued to fail to deliver what he promised. Now, I rise to speak in this debate because of my concern for my country. I came into politics because I wanted to have a say in what happened to my country. History taught me that there were two groups of people in the world, those who had decisions made for them and those who were part of that decision-making process. And in speaking to this debate, I want to make this point. There is another way. The Prime Minister has followed the philosophy of collectivism, of which socialism is one part, and it doesn't work. It delivers lower standards of living, greater dependency, and less freedom. And our parties are worlds apart. Ours is a party that believes in the freedom of the individual and in the principles of free enterprise and free enterprise are the principles that can offer this country a different set of policies and a different way that leads to the prosperity of all Australians. And that's what this next, next election is going to be about. The principles of free enterprise are as immutable as the laws of gravity. They tell us several things. Firstly, government doesn't have any money of its own. It only has the money that it first takes from the earnings and savings of individuals. And when it gives money away, it has to take it from the earnings and savings of individuals. There is no such thing as government money. It is taxpayers' money. And when the Prime Minister says, this is as good as it's ever going to get, for him personally, that's true. A house of $2.2 million, a very high standard of living for himself and his family. But what about for the ordinary punter? What about for the mums and dads for whom there is no recovery at all? Because that's exactly what's happened in this country. There is no recovery for ordinary folks. Again and again, when you go to open a trade fair or you talk with small business people, and these are the people who survived the recession we had to have and are supposedly in this recovery period, and yet they're struggling to make ends meet and at every turn they find government oppresses them. 
Well, the principles of free enterprise can work for this nation. Because the free principles of free enterprise tell us that the business of government is twofold. It's about providing those things which the private sector cannot or will not provide and providing for those who cannot provide for themselves. And yet here we have in government the man whom we are censuring, the Prime Minister, who seems to be a man hell-bent hell on destroying this country, which he then thinks he can leave and go and live somewhere in Europe. It's either that or we have a Prime Minister who is no longer able to make decisions for the benefit of all Australians, that he is so isolated and so perturbed that you could say he needs help to straighten out his mental condition. His bad language, his failure to follow the rules of decency, his upholding of lies as an acceptable way for parliamentary life, a complete and absolute lack of morality and ethics in government. And I define morality as very simply as this. It is the motive, the intention behind the action. And so when we condemn this government for what it has done, lowered our standard of living, brought uncertainty for thousands of families, failed in policy to give a direction whereby the country can prosper, and failed to deliver on his promises, of which probably the failure to deliver on the tax cuts which were made LAW law is the most cynical of the lot. In this parliament, we hear the Prime Minister rise again and again and in a reckless manner attempts to assert lies as being the truth on the basis that the number of times you repeat it, presumably, makes it stick. I heard the Prime Minister who described the Senate as swill stand the other day and say somehow it was the opposition who had no respect for the institutions of our country, whereas it is the other way round. And it is shown at every turn there is no respect for the institution of parliament, no respect for the, institute, for the conventions that attach to it, whereby resignation is required if a minister is found to have lied, as has happened in this place. But this censure is about fundamentally fundamentally Order. about the failure to deliver economically for the people of Australia. And Order. I think it's time we took a look at some good concrete figures. Let's have a look at some distinctions between Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom. The OECD indicators of living standards, namely the GDP per capita and private consumption per capita, are used to assess Australia's performance relative to that of New Zealand and the United Kingdom. While New Zealand's position in the top GDP per capita countries improved between 1970 and the early 1990s, and Britain's remained unchanged, Australia's position fell by five places, from 12th to 17th. The average increase in OECD countries in GDP per capita in this same period was 505 per cent. Britain and New Zealand both exceeded this average by scoring an increase of 515 per cent and 615 per cent respectively. Australia, on the other hand, managed only 377 per cent. While Australia had a substantially higher living standard in the late 60s relative to the United Kingdom and New Zealand, this comparative advantage has all but disappeared. In 1972, New Zealand's GDP per capita was half that of Australia's. In 1990, it was three quarters. Similarly, Britain's GDP per capita was 76 per cent of that of Australia, but in 1990, it increased to 99 per cent. Australia has scored even worse using the consumption per capita as an indicator of living standards. The OECD average increased in consumption per capita again between 1972 and 1990 was 390 per cent. Britain and New Zealand both exceeded that average, achieving increases of 437 per cent and 740 per cent respectively. Australia, on the other hand, achieved a below average growth of 342 per cent. Furthermore, in 1972, New Zealand's consumption per capita was 49 per cent of that of Australia's, <coughs> while in 1990 the percentage increased to 90 per cent. In 1972, British, British consumption per capita was 82 per cent of that of Australia. In 1990, Britain surpassed Australia 
with a 106 per cent increase. The Australian, very simply, deserve better. It is the philosophical backup of the policies that this government has put in place over the last 13 years that has resulted in this drop in standard of living. It is this uncertainty that has resulted in parts of our society no longer being able to cope at all. We have the highest youth suicide rate in the world, something that must be a shame in this country. Where are the provisions that we have for leadership in this federal parliament, in the government ranks, to set standards and to set, set examples for the way young people should aspire to behave? Is it surprising? Is it surprising? Is it surprising that so many young people lose hope? Is it surprising that so many lose hope, that they don't see that there is any opportunity for them in this land under this government? They don't see that there is a future for them. What a tragedy, what a tragedy it is that we find that somehow those sitting on the other side of the table think that's amusing. Order. As I said, Mr Speaker, in debating this censure, my colleagues have outlined again and again instances of where this government has let the people down. It has dealt with one after another the way in which convention is broken, the way standards are broken, the way in which bluster, toughing it out, seems to have become the order of the day. We've had the supreme example in this very House where we have had on the one hand the Prime Minister say, or the Solicitor General say, first of all, that the only reason that the, the Commonwealth Government, and thereby the taxpayer, could be held uh, responsible for paying the legal bills of Carmen Lawrence was because the Commission, the Royal Commission in Western Australia, was testing whether or not she was fit for public office. You then have the Prime Minister say, that he's going to pay no attention to the findings of that Royal Commission and force through, firstly, in this set of appropriation bills, namely Appropriation Bill No. 4, <coughs> payment of certain of those bills, having acquiesced in the Senate's determination that those parts of the fees which were attributable to Carmen Lawrence's attempt to shut down the Royal Commission should not be paid, but the sheer effrontery of uh, the Minister for Finance saying that he would introduce it again next year to recoup that, ma that money uh, so that all of Carmen Lawrence's bills would be paid by the taxpayer. Compare that with the difficulties that ordinary folks have in getting legal aid. There is virtually in New South Wales, for instance, no money left for civil actions. It's hard to get money for criminal actions. And certainly there's nothing like $800,000 made available. There is also nothing like $5,000 a day being paid for a top silk coming, up, coming right across the continent to present the case. So what we see here is two standards. We see one standard for the government which finds that the only people who prosper under this Labour government are those who lead it. The current Prime Minister when he said it's never going to get any better was quite right for him personally, for him and for his mates. But for the ordinary people, the ordinary people who want to have simply the right to aspire, to have hopes and aspirations, to see their children grow and to again reach their horizons of hope, to see a nation that is proud of the leadership that it gets, those are the things that this country indeed is entitled to. So as I said, I rise to speak in this debate out of concern, concern for my nation, the Australian people and the fact that we have a government that continues to let them down and to stress that if we follow those principles of free enterprise, then we too can return to prosperity and the sort of hope the Australian people are entitled to. Now, the speaker before me, Mr Speaker, 
the Minister for Telecom Telecommunications and the Arts, attempted again to use one of those sets of lies which he intends to repeat. Oh, and I, no. want to lie, I want to set down for the record the guiding principles the guiding principles or if the honourable member was suggesting that the minister lied that comment should be withdrawn well mr speaker i'll put it this way the minister misrepresented my position what? so that is it the, was a total untruth if you the use the word untruth and not the lie then the so honor, be it the honourable member is withdrawing i withdraw the word no, lie the and replace it with the word McCullough. untruth very Order simply the, the commitments that we have Territory. given for the privatisation of Telstra are fourfold. One, it will remain in Australian ownership with mechanisms put in place to ensure that we do not see a repeat performance of what happened with Qantas, where Qantas fell into the hands of foreigners because of the government's failure to put a proper mechanism in place. It will remain in Australian ownership because we want to see it a strong and prosperous country owned not by a minister of the Crown but owned by the people. Two, community service obligations as they exist will continue to exist. There will be no cessation of them. They will be maintained. And all that nonsense that the minister went on about saying that we would do away with them is totally and utterly false. Three, untimed local telephone calls will remain both for individual, that is residential and business consumers. And fourthly, we will not use the proceeds to squander away on recurrent expenditure, as this government has done with all the proceeds of its privatisation, but indeed we will ensure that it is used primarily for the retirement of debt. The debt legacy that order, this government has left to the nation order, the has to be attacked. The member's time has expired. The parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, what a gormless performance. What a gormless performance. The histrionics that have come from the opposition this afternoon, you'd think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we were looking at a session of Hancock's Half Hour. Because the comedy which we've seen come from the opposition is entirely appropriate for that sort of, that sort of show. It's the sort of reporting we'd see on Newsfront. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, what we've heard from the opposition, these, these policy eunuchs on the other side, these people who would seek power without purpose, these people who have no, no idea of what policy really means, these people who follow a leader who slip slides around, backflipping at every turn, he'd, he'd make the gymnastic squad. Of that there'd be no doubt. He'd make it, or at least the highboard diving team. But one thing's for certain, Mr Deputy Speaker, were he to be approved, were he a member of that team, we know what would happen. He'd come down with a flop because that's exactly what he's done this afternoon. We've seen, I think, I think, the beginning of the end for Mr Howard, the Leader of the Opposition, this person who would have us believe that he's a model of integrity, this person who would have us believe that he's a model of honesty, this person who would have us believe that he's a person of such integrity that he would never seek to mislead the Australian community. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, is this not the same person who, prior to the 1983 election, failed to disclose a deficit of $9 billion when he had the information a week before the election? Was this the same person? Is this the same John Howard? Is it? Well, of course it is, Mr Deputy Speaker. And then we've seen, Mr Deputy Speaker, over the years, as we've seen the, th the third incarnation, reincarnation, of, uh, of him as the Leader of the Opposition, what we've seen, Mr Deputy Speaker, is, uh, is the sort of the reclothing, the resuiting of little Johnny, the resuiting of little Johnny, and we've seen him try and move his policy, policy position. But the Australian community aren't going to be fooled by this. Aren't going to be fooled by this. We've heard this afternoon, clearly demonstrated by the, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance and the Treasurer, the Minister for Industrial Relations, the Minister for Communication and the Arts, and the Minister for Employment, Education and Training in their own portfolio areas the sorts of recanting that has taken place by the Leader of the Opposition, the way he's tried to re-suit himself. But the, position which is being, the, the question which is being continually asked from this side of the House and from the Australian community, and which is based on this thing about honesty, integrity 
Is, who is he? What is he? Where is he? What does he stand for? Where is he coming from and where does he want to take us? Well, he has never told us. What we do know is where he's come from. What we do know is how he's trying to reclothe himself, reposition himself, how he's trying to minimise himself as a target. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are a number of very important social issues which this country has addressed over the last few years and could only have been done by a Labor government. Could only have been done by a Labor government. And the most important of those in many respects was the Mabo decision. The Mabo decision. And what do we see when the opposition was confronted with the prospect of debating Mabo in this House, the native title legislation? What do we see the opposition do, Mr Deputy Speaker? What we saw the opposition do is, as they've done on every piece of progressive legislation in this House since 1983, was oppose it. And we know, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, um, when uh, the Prime Minister uh, spoke about uh, spoke about the, native, the importance of the native title legislation in Mabo on the 10th of December 1983, in a, famous, a very famous, a landmark speech in Australian history by the Prime Minister in Redfern, and he said this, by doing away with the bizarre conceit that this continent had no owners prior to the settlement of Europeans, Mabo establishes a fundamental truth and lays, and lays the basis for justice. Never a truer word spoken. Never a truer word spoken. But then we see the opposition. Climbing into bed with Mr Court in Western Australia, going into the I was up at the Senate the night that Mabo legislation was passed. And to see the opposition, to see the opposition voting against the legislation. And then we had the opposition uh, leader in his famous is it wetland speech? I'm not quite sure. It might demonstrate something. Is it a wetland speech? A oh, wasteland speech. Oh wasteland speech. I thought it might have been wetland speech. Because it was because it was, it was certainly full of liquid. It was certainly full of liquid. And what, what do we find out about that particular speech, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that uh, we know that in that area on Aboriginal affairs, he in fact now says he in fact now says that the Mabo decision was correct. Having taken the government through this process, sacrificed the principles of Mabo in the attempt to try and amend the legislation in many respects making sure that Aboriginal people, Indigenous Australians, were confronted by the prospect of a political divide because of their shameless behaviour. Their shameless behaviour. He now says they accept the Mabo decision. Now, what sort of contortion in terms of policy are we supposed to perceive from that? What sort of contortion in terms of his political activity are we supposed to perceive from that, Mr Deputy Speaker? And then we have him say, Mr Deputy Speaker, of course, and these are the most important words in terms of this, this so-called headland speech, was this rider on the acceptance of Mabo. However, we reserve the right to amend the Act to ensure its effective operation. What does that mean, Mr Deputy Speaker? What is that code for? That's code for slipping into the legislation. That's code for slipping into every Aboriginal organisation in Australia who supports Mabo. That's code for saying to those people who Mr, uh, Mr Howard describes in this wetland speech in this, the following way, the whole Aboriginal policy area has been hijacked by the social engineers, the politically correct and other sundry groups more intent on dividing and uniting our community. Are you kidding? Is he kidding? Who is he trying to fool? Who is he trying to fool? The only people who have sought division on this issue in the Australian community have been the opposition, led by the Leader of the Opposition led by the Leader of the Opposition, and now seeks to reclothe himself and recant. And then, of course, there's the question of immigration policy. Immigration policy. Well, haven't we got a doozy here? Haven't we got a doozy here? We have, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, this government is very proud of its immigration policy, and it, and it should be proud of its immigration policy. It should be proud of its policy of multiculturalism. It ought to be proud of them. The nation's proud of them, but not the opposition. Not the opposition. And what did the Leader of the Opposition say in 1988? Let me tell you what he said in 1988 about immigration, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In relation, of course, you remember it's about Asian immigration. Remember? I'm sure you do. You don't want to remember. You don't want to listen to it, but you'll remember. He says, "It will be our immediate terms interest." And I quote this from the 2nd of August, Australian newspaper, 1988. It will be in our immediate terms, term interest, and supportive of social cohesion if it, Asian immigration, was slowed down a little so that the capacity of the community to absorb it were great. Later on, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the 11th of August 1988, he says this uh, in a news release. He says this, I stand by my comments of the past two weeks on immigration and ethnic affairs. He stood by them. 
I will not modify views. I will not modify views. Very strong words. I will not modify views designed to put the national interest, designed to put the national interest and national unity, national unity at the forefront of decisions on immigration and related matters. That's him. He then goes to say, and understand, these words are very important. They say a lot. The views I have expressed have been carefully formulated and progressively articulated in various forums around Australia over the past six months. They weren't something off the top of the head. They weren't something he made up at the spur of the moment. These were things he thought about. These were well-considered ideas. These were well-considered opinions. He was saying to the Australian community, I want to change immigration policy. I don't like the fact that we've got Asian immigration. What did he say this year? What did he say this year? What did he say this year? Well, I'll tell you what he said, Mr Deputy Speaker. He may came out and tried to recant. And there's a very interesting article, an extremely interesting article, uh, in which is, I'll just, I'll just say what he said this year. The concerns that I expressed at that time, seven years ago, were in the context of the emphasis that I, was, I always believe we ought to put on the things that unite us as Australians rather than the things that divide us. That's what he said. But these were well-considered views. These were views that he was expressing for some months. They didn't come off the top of the head, and then he's trying to recant. And what did the community think about that? Well, there's a very interesting article in a magazine called Chamber News, the Western Australian Chinese Chamber of Commerce. There's an editorial comment which, is said, which says this. In 1988, I quote, Mr Deputy Speaker, in 1988 he managed to divide Australians with his remark that Australian immigration had, no, had to be slowed or else the country would face dire social consequences. Seven years is an extremely long time in politics and one would think that people have forgotten those comments. His re-election as opposition leader changed all that. His, his infamous consensus comments came back to haunt him, to the extent for much of his travels around the country at the time our article on page five was prepared. He had, he had to qualify his remarks many times. Quote, continuing the quote, his own silence in the preceding years about what he really meant when he mouthed these words haven't helped to improve his credibility, especially Australia, among Australia's Asian population. That's the fact of the matter. Because what we've seen from this man over the last few months is an attempt to try and beguile the Australian community, to try and reclothe himself. And really is the big bad wolf. Come into the bedroom, son. Come into the bedroom. Have a look at me. Aren't I nice? Aren't I terrific? Aren't I terrific? But it really isn't. He isn't at all. Because we're not fooled. He's a person without substance. He's a person who talks about standards and he has none. He's a person who talks about honesty and he's dishonest. He's a person who talks about having policy input and he has none. The fact of the matter is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this motion this afternoon puts it very squarely on the table where the opposition stands. It shows they are without substance. It shows they are without policy. It shows they are without integrity. It shows they are out without leadership, and the opposition leader should be condemned for his position. Order. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The honourable member for Wills. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I just think it's very, very difficult to decide which way to go on this particular censure motion. If I understand the Leader of the Opposition correctly, the Prime Minister is the closest thing to a baby eater, a megalomaniac who basks in his own glory and tolerates appalling standards amongst his ministers. He's a bloke not fit for office and not a, not, should never be allowed to lead this country. Just by coincidence, everyone on the Prime Minister's side rejects that uh, view of the Prime Minister. So it just happens to line up that particular way. Quirk of fate, isn't it? Now the PM, for his part, reckons that the bloke on the other side is nothing but a queen-loving lickspittle, a little Tory from out of Sydney. Well, that's what he does say, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I mean, I can't say as I agree with him necessarily. Now, how anyone could take this censure motion seriously is beyond me. You'd have to be almost brain dead to believe that this is a serious debate. Anyone who believes that the Marks Royal Commission was set up with honest intentions has got to be kidding. It doesn't matter whether the Commission is a good bloke, an ex-communist and followed particular procedures to the letter. Even if he did all of that, it still wouldn't prove that the Marx Commission was a decent political activity, because it wasn't. It was a witch hunt. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And it was set up for political reasons. It was set up as a political payback. And the, fact, the, the idea that people could come into this House day in, day out and argue, in fact, that that Royal Commission was set up to actually search for some kind of information that would be relevant to the Australian public absolutely astounds me. No one out in punter land actually believes that, except a few turkeys—well, they don't even believe it in here, they just claim they believe it. 
What is really more to the point, and I said this the other day, why did John Haldon take that disreputable petition into the House? And why haven't members in this House actually said that that sort of practice is disreputable and shouldn't be used by politicians? When the, when, when the member for Kennedy got up and made accusations about the former Senator Richardson, the people on the Labor side jumped to their feet to condemn him for it, the same when another member made accusations about public servants. But, so there was a concern then about the propriety of parliament. But when it came to the other issue, when it came to the Heldon petition, no one wanted to talk about it. My learned friend, the member for Melbourne Ports, will want to tell you that it's compulsory. It's an obligation to, to lodge petitions. Well, I'd put it to you this way. If it's an obligation to lodge the petition, and of course the clerk in this parliament or this parliament, the advice from this parliament is that the, uh, the state ruling or the state rules, the parliamentary rules in West Australia are silent on the matter, but that's something for another time. But the question is, if, if it is compulsory, then why wouldn't a person disassociate himself from a petition of that kind? So I reckon there was something, something stunk in West Australia, there's no doubt about that. But asking the minister to resign after, to resign after a political witch hunt, one side doing that, when, when I know what would happen, if the coalition was sitting on the other side, they would be defending the minister to the back teeth. They would be defending her every single day and they'd pull out every sanctimonious line to do it. Well, I know what you'd be doing. I know you wouldn't be over there condemning your minister. You'd be standing publicly saying it was a witch hunt. Now, when it comes to the crunch, what separates the Labor Party from the Liberal Party is nothing like what the myth makers would have us believe. The facts are both parties gloat about cutting government expenditure. Both are addicted to privatisation and both accept deregulation of the labour market and both accept foreign ownership of Australian industry. So when it comes to the crunch, what does separate the two sides of this House? Well, some of the social issues separate them. On Mabo, of course, you find that the coalition is reactionary. On the Republic, you find that the, the, the coalition can't embrace it, can't understand that it's going to be a fact of life and want to run around making out their monarchists and they love queens. Well, so be it. Now, but assurances by the Minister for Communication that he is an economic nationalist and that he would not let Telstra be taken over by foreign interests are laughable. The idea that, that, that the Member for Communications would, would actually not let Telstra be taken over, not, not let it be privatised, then would stop it being taken over by foreign interests. What an absolute giggle that is. When you look at all of the private, look at all the assets that this government has sold, one after the other. Each time the barrier is lowered, each step we find another explanation for selling off another public utility. And I just can't believe the minister, the fact that he could come in and with a straight face tell us that he is opposed to privatisation. He wouldn't let a foreign company own Telstra. Well, the bloke who runs Telstra at the moment is an American and his name's Rupert Murdoch. And he hasn't had to buy it, he's just been given it. No wonder they haven't sold it. And down in Victoria, one public utility after another is being acquired by foreign interests, and the Prime Minister doesn't say boo. Not one single word out of the Prime Minister about the selling off of public utilities down in Victoria. It is an absolute disgrace. I cannot believe that it goes on and the Prime Minister comes into the House and talks about being a Republican and does absolutely nothing about it. When I put the question to him about electricity to France and its, its bidding for United Energy, he said, oh, that's a matter for the Victorians. He wasn't there to protect us down in Victoria. He wasn't going to use Foreign Investment Review Board powers to uh, put the jackboot into a, foreign, into a French nuclear company, if you don't mind, a French nuclear company bidding for a united energy in Victoria at the same time as the French were letting off atomic bombs in the Pacific. Unbelievable. I'd like to see some of these Labor members actually defend the sale of these public assets. Well, they do. I know how they defend it. They say, oh, look, that's different. Uh, we can't control that. The other, the other issues, the, the uh, Commonwealth Bank, oh, it's got no role anymore. But I tell you what, if public utilities, if gas, elect electricity and water were in the hands of the federal government, they would be sold. There is no question about it. Now, a real Republican, as I said, would definitely protect Australian industry. 
but we won't see Australian industry protected, and more of our industry is being sold off day by day. But if you talk about Australian industry being sold off, they, they suggest that you're some old-fashioned cad that you've got no idea about global economics. Now, the Minister for Industrial Relations points to the opposition and says that the use of contract labour, as per the CRA dispute, is what will become law under a coalition government, or a co if the coalition becomes the government. He, he is probably right. The problem is it's already law under the Labor Party. The battlers, the battlers have been sold out. The, the enterprise bargain policy adopted by the Federal Labor Party threatens trade unionism. It threatens it as a concept, as a symbol, and in practice, as we have seen in CRA, it drives workers into small groups where they are in danger of being toppled by employers. And how do we know this? Those historians in the Labor Party need only look back to the 1890 strikes to see what happened in those times, to see the use of common law to destroy trade unions. And what was the trade union response? Apart from the fact that it made a big mistake and said we'll organise a Labor Party to protect our interests, which it could never do because the Labor Party from the time of its inception was a revisionist or reformist party, what it said was we've got to go for big, strong unions, one big unions, and out of that developed the IWW and the like. And those blokes, and well, because there weren't a lot of women amongst them, but they understood that in unity was strength, but it had to be a broad-based organisation, trade unionism. What the, pro what the present Labor Party has done is drive workers into small organisations where, as we have seen in CRA, they are threatened. Now, members can tell us that this agreement is a victory for workers. All this agreement says is that workers have the right to collectively bargain. Now, put it to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, if there are 10 members in a, in a factory or on the factory floor where there are 100 members all told and 90 of them are on contracts, it wouldn't matter how often you organise to collectively bargain. Eventually your members will be gone and they'll be driven into private contracts. And that's exactly what CRA are doing. CRA are doing the bidding for the modern form of industrial relations a modern industrial relations that has been orchestrated by the Minister for Industrial Relations, one that's accepted by this side of the House, no question about that. Now, the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, that is really a study in sophistication when it comes to providing work for the heartlands where people are massively unemployed. What the Minister for Employment, Education and Training would have us believe is that all you need to do is train unemployed workers. So you reskill them and you will get them into jobs. The assumption with that thesis or that proposition is that per people, workers are out of work because they're not skilled. Now, just because the, the, there's a correlation between lack of skill and unemployment does not prove that the reason you are out of work is because you are unskilled. The facts are people are out of work because there aren't the jobs to provide for them. And you can skill well them. Look, the, per, the, mem, the minister or the, sorry, the parliamentary secretary there can talk about skilling and say that this will provide the way forward and this will put workers back into work or unemployed workers back into work. But the facts are it's not happening. And the minister never talks about the number of part-time jobs that are caught up in this job growth. And does anyone ever thought jobs have to grow? As your population increases, it's inevitable that jobs grow. What you need to do is study the nature of the jobs. Where are the jobs coming from? Why can't the minister tell us the kind of jobs that we should be looking for in the future? Why can't a minister, an industry minister, tell us about the kind of industries that we should be developing in the future so that we could then make training real? Or are we talking about a kind of training that's based around some service industry, a point I've taken up before? Are we saying that the future lies in working in uh, hotels up in the north of, north of Australia, in Queensland, for example. We're going to work on hotels and we're going to change beds and bedpans, and that will and give us a bit of work. That's, are they the sorts of jobs we're talking about, or are we talking about real jobs? And If they are real jobs, let's start identifying them. And better than that, let's start doing something about it out in the northern, northern and western suburbs, the heartlands where people are massively unemployed. And it's quite interesting too, the Minister for uh, Employment, Education and Training crows about the training programs, but he didn't mention that he took $1.2 billion out of the last budget, uh, out of Working Nation, but oh, I don't know how much he's tucked back into it. 
we really need uh, a more interventionist approach to the problem of unemployment. And I thought it was kind of amusing, in a, in a sense, that uh, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Con Shacker, raised the idea of using super funds, directing super funds into local investment, and all the opposition could do was laugh about the proposal. Now I thought that, that is just bizarre because what is wrong with trying encouraging the super funds to put the money back into Australia rather than following global trends and send the money offshore to make interest for the, those people who have their money invested in the super funds? What is wrong with encouraging a bit of economic nationalism? What is wrong with asking that money be invested into the future of our children and, and sorting out those suburbs and those municipalities out in the north and west of Melbourne and elsewhere where the true believers live but are being jettisoned by the Labor Party? Really odd that the coalition should laugh about that policy because it is just plain common good sense. So, as far as, the, as far as this censure motion, there is no way known I could bother to vote. It is just a joke. And people ask you about voting in this parliament, and my good friend up there, the member for Werriwa, trotted out a leaflet one time saying, oh, clear he doesn't vote on every division. Of course I don't vote on every division, because so many of them are just absolutely ridiculous. What we've done today is we have wasted hours and hours and hours of the parliament's time. It would be better to have a serious discussion about some of the real issues rather than continue to make myths about the differences between the two parties. Because in reality, as most people outside know, the difference between the parties is marginal. And what we will see is a growth of third party support out in the community. And I'm not saying that just because I happen to be an independent. The facts seem to support that. The party system is definitely fracturing. And it's fracturing partly because the, the Labor Party has moved to the right. The drift of the Labor Party to the right cannot be uh, explained away by any member. The right wing can come in and try to defend it, but they certainly know that the modern Labor Party is a party of the right, that it is a party of privatisation, that it is a party of deregulation, and that all the guff that the Prime Minister trots out about him being the great progressive in Australia is just that, just guff. If you want to be a fair income Republican, then go and do something about economic and cultural sovereignty. And I've got to laugh when the Minister for Communications talks about culture. That Hollywood showbiz mausoleum we're going to build up there in the showgrounds will not be good for Australian culture. We know what it will be. It will be another Murdoch enterprise about pay television, a television system we don't need and one that won't, construct, won't develop a real cultural assessment or an art form that actually assesses and refines and develops and illustrates Australian culture. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, we get this censure motion today, the day after we've had 17 quarters of economic growth, the day after the opposition did not ask one question of the Deputy Prime Minister about the uh, current account, uh, did not ask one question about the quarterly accounts. Uh, the day after, we have seen the economy continue to grow at uh, very substantial levels, and we get this uh, censure motion coming up on the third or fourth occasion when the opposition has had a deliberate tactic over the last couple of weeks of trying to disrupt the parliament as much as possible, of trying to take action to ensure question time is truncated on each and every day to avoid the accountability that they say is so important and is then the subject of this censure. What a lot of nonsense from the opposition that that's been allowed to be the tactic that's to be followed. And today they had the, the chance to have question time, deal with all the key issues on the economy that they say are the subject of this censure as far as continued economic failure is concerned and the other issues they raise there and all the matters about standards and uh, false dawns and so on. But what do we get? No, we don't get that. We get this uh, trumped up censure motion and then we get the sort of very low, poor performances we've had throughout uh, from the various opposition speakers that have contributed to the debate. And this comes at a time when what has been really going on is a real questioning start, starting to occur about what the opposition might or might not stand for. We get uh, headlines in the editorial in yesterday's Financial Review, how ducks hard issues. We get headlines in today's Australian <coughs> result of a news poll, a canvassing of people across Australia saying that they how to risk becoming invisible man. So, what we should be getting from the opposition on this last question time or this last day of proceedings of a major consequence in the parliament for the year is a real attempt to enunciate something they might stand for. 
What do they stand for on industrial relations? Now, we really do know what the opposition stands for on industrial relations because John Howard has said in the past, he said in the past, I've been here 25 years, I've been here 25 years, my jobs back program, it was the right course on industrial relations. I'm not going to change from that. But as soon as there is a bit of strife because of what's happened in Victoria, or as soon as there's a bit of strife because of what's happened in WA, John Howard says, well, I don't really stand for any of those things. That's not really my industrial relations policy. Trust me, trust me, we won't really do that. We'll go back to what happened in 1990. Remember before the 1990 election, Andrew Peacock taking the view, best to not stand for anything. What did they describe him as then? The puff of smoke. That was Andrew Peacock before the 1990 election. And so that didn't work. Andrew Peacock's approach didn't work. So then they had to have the, the manifesto fight back. That didn't work. The people wouldn't buy that. So now they go back to invisible man, uh, puff of smoke type approach to uh, these issues. And if we come to other key areas, 17 quarters of growth. The fact of the matter is, throughout the last three years, the opposition has been predicting there'd be another recession. It's a double dip, they kept saying. There'd be a run on the dollar. The government couldn't manage the economy. There wouldn't be a budget surplus. All of those sorts of things. Prove wrong every single time. That's been the opposition's track record as far as economic approach is concerned. You contrast that with the fact that the government made a commitment before the last election to create 500,000 new jobs in this term. What was the response from the opposition, the then industrial relations spokesman for the opposition, the now leader of the opposition? Unachievable. Couldn't be done. Well, of course, what we have achieved is 620,000 jobs in those three years, along with those 51 uh, months of strong economic growth. And then we move on to other key areas. Let's take uh, national savings. The opposition constantly berated our approach to savings. Amongst other things, when we introduced the superannuation arrangements in 1991, uh, John Howard said legislation to increase employer contribution to superannuation would be nothing short of parliamentary confiscation of the assets of employers. And we've got a whole litany of quotes of the same type of approach uh, attacking the government's superannuation arrangements, attacking that uh, strong development of a national saving strategy through superannuation, which already has achieved $200 billion of superannuation assets, and with that figure to grow massively over the next few years as a result of the measures the government introduced in the budget this year. And the opposition has gone month after month, piece of legislation after legislation, attacking that superannuation arrangement uh, as being one that was unfair, unworkable, totally uh, undesirable as far as Australia is concerned. And as, indeed, as recently as the September and October this year, we had various speakers uh, from the opposition, including the shadow minister for superannuation matters. He's now been silenced on these issues publicly. Indeed, he's got the flick altogether for that great person of integrity that's going to presumably seek to take his place in the seat of uh, Bradfield, uh, Brendan Nelson. All of those uh, strong credentials he's got uh, to represent uh, people because of the whole basis of truth and integrity and all the other, th other things the censure motion talks about. Well, as recently as last month, Members of the opposition were saying our superannuation policy uh, was uh, unfair, unworkable, etc. One of the people I note on the speaker's list as to follow is the member for Ringer. Now He said, as recently as the 25th of September, compulsory superannuation is one of the biggest con jobs ever foisted on the Australian people. That was the 25th of September that that was, um, statement was made. Now, the members to speak later. I think maybe he got caught up in one of those uh, cables or wires or towers that he's talked a bit about in making that statement because less than two months later, what did the deputy leader of the opposition do when he went and spoke at the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia National Conference? He said, we're going to adopt Labor superannuation policy. That's what he said. We'll adopt Labor's policy, the one that was the great con less than six weeks earlier. Well, of course, what we know about the opposition is they will say anything. They will say anything and do anything to try and make out that they, all the things they stood for over the last four or five years, they no longer believe. That's what they'd like us to believe. And this censure motion is really about trying to cover up, trying to cover up that fact that the opposition's approach is to try and do anything to avoid actually being exposed for this sort of hypocrisy that's associated with today's censure motion. And it is a great load of humbug, this particular censure motion, because rather than Rather than try and take steps to say 
in this last uh, few days of this session of the parliament, well, the opposition does really stand for things. They really, duly, re really do have some substance to their whole approach to seeking to be the next government of Australia. What do we get? This sort of cant and hypocrisy that's been uh, pursued in this censure motion today. And the facts of the matter are, if you look at all of the key areas on industrial relations, the government has a policy that has delivered strong productivity growth for Australia, strong employment growth for Australia, and has helped to deliver both the reform but also the sense of fairness and the sense of uh, decency that industrial relations should deliver. When you come to the area of our international approach, the government has been able to deliver on the big picture, that massive uh, reform that the APEC process delivered in Osaka last week, and which is a great credit to this government, to the Prime Minister and to the Foreign Minister. And it's easy to say, oh, well, the opposition it would do this or that in relation to those areas. We come to this speaker's notes document the opposition's put round, and they have sort of said in the area, well, APEC. That's maybe something, but they'd do things, they'd do things altogether differently. The shadow trade minister, he'd be able to map out a major course of action such as uh, APEC, but he'd also have all sorts of bilateral arrangements that would achieve far more. What a lot of nonsense. You compare the front bench of the opposition to the front bench of the government in areas like trade, foreign policy, uh, treasury, communications, etc., and look at what their policies are in those areas and you have absolutely worthless propositions that have come forward, absolutely zero substance coming forward, and the people of Australia, as today's news poll, are waking up to the fact. John Howard might have stood for something. Twenty years ago, he might have stood for something. What does he stand for now? Trying to do anything he can to ensure that the people of Bennelong uh, somehow are conned, as far as Sydney Airport is concerned, to suggest that he was something different. Uh, ten years ago, that he didn't really support the third runway at all. When everybody there knows that his whole approach to those issues, his whole approach has been to, yes, he did support the third runway, yes, he didn't uh, express any great concern at all about what the impacts might be of residents of the Bennelong electorate or surrounding parts of Sydney. And you can't remake, you can't reshape this censure motion. The amendment that the government has moved is a demonstration to all that the opposition hasn't remade itself, they haven't reshaped itself, they deserve the strongest possible censure for their inability to deliver alternative policies of any worth or value to the people of Australia. And this censure motion that they launched today was a clear manifestation of the fact that they don't have the credentials to govern Australia and the people of Australia should judge them accordingly, as this House will, in moving <coughs> This uh, amendment to the censure moved by the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Order the Honourable Member for Wakefield. Well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Member for Parramatta knows much better than he does. The Member for Parramatta comes into this House and suggests that the Opposition has in some way been unwise because it has traded question time for this opportunity to move a censure motion. Traded question time? for a censure motion that the Prime Minister refused to take on two other occasions, traded question time when day in and day out we come in here and ask questions and get no answers, traded question time when ministers day in and day out do nothing but use question time to abuse the opposition and evade any opportunity to be accountable. What we have done is to use what we as opposition members are meant to use, and that is a forum of the parliament to call the government into account. The member for Wills preceded the member for Parramatta. And the member for Wills said, we've all wasted our time this afternoon. Well, it's easy for the member for Wills. He's an independent member. No chance of ever being the government of this country. Never likely is the member for Wirra, where we're probably the only time he's going to agree with me in the entire debate, never likely to be called to account. Easy for him, but for those of us in opposition, we have a responsibility, and the responsibility is to call the government to account for the things that it's failed to do, commend it for the things that it's done that we agree with, and frankly, call the Prime Minister for account to account when he has failed to lead Australia as it ought to be led. Preceding the member for Wills, we had an astonishing speech from the member of the, for the Northern Territory. And the member for the Northern Territory had the sheer, unbelievable, barefaced audacity to bring the immigration debate into this chamber and to try with that in some way to discredit 
the honourable performance of the Leader of the Opposition. No one else in this House would surely, have, would surely sink so low. The member for the Northern Territory stood up there as if he alone had some sort of monopoly on all that was decent and trotted out all this sanctimonious humbug, failing to recognise that all that the Leader of the Opposition had ever done in the immigration debate was to welcome Asian immigration and call for assimilation. But no such recognition from the member from the Northern Territory, of course. No recognition from him that all of us in some way have been compromised from time to time, none more so than he, as we all know. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I stand here on a rather unusual platform because I share with the member for Gippsland the rare distinction of having spent longer in opposition without tasting government than any other members of the federal coalition. I entered in March 1983, so I have not been blinkered by some rosy impression of what my lot might do in government. But from March 83 to November 95, I have watched 13 years of progressive deterioration in both the standard of living in Australia and in the parliamentary standards that Australians expect from this particular chamber. I have watched them eroded. Eroded from 83 to 92 under Prime Minister Hawke, but that erosion has been unbelievably accelerated under Prime Minister Keating. And frankly, and the member for Parramatta, who, as I said, knows better than he said, stood up and illustrated the point I wish to make that speaker after speaker from the government, in defence of the Prime Minister, have only stood here and said, Look at what we've done. Why, they've implied. Look at the World Bank survey, which only two months ago said this happens to be, per capita, the wealthiest country in Australia. This happens to be the country where, if you take our land, our minerals, our plant, our equipment, our housing, our factories, um, our farms, and capitalise it against each Australian, then in US dollar terms each Australian is worth $835,000 or $1.9 million uh, no, $835,000 United States or $1.9 million American. Well, there are a few Australians, Mr Deputy Speaker, who wouldn't mind taking their cash and running in the present climate. But this censure is not about that. This censures about the question that every Australian asks, and that is, why, if in capital terms I'm that wealthy, has my standard of living fallen? And in addressing the censure motion, the Leader of the Opposition made it perfectly clear that, frankly and uncomfortably, we have dropped in national income per capita from 10th in the globe to 22nd while the Prime Minister has been the Treasurer or the Prime Minister. Surely that fact alone, in a nation as wealthy as this, is good reason for a censure. Mr Deputy Speaker, our standard of living used to be the highest in the world, and it has slipped, as everyone knows, from the highest in the world to 22nd. Mr Deputy Speaker, Today, this very day, we had our current account deficit for this month revealed, and it came in at $1.6 billion. And some commentators would tell you that's reason for rejoicing. That is, we imported more than we exported to the terms of $1,600 million in a one-month period. And the only reason people want to rejoice about it is that it's under $2 billion. We've now got ourselves into some sort of mental state which means that a current account deficit that comes in under $2 billion is meant to be a good figure. Does the parliament realise? Do the people of Australia appreciate the fact that from 1975 to 1983, Australia, in 88 months of recording, never, never recorded a current account deficit over $1 billion? And from 1983 to 1985, under the present stewardship, 
out of 150 months of recording on 96 occasions. We've had a current account deficit of over $1 billion. That is, we've slipped back every month but by that degree. And on 11 occasions, a current account deficit of over $2 billion each month. Surely those figures alone are justification for a censure motion like this. And the opposition in leading this censure only reflects what the rest of Australia says. This can't go on, and this man is not fit to lead this country. As the Leader of the Opposition said in statistics that by now every Australian must be familiar with, we've gone from $23 billion of borrowings to 163, and still we slide down. Now the government will claim quite legitimately that Australia's exports have continued to rise, and they're right. They have. But our share of the world export market has declined. And if you want a measure of what's wrong with Australia, there it is. Sure, we're exporting more, but other countries are outperforming us hand over fist. In fact, in terms of our share of the world export market, we've gone from 12th when you came into government to 21st today. Isn't that of itself sufficient reason for this censure? The minister then why aren't we part of it? Let me ask the member for Werriwa. And why aren't we involved in it? And I'll come to APEC in just a moment. The reality inescapably remains that we are not the performers in per capita terms of export into Asia that once we were, and that relative to our competitors, we have slipped under your stewardship. Uh, the, member uh, uh, order. The, the member from Wakefield might like to come back and direct his comments to the chair. I'm sure he realises that. Uh, well, if I'm not provoked, the member from Warringah might, from Warringah, I should, should say, not the member from Warringah, haven't started yet. Yeah. <laughs> the member from Warringah might, might see he's interjecting too. I respect your decision, yeah. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Minister for Employment, Education and Training came in here and lauded the way the government had exceeded its targets in terms of creating jobs for young people. And that's good news. No one in the opposition has ever pretended otherwise. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, after 13 years, we still have at least 8.6 per cent of the workforce out of work. Are we supposed to celebrate that in November 1995? And how fluid is that figure? Given the multiplicity of training schemes that have appeared, oh, I'm not allowed to be critical of training schemes because people on training schemes become more employable. But people on training schemes are also no longer counted as part of that unemployment figure. So heaven knows what that real figure is. We have over 9 per cent of people out of work, and we are supposed to apologise for moving a censure motion against the Prime Minister. Only this week I had an employer in my electorate ring me, as the parliamentary secretary may well have them in her electorate ring her, complaining about the fact that he had jobs and no one prepared to do them. That's an indictment of the way we go about employing young people and of how serious we are to addressing the whole question of job creation. But talk about industrial relations, and the first thing that will happen is that someone on the other side will stand up and paint the opposition as if in some sort of pre-Lord Shaftesbury concept we wanted to send children up chimneys. How absurd can you get? Don't you realise that in common with every one of you, I too am a parent, a parent of children in the workforce, a parent of children I don't want exploited, just as you don't want people exploited either. I have a vested interest in an industrial relations system that is fair and that frankly offers better pay for better work in common with everyone else. And we have a situation here where any suggestion that the opposition is critical of the performance of the Minister of Health is instantly met with a cry that in some strange way the Royal Commission was loaded against her, ignoring the fact that eight of her colleagues were the very people who gave evidence against her and also found her guilty. And while I'm on this question of misrepresentation and deceit, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
Let me address the whole matter of parliamentary standards. Because we have a situation where you know and I know that the standard of this chamber and performance in this chamber has slipped under the stewardship of the Prime Minister. Here is a Prime Minister who openly defies the Speaker, a Prime Minister who thinks he can front himself to the dispatch box and address the Parliament whether he has the call or not. No civility, no decorum. Every member of the opposition is treated as dirt. Now, this must be said for the former Prime Minister, Mr Hawke. Never while he was Prime Minister was I faced with that sort of situation. And if I met him in the corridor, at least I was treated as an Australian with a role to play and a job to do and a justification for being here. But not this man. In the eyes of the Prime Minister, the opposition has no role at all. And that is inexcusable. In common with everyone opposite, every member of this opposition has been elected to this chamber, charged with a serious responsibility to represent an electorate, government or opposition, and expected, frankly, and I'm proud of this as an opposition member, expected to voice the concerns of all those people who didn't vote for the government. Now, that applies no matter which party is in opposition. And that means that the voice of the opposition ought to be heard and heeded. I don't expect to win divisions because the people of Australia didn't elect me into the government, but they elected me into the parliament with a job to do, and part of the justification for my job is the right to be heard, not treated as dirt by the present Prime Minister, against whom we have moved quite rightly this censure. I am tired, Mr Deputy Speaker of being treated with scorn and derision, tired of being treated as if I had no real role in this parliament when I proudly stand here as a member of the opposition and as the member for Wakefield. And Mr Deputy Speaker, finally I stand here representing rural Australians who are probably the most accommodating Australians they are, that, that there are, probably, certainly the most forgiving because they are accustomed to the vagar vagaries of the seasons and so they are a little more cynical than others about what politicians believe, about what politicians pretend they can deliver. And rural Australians are also angry with this Prime Minister because they've borne the brunt of much of his economic mismanagement. They're the people who are generating the opportunity for export renewal, and they're the people who feel that this Prime Minister has failed to give them a fair go. Mr Deputy Speaker, the member for Wills said that we had much in common. I'm sure the member for Werriwa will, dis will disagree with him. Order. The, the truth Honourable remains time has expired. the Prime Minister is the man who has snuffed out the light on the Order. hill. Order. The immediate question is that the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Cryer. Mr Deputy Speaker, let it be forever a matter for the public record that on the last days of the sittings of the 37th Parliament, that the final motion of censure by the opposition against the Prime Minister was proposed by a leader of the opposition that has been rejected once by the Australian people as being unsuitable to lead this great nation and who is the third choice of his peers to lead the Liberal Party. And let it be a matter for the public record, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the member who seconded the motion against the Prime Minister, the member for Higgins, is someone who on two occasions refused to take the poison chalice of the Liberal leadership. The member for Higgins must rank as one of the greatest political squibs of the 37th parliament. Mr Speaker, the future of this great country is too precious to place in the hands of a third-rate opposition who will deliver second-rate government to this country. The people of Australia have a clear choice of national leadership at the next election a leadership to represent this great nation in Asia and the great forums of the world. On this side of the House, they will have Paul Keating, Kim Beasley, Gareth Evans and Ralph Willis. And on the oppos opposition side, they will have a choice of John Howard, a reject in his own ranks, Tim Fisher, who was not taken seriously by anybody in this country, Alexander Downer, who was unceremoniously dumped from the Liberal leadership for his incompetence, and Peter Costello, 
the, fin the shadow finance minister who gleefully announced to the Australian public that we were heading for a double-dip recession when the Australian economy motored on to 17 quarters of positive growth. Those are the choices that are before the Australian people at the next election. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is not fit to lead Australia. We on this side of the House know it, you on that side of the House in your heart of hearts know it, and the Australian people know it. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me quote from a report in a publication, Rear Window, edited by Andrew Main and Rowena Stretton. It describes the Leader of the Opposition's 17-page presentation to a council meeting of the National Farmers Federation. According to the report, the Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Opposition staff instructed that there be no questions to the Leader of the Opposition. And when the NFF resisted, the Leader of the Opposition staff then offered to write the questions, offered to write the questions for the farmers. There is only one reason why they would seek to do that, and that is simply that the Leader of the Opposition is incapable of providing a coherent answer to questions about his own policy. Can you imagine the Leader of the Opposition sitting down with the Japanese Prime Minister or the Indonesian uh, President and handing them a list of questions they could ask? They could ask about Australia's place in the world. Mr Speaker, there is no one in this House or the Australian community that really believes that the Leader of the Opposition could have stitched APEC together. There is no one in this country who really believes that the Leader of the Opposition could have steered the Mabo legislation through this great parliament. And there is no one who believes the Leader of the Opposition would have had the political courage or the vision to put one simple proposition before the Australian people, and that is that Australia ought to, be, ought to be led by an Australian and that they ought to have an Australian as their head of state. And there is no one who believes that the great social policy advances that have been made by this Labor government could ever have been constructed by a Tory government led by the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I listened intently to the Leader and Deputy Leader of the Opposition and their contribution to the censure of the Prime Minister. And there was simply no substance to the attack, no fresh policy position with which they could flail the Prime Minister, simply tired rhetoric from a tired opposition who have given up on policy debate in this country. Mr Speaker, this is the most deceitful and divisive opposition which has ever put itself before the Australian people for judgment. And their ultimate deceit is typified by their deliberate policy of withholding from the Australian people what they intend to do in government. It's a simple strategy of deceit. And we in Victoria know quite a deal about that simple strategy because we experienced it in 1992 with the election of the Kennett government. Jeff Kennett told Victorian workers that none of them would be worse off with the, with the election of a Liberal government. And on coming to power within a matter of months, he mounted a massive assault on the wages and conditions of workers under state awards. And John Howard is simply a Jeff Kennett clone. They come from the same Liberal industrial relations stable, and we know exactly what he will do in office. Let there be no illusions. Let the Australian workforce be under no illusions what he will do when he comes and, and if he comes to office. He will strip away the award conditions of workers. He will depress the uh, wages of workers. He will not endorse a no disadvantage test in industrial relations. And he will stab the independent umpire, the Industrial Relations uh, Commission, in the stomach. Not my words, but his. And while he does that, Jeff Kennett waits in the wings to punish Victorian workers for fleeing to the sanctuary of the federal industrial relations system. He has simply said that with the election of a uh, Howard coalition government, workers in Victoria will have nowhere else to go. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the greatest political obscenity of them all is John Howard and Peter Costello's pitch to the battlers of this country. Is this the same Howard and Costello 
who in 1993 put before Australian workers a regressive industrial relations policy designed to strip their wages and award conditions? Is it the same Howard and Costello who in 1993 put before the Australian people a radical plan to dismantle Medicare? Is it the same pair who put before the Australian people a plan to slash $10 billion from social expenditures in this country? Can it be the same Howard and Costello who gave their heart and soul to fight back that awful Tory manifesto designed to attack the economic and social conditions and wages of workers? Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, the greatest political obscenity is that Howard and Costello, after all of that in their heart and souls, now want the battlers in Australia to actually reward them for those policies with the fruits of government. Well, let me tell you, the battlers aren't that stupid. Now, I, I uh, listen with interest to the contribution for the, uh, uh, by the member for McKellar, that Tory high priestess from back down the time tunnel. And uh, her speech, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, was one great diatribe against Australia. She constantly runs down Australia, as her leader does, and puts up the United Kingdom and New Zealand as something we ought to emulate. Well, I say to the honourable members opposite and I say to the honourable member for McKellar, if it's so good there, why don't you go and live there? Why are there? Answer me this question. If it's so good in New Zealand, why are there a quarter of a million of them here in Australia seeking to build their lives and the futures of their families? The important thing to appreciate about the stance of the honourable member for McKellar and the, uh, McKellar and the leader of the opposition is simply this. Both of them can't stomach the thought of an Australian being an Australian head of state. Here we are in 1995 and the leader of the opposition dusts his cap to a monarch 10,000 miles away and can't even stomach having an Australian as an Australian head of state. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm proud to stand on the record of this government and on the record of the Prime Minister. I am proud that this was the government that brought into this parliament the greatest piece of social legislation since Federation, Mabo. I'm proud of, uh, to be a member of a Labor government that put on the floor of this parliament Working Nation, a program of economic and social structural change that every country in the Western world now wants to emulate. I'm proud of the economic achievements of this country. I don't run them down like the, like the Leader of the Opposition and the member for McCallow and, and members opposite. I'm proud of the fact that we've had 17 quarters of positive economic growth. I'm proud of the low inflation. I'm proud of the fact that there is uh, the lowest level of industrial disputation in this country for over 40 years. I'm proud of Australia standing in the world, and I won't stand on the floor of this parliament or I won't stand on any platform outside of it, and I won't stand in any international forum running this country down like the Leader of the Opposition does and the honourable members opposite. I'm proud to be an Australian. I'm proud of uh, the fact that this government engineered APEC, APEC and I'm proud of the breadth of our social policy. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, I listened to a succession of uh, uh, members opposite who railed against the Prime Minister's defence of the Minister for Health and how they can stand up in this parliament and defend one of the most grubby political exercises that uh, West Australia and this nation has ever seen is quite beyond me. A rigged terms of reference, absolute lies told to uh, this particular parliament about that parti uh, by that Royal Commission, a rigged terms of reference, a hanging judge and a bodgy outcome. And they parade it before this uh, illustrious House as the truth of the matter. That is a disgrace in itself. And I am pleased that the, uh, that the Honourable uh, the, uh, Minister for Health has drawn the line in the sand on this grubby exercise, has stood at the line and has not bowed, has not bowed to any sort of 
uh, mealy mouth pressure that the honourable members have brought to bear on this particular issue. Mr Deputy Speaker, in closing, let me say this. In the final uh, moments of this particular parliament, the 37th parliament, we have seen an, a, an opposition incapable of carrying a policy debate before this House. We have seen a leader of the opposition parade himself in front of this House as an alternative leader with no policies, with an attitude to run down his own country, a man who is incapable of considering that Australia should have an Australian head of state and a, a man who carries baggage from the past that really puts him to the bottom of the harbour in political terms, right where he belongs. Honourable members on this side of the House know the record of this government, and it is that record we will go to the Australian people and we will stand upon it. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I am confident, as all the members on this side of the House are, that when the dust settles on this particular election in 1996, we, we will have relegated to the political scrap bin a whole generation of Tories and Liberals who have not had the wherewithal, the intellectual capacity to achieve government in this country. Mr Deputy Speaker, it will be our pleasure. The immediate question is that the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Member Oringa. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I can understand uh, why the member for Karaya would be standing on his record because, quite frankly, it's the best way to try to hide the record of this government. Today we've had a cavalcade of ministers and parliamentary secretaries coming out with platitudes and cliches trying to defend the indefensible. Only one of them has sounded at all convincing, and that's the Deputy Prime Minister, because I suppose he's got something to look forward to, and that's being Leader of the Opposition after the next, uh, after the next election. Mr Speaker, this censure motion deserves to succeed because of the arrogance of this government, the dishonesty of this government and the incompetence of this government. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, 1996 is going to be a watershed in Australian politics. 1996 is going to be a watershed like 1949, because Howard's battlers are going to be to the 90s what Menzies' forgotten people were to the 40s and 50s. And it's on their shoulders that a new generation of Liberal dominance is going to be created. There's a few parallels, Mr Deputy Speaker, between 1949 and now. Ben Shifley had chaos in the coalfields. Paul Keating has chaos on the wharves in the coalfields and in the mining industry. The difference is that Ben Shifley was against the strikes and Paul Keating is in favour of the strikes. And the Australian people are asking who is responsible for the $200 million wiped off our production by this strike, and the answer is a Prime Minister who went to Osaka, who swanned off overseas rather than stay at home and fix the problem that he created. You see, this Prime Minister is very good at starting fights, but he's very bad at finishing them. He's very good at creating problems, but he's no good at solving them. This is a Prime Minister who turns around and says, oh, oh, the CRA dispute. Marcel Marceau could fix that. But what happened to Placido Domingo? What happened to Placido Domingo? He could not do what he said Marcel Marceau could. And my authority for this is none other than the Prime Minister's erstwhile best friend in politics. But that man who rushed out of the dinner party with Solly Lou, that man who forsook Melbourne's millionaires to raise the standard of the class war. That man who leapt out of his Xenia suit to don the cloth cap. And that man, Bill Kelty, said that I have confidence in the former Prime Minister, but I have no confidence, no confidence whatsoever in the present Prime Minister. The present Prime Minister is someone who has been rejected, has been rejected by no lesser figures and the leadership of the ACTU. And it's interesting, while we're on the subject of Bob Hawke, the member for Carrillo claimed that people on this side of the parliament were un-Australian. Well, let us remember that it was Bob Hawke himself, no less a figure than the former Prime Minister, who said of the current Prime Minister that Paul Keating is the first ever occupant of the lodge who doesn't like Australia and doesn't like Australians and would rather be living somewhere else. 
Well, let me tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, that after the next election, Paul Keating will be living somewhere else. He certainly won't be living in the lodge. You see, this week we've seen a strange contrast between the Prime Minister's spoken language and the Prime Minister's body language. His spoken language has had all the usual violence, all the usual vituperation, but his body language has been tense, arms crossed, because now there are enemies all around him. Bill Kelty is an enemy. Kim Beasley is an enemy after what's happened to Graham Campbell. Graham Richardson has been an enemy for months, plotting his downfall. The Prime Minister, you've got to say that his mental stability is, is, is no longer something that we can take for granted. This Prime Minister sees enemies everywhere. The Burke mob, that's the latest list of enemies that this Prime Minister is seeing everywhere. This is a Prime Minister who has no friends, and his attitude to this parliament makes that very clear indeed. I mean, he said, he said, he said that he's got the Pope on his side. Well, to be honest, that's about all he's got left. And frankly, you'd need to be the Pope to have any sympathy left for someone who can only be described of, as the Jack the Ripper of Australian politics. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, the fact is that this government has failed. It has failed where it counts. It has failed to deliver the goods to the Australian people. Foreign debt, it's now worse than Mexico's. Real wages, they're now lower than in 1976, and a bus driver in Sydney today earns less than a bus driver in Taiwan. Economic recovery is a complete illusion. It has not crawled off the pages of the Financial Review and into the pockets of ordinary Australians. Your mortgage costs more and your house is worth less. That is the reality of life under this government. There are 800,000 unemployed, and what does the Prime Minister say? He said, this is as good as it gets. That's his message to the 800,000 unemployed. That is as good as it gets. Mr Deputy Speaker, 13 years ago, Australians believed that we were a rich country getting richer. Today we think we're a rich country getting poorer. This is the first generation in Australia's history which fears that it will leave its children a lower standard of living than its parents left us. But it's worse than that. It's worse than that. There's the fraud and the hypocrisy. There is the betrayal of a Prime Minister who has abandoned the workers that he has always claimed to represent. And Ben Chifley and John Curtin would turn in their graves to see what this government has done. We have a Prime Minister who goes to a Labor area when he wants a safe seat, but as soon as he's looking for a nice house, where does he go? He goes off to the silver tails in the eastern suburbs. But the Prime Minister is nothing, Mr Deputy Speaker, but the chief exemplar of a culture of greed which this government has created. And we need look no further than the Australian Industry Development Corporation, a government-owned enterprise which this year lifted payout to directors from $3 million to $18 million at a time when the company made a multi-million dollar loss. What a disgrace, what a shame and what a betrayal of the values that the Labor Party once represented. And Mr Deputy Speaker, heaven help us if the AIDC had actually made a profit. How much would they have paid themselves then? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, is it any wonder that this Prime Minister has given up on domestic policy and he's now uh, seeking refuge uh, in that ultimate last resort of failed leaders? He now wants to create a Canberra Commission to rid the world of nuclear weapons. He can't solve little things like unemployment and the foreign debt, so now he's going to try to tackle ridding the world of nuclear weapons, and I suppose he's going to redesign Sydney, completely end any acrimony between black and whites Australia, and I suppose he's going to find a cure for AIDS too. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, this Prime Minister is a fraud. He said at the beginning, he said at the beginning of his term he said that he would deal honestly with the Australian people. He said that he expected ministers to tell the truth. And what happens, Mr Deputy Speaker? Well, along comes Carmen. Along comes Carmen. And what happens to the Prime Minister's commitment to the truth? Well, there was the Minister for Human Services and Health. What was she saying in Parliament? In Parliament, when asked what had really happened, she kept saying, 
My recollection is my recollection. Did she dare repeat what she had said to the National Press Club? Would she dare repeat what she had told the Western Australian Parliament? Of course not, because she knew that she was guilty. And what's more, the Prime Minister knew that she was guilty because the leader of the Labor Party in Western Australia had told him. And then in the Royal Commission, what does the Minister for Human Serv Services and Health do? Well, she takes refuge in the Alan Bond defence. I can't remember. I can't remember. To every inconvenient question, she says, I can't remember. And of course, who did that last but Alan Bond? And he was only able to get away with it because he said he had brain damage. And this is the person who's Minister for Health. I suppose it's so that she's got doctors close at hand if she finally collapses under the strain of all this nonsense. The fact of the matter is, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister, under the pressure of defending this Minister for Human Services and Health, has gone slightly troppo. First of all, it was the Liberal conspiracy. It was the Liberal Party that was responsible for putting all those people up, Carmen Lawrence's former ministers and staff, to say what she had really said. Then, of course, when that looked up utterly absurd, it was a Labor Party conspiracy. A Labor Party. It was Burke's mob that had done it. The fact is, this Prime Minister is shackled to a political corpse. He knows it. This Parliament knows it. The Australian people know it, and the strain is starting to show. But he's got a problem, hasn't he, Mr. Deputy Speaker? Because if she went, he'd have to go too. Because he is the ultimate master of misrepresentation. He is the ultimate true deceiver. There was, of course, the LAW uh, law tax cuts that were never delivered. There was the third runway that was supposed to mean more takeoffs and less noise, and the opposite has been the case. There was the consumption tax that in 1985 he said we must have, and in 1993 he said we'd never have, and ever since he's been giving, us, giving it to us by stealth. There was the privatisation that was supposed to be selling off the nation's silver that we'd never have, and, and now he's giving it to us in spades, selling off the heritage of this nation. To whom? To whom? To the hated POMs. The ultimate misrepresent the ultimate the ultimate true deceiver. Now the fact is, members over there talk about a hidden agenda. Their charge has no conviction. No conviction whatsoever, because they are led by a man who is the ultimate policy chameleon, and a man who has demonstrated throughout his career no commitment whatsoever to the concept of truth from the days of his rorted pre-selection, from the time he's failed to get his tax returns in on time, failed to declare where he lived for the purposes of travel allowance, failed to come clean on his business relationship with Warren Anderson and various people. This is a man who embodies who embodies misrepresentation and deceit. And of course, the ultimate illustration of this is the government's failure today to accept perfectly reasonable suggestions for truth in advertising legislation. Why won't they accept it? Because they know that if truth in, ad in political advertising legislation is in place for this election, the Prime Minister will be able to play no part in the coming election campaign, and he will be the ultimate Marcel Marceau of Australian politics. Now the fact is, they can't make up their mind, can they, whether the opposition are wimps or ogres. You know what it's going to be? The next election is going to be a contrast between Honest John and Jack the Ripper. That's what's going to happen at the next election. Our policy, Mr Deputy Speaker, is very clear. Our policy is to be different from this government. Our policy, Mr Deputy Speaker, is to promote workers' rights, not unions' rights. Our policies say that your wages can go up, but they can't go down. If someone comes along, if your employee, employer comes along and puts $15,000 and puts $15,000 on the table for improved work practices, our policy is that you can accept it. You can take the $15,000. You won't be condemned to poverty forever. You won't be condemned to the miserable, the miserable wages immobility of this government. Our policy is to protect Medicare. Our policy is to make it easier to save money. Our policy is to make it easier for people to buy shares in their own companies. Our policy is to make Australian workers partners with their employees, employers, not antagonists. Our policy is to make it easier to take out private health insurance. Our policy 
is to raise parliamentary standards. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that, that the coalition in government will do what this government has completely failed to do. We will bind up the wounds of the Australian people. We will restore the social fabric of this great nation. We will enable the Australian people for the first time in years to feel good about themselves. That's our policy. That's why we're different, and that's why we're going to win the next election. Mr Deputy Speaker, this government deserves very much to be censured. This government deserves more than that. This government deserves to be ejected by the Australian people. The Australian people they don't expect miracles. All they want is a bit of honesty from, the Austra from their rulers, and that's what they will get under the next government. The fact is it is in the Australian people's hands. I know at the next election that they are going to go for it, and this time they certainly won't be disappointed. The immediate question is that the amendment be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Werriwa. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, what a funny old position the coalition parties have got themselves in. And this debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, shows the mess, the ramshackle mess of their political structure and their integrity. We just heard from the member for Warringah, who present himself as the future of the Liberal Party. A young member recently elected the future Liberal Party. Who does he take as his political protege? Bob Santa Maria. It's all the way back to the 1950s with Bob Santa Maria and John, and John Howard. Howard. All the way back to the 1950s to the white picket fence with John Howard and the protege and the mentor, the mentor of the member for Ringa, Bob Santa Maria. And that reminds me of an interesting incident last year that reflects perfectly on the Liberal Party in the 1990s. And that was the book that was co-authored, co-authored, co-edited by the members for Menzies, Moore and Deacon. Now, a funny thing about those three, the members for Menzies, Moore and Deacon, two of the three have been disendorsed from the Liberal Party. Their book was called The Heart of Liberalism. Well, they ripped out the heart of liberalism when they disendorsed the member for Deakin, who is in the chamber, and also the member for Moore. But in this book about the heart of liberalism, we come to the last chapter, and it's entitled The Future of the Liberal Party. The Future of the Liberal Party. And who's the author? Bob Santa Maria. They've got Bob Santa Maria in the last chapter reciting the future of the Liberal Party. And what were the three planks that Santa put forward as solutions in the 1990s? It was to send everyone back to the land. The idea that everyone could go back to the land and live a nice, simple, plain farmer's life with no stress, no family back, uh, breakdown. The second plank was to send women back to the home, to take all the women out of the workforce and put them back in the kitchen. The third plank, from Santa Maria writing a chapter about the future of the Liberal Party, was to take the technology and put it back in its box. And that's a perfect echo of the member for Ringer, all scared of technology progress. Oh, we don't want any of that. We don't want any of these highfalutin new modern devices like telecommunications. We want to put it back in the box where Santa says it, it deserves to be, where Santa wants it to be from the 1950s, where John Howard wants our society to be right rooted in the 1950s. Now, I mean, Fancy the member for Ringer wanting to lecture the House about parliamentary behaviour. This is the member for Ringer who had the hide and the gall to be describing the Prime Minister of Australia as Jack the Ripper. Well, this is the same member for Ringer. When he was at the monastery, he wasn't known as Jack the Ripper, it was Tony the Stripper. So, I mean, if he wants to engage in those sorts of standards, jumping fences in and out of the monastery, bringing that low level type of behaviour into parliamentary forums, well, he's going to get it back. He's going to get it back with spades. This exposes the humbug and the cant, Mr Deputy Speaker, of what the opposition have been saying in this debate. And it exposes the funny old position, the funny old position they've got themselves in. Because in 1993, not so long ago, at the last election campaign, they put forward all the things they believed in. They worked for two or three years. The member for Ringa was in the research team working on all the ideas that the Liberal Party and the National Party really believed in. It was called Fight Back. It's called fight back. It's locked away now like a mad uncle in the attic. They never talk about fight back, but it reflects all the things they believe in. The individual employment contracts, the dismantling of Medicare, the 15 per cent GST, and cutting away all the public sector programs that provide for an equalising and civilising society. Their fundamental political beliefs, the things that were reflected, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the fight back manifesto, of course, are just an echo of Thatcherite philosophy. The idea that there is no such thing as society. There is government, and there are individuals, but there is no partnership between the two. There is no partnership between government and individuals that forms a thing called society. And their sole role in politics, their sole role is to push away 
public sector programs and to push more and more responsibility onto individuals. And of course, the wealthy and the privileged in our society can pick up those responsibilities and entrench their position. But for the disadvantaged, the people that they would call battlers, of course, it makes it even harder. Because without the civilising and equalising role, the great tolerance and liberation of the public sector, then those so-called battlers have an even harder lot in their life. But then what happens after 1993 when they find out the things that they believe in, Mr Deputy Speaker, all the policies they supported in fight back were basically unelectable, unsupported by the people of Australia. In 1996 they're going to go to the electorate with the things they don't believe in. So what sort of empty shell of a party is this? to go to the people with all the things they believed in in 1993, find out that that was unelectable, and now to try and put on the fraud and the hypocrisy of going to the election next year with all the things they don't believe in. And this is exposing the two faces of John Howard. The member for Warringah and other speakers have said, oh, the Labor Party can't make up its mind. They seem to be campaigning against two John Howards. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, there's a perfect reason why we're doing that. There are two John Howards. There's the private John Howard, who believes in all the policies of fight back, and there's the public John Howard who's trying to present himself to the people of Australia as a sensitive new age guy, as a reborn political leader, the sort of leader who uh, eats quiche, the sort of leader who helps little old ladies across the road, the reborn sensitive new age John Howard. Well, I mean, it's a fraud, Mr the Deputy Speaker, and the Australian people won't have a bar of it. They know the two faces of John Howard. They know the face of John Howard, the private John Howard, who supports fight back, he supports it to his bootstraps. And they also know the public John Howard, who is now trying to have a massive lend, a massive lend of the Australian people. And the Australian people will determine at the next election that they like neither face, neither face of John Howard, and they will reject both comprehensively at the ballot box. But it reflects also something interesting about the coalition at this part of the political cycle, because they know they're going to the people with the things they don't believe in. But they're sort of half excited, half g'd up by the fact that the opinion polls show that they're a bit ahead. So they're sort of getting around with that hangdog look, oh, we're really not going to the people, getting a mandate for the things we believe in, but half excited about the prospect of a coalition government. Well, this is a party with an empty shell, a party that's totally poll-driven and has no conviction. It has no integrity. It has no purpose for its existence. Because without those things called conviction and ideology, and policy and belief in politics, in public life, Mr Speaker, there can be no achievement. There can be no achievement without those key ingredients of a meaningful existence in public life. And for the Liberal Party and the National Party, they must sit around in the dining room, they must sit around in the party room wondering what's it all been for? What's it all been for in 13 years of opposition? Because they spent most of the 1980s shaking out the ideology and direction of the Liberal Party. It was Howard versus Peacock. It was left versus right. It was wet versus dry. It was a party ripping itself apart to refashion its core beliefs, its core ideology for the 1990s. And now, going into the next election, Mr Speaker, what have they got? What have they got in their leadership? They've got Andrew Peacock writ small. They've got Andrew, the Andrew Peacock without a suntan. They've got Andrew Peacock without Shirley MacLaine. They've got Andrew Peacock without the Gucci toothbrush. They've got Andrew Peacock without the serious look. All they've got left is John Howard and the worried look. They've gone through this massive pro process of ideological struggle in the 1980s, the wets versus the dry, Howard versus Peacock, left versus right, to end up with a Peacock style of leadership, all image, no substance, led by John Howard. It's an absolute fraud. They've got Andrew Peacock without the suntan. All they're left with is the worried look, that constipated look that sits permanently on the face of the leader of the opposition. So it's a sad old state, Mr Speaker. It's a sad old state for a party left without a heart, left without a conviction, left without the core political belief to go to the people with, with the things they believe in, the things that they showed the Australian public with the Fight Back Manifesto. And this is the same John Howard, Mr Speaker, who said in his budget reply speech earlier this year, and I quote, I've dedicated my public life to the pursuit of substantive policy change and I've led the debate. Well, it's a funny way to lead the debate by trying to hide your policies, a funny way to lead the debate and produce substantive policy change by campaigning on the things you don't believe in. The Leader of the Opposition is Australia's answer to Jim Hacker. 
His motto is, I am their leader, I must follow them. It's the same John Howard who adopted that motto when he was Treasurer between 1977 and 83. the Treasurer who showed leadership by walking away from the internationalisation of the Australian economy, the same Treasurer who showed substantive policy change by walking away from tariff reduction, micro-reform, by industrial relations reform, by integrating Australia into the Asia-Pacific. This is the same John Howard who has the hide to come into this parliament on this debate, Mr Speaker, and want to talk about economic performance. Now, the uh, Leader of the Opposition produced some figures from the, the Business Council. I've got a better source, the Parliamentary Library, Mr Speaker, because on, that side, on the opposite side of the House, they wish to compare the performance of this government on economic management. Who would they take as their standard? Who would they take as their benchmark? Is it the Menzies government? Would that be a fair comparison against the performance of the Labor government from 1983 to the present? I mean, the Menzies era, we here in this parliament, is described as the utopian age of economic growth, the utopian age of economic performance in Australia, the golden age of Liberal government. So members opposite would surely accept the proposition that it's a valid comparison to look at the economic performance of the Menzies government from 49 to 66 against the Hawke and Keating governments 83 to 95. Well, Mr Speaker, what do the figures provided from the Parliamentary Library show? On the key performance measure of GDP per capita per annum, the performance of the Menzies government 2.0 per cent, Hawke and Keating 2.1. We're greater than Menzies. We're greater than the golden age on the key measure of economic performance. GDP per capita, per annum. On other measures, employment. Under Menzies, the annual growth, 2.1 per cent. Under this government, 2.1, just as good. Business investment as a proportion of GDP. Under Menzies, 10.7. Under Hawke and Keating, an average of 10.8. On inflation, Menzies, 4.6. Under this government, 5.4, trying to wind back the Howard legacy. But when it comes to the key measure, when it comes to the key measure, the things that the Liberal Party and the National Party would really pride themselves on in the 1990s, it would be on government outlays. It would be in growth of the public sector. Because there was an interesting reminder of this just last Sunday on that uh, infamous Meet the Press program, Mr. Speaker, when the leader of the opposition said, "Oh, there's not as much fat in the system as there was 15 years ago." It was almost like he'd forgotten about well, who was in 15 years ago? Who was the treasurer? who was responsible for a fat budget 15 years ago. It was J.W. Howard. Like, I mean, how selective, how convenient that he can stand there on a national TV program and say there's not as much fat in the system as there was 15 years ago without saying who was responsible for the fat a decade and a half ago. It was him. It was him. This is the man with no history. He is the Ronald Biggs of Australian politics. He wasn't there 15 years ago at the scene of the crime. It was someone else. But on this key measure of comparison, let me return to the figures. Uh, looking at uh, the Menzies period compared to Hawke and Keating on Commonwealth outlays. Under Menzies, it was 2.5 per cent growth per annum. Under this government, 1.5. Lean, effective, efficient government under a Labor government. And when it comes to Commonwealth taxation, we always hear the opposition say, oh, it's a high taxing government. Well, have a look at Menzies' performance. Annual growth in Commonwealth taxation receipts of 2 per cent. Under this government, 1.1 per cent. We are better than the golden age. This is a new definition of economic utopia established by this government. On the sort of comparison that the opposition, the Liberal and the National parties, would say is the only fair comparison in uh, post-war economic performance. So this is a good government. It was once said, of course, of Jack Lang that he was greater than Lenin. Is the opposition now going to confess that Paul Keating is greater than Menzies when you look at the economic figures, figures when you look at the economic data? Now, beyond that, of course, of course, what uh, the opposition are basically saying in this debate, what they'll be putting forward at the next campaign, Mr. Speaker, is that look, this is a government on the economic data. It's better than the Menzies government, 49 to 66. The opposition, we have no policies, but we want to be in government. The Labor government has done better than the golden age, the utopian age of Menzies. They've got no policies, but they want to be on this side of the house. Well, that is such a sham. That is such a fraud to be putting to the Australian people. No policies, but what have they got in personnel? They've got John Howard, the third choice, not of the Australian people in this term of parliament, the third choice of his peers. Not, not, not good enough to beat John Hewson in their leadership ballot, not good enough to beat Alexander Downer, the second choice, relegated to the third choice. Not the third choice of the Labor Party, not the third choice of the Australian people, the third choice of his peers. 
in this session of parliament. The most overrated character, Mr. Speaker, the most overrated character that Australian politics has seen for a long while. I mean, how long do you need to be in this place to know the fundamental tenets of pension policy? How long do you need to be here? He's been here 21 years, and he doesn't know that this government has achieved pensions at the level of 25 per cent of average weekly earnings. Does he need another 21 years? Is it 42 years before he finds out the basis of policy for the old age pension? And then there's Tim Fisher. Then there's Tim Fisher, one unnamed National Party member, possibly the member for Gippsland, said last week, with Tim, we don't know if it's a lack of intellectual capacity or intestinal fortitude or both. Well, we know the answer on this side. It is both. It is both. It's lack of intellectual capacity and intestinal fortitude. When it comes to the leader of the National Party, he's not only dumb and dumber, he's weak and weaker. He is the weakest figure in the history of order. Australian politics. Order, the they must sit there seat. National the National Party member in and saying it's order. Order. Resume your seat, the member in order. The member is being offensive and uh, referring to a member in that way and should withdraw those, st those statements. I have, uh, I have heard during the course of the debate this afternoon uh, a number of a number of uh, points of view, which I'm sure people would have, in normal circumstances, taken offence to. Uh, in fact, the honourable member's time has expired, and we'll leave it at that. The original question was that the motion be agreed to, to which the honourable prime minister has moved as an amendment. Well, if we have to do that, we'd be going back all afternoon. Uh, that all words after that be. A oh, look, don't press it. We're going to go on with this now. Oh, no, I feel strongly about it, Mr. Speaker. The point of order I make is that if you agree with me that the Statements are offensive just because someone no, else I got didn't away agree with you at all. I you said shouldn't let them get away with there's it. No, there's no point and of I order. It's a censure motion. There have been things said during the course of the debate this afternoon from both sides, which I'm sure honourable members would find offensive. And that's where it'll end. The original question was the motion should be agreed to, to which the honourable the Prime Minister has moved as an amendment. All words after that be admitted with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is the amendment be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division, division required. Ring the bells. Yes, but you were alone. You were alone. I'm just absolutely surprised that there were so many members of the government present who didn't want to vote with you. Well, we will go, but.
Lock the doors. The question is, there must be a great two. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I point tell us for the eyes, the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. Tell us for the nose, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina.
Well, as a result of the division is eyes 73, nose 57. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is the motion as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint tellers for the ayes, the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. Tellers for the nose, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina. Order. The result of the division is eyes 74, nose 57. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Honourable Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, order. Order. I've received messages from the Senate returning the following bills without amendment. That's it, I think. Superannuation Industry Supervision Legislation Amendment 1995, National Food Authority Amendment 1995. The Honourable Member Hindmarsh. Mr. Speaker, I wish to make a personal explanation. Claim to be misrepresented. I do, Mr. Please Speaker. Please proceed. Uh, no, order. I want to get this over and done with. Today in the Senate question time, Senator Cook made false allegations regarding my motives when I sought to prevent CSIRO from allowing the erection of billboards on their green space along South Road at O'Hallon Hill in Adelaide. Senator order, Cook said, order. it is interesting to ask the question, why does Mrs Gallus have an interest in ending order. this project? Member for O'Connor is not helping his colleague who has the call. Either is the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. She said the CRO it was to she said to the CRO it was to give other companies a chance to bid for the contract to erect boardings. Thank you, Mr Prime Minister, for your civility in this matter. Order. This is Remember, 
Keep going. This is not correct, Mr. Speaker, as my opposition my right. was on environmental grounds only, and I was opposed to the erection of billboards by any and all companies on the O'Halloran Hill site. And I know there was order. no. The, the member behind my just for a moment. The member, Mr. Speaker, I'd like, you, I'd like you to be aware that. Whatever the reason, it is impossible to hear the member for Highmarsh. Perhaps, Start again. Start again. Like the, member Perhaps for Highmarsh. the volume could be turned up. Okay. Member for, no, no, just keep going. Member Highmarsh. This is not correct, Mr Speaker. As my opposition was environment, on environmental grounds only, I was opposed to the erection of billboards by any and all companies on Order. the O'Halloran Hill site. The Honourable Member, I think, is now debating the issue. No, Mr Speaker. I did raise the issue of the CSIRO failing to obtain approvals Order. from the Marion Council and not following normal government tendering procedures. However, these actions were only taken to strengthen my case to Order. prevent an act of environmental vandalism, which Senator Cook should also criticise instead of imputing untrue motives to defend the indefensible. Mr Speaker, I will continue to oppose the erection of any billboards by any and all companies on the CSIRO site at O'Halloran Hill. The right honourable member for New England. I seek to make a personal explanation. You claim to be misrepresented. Yes, also, Mr please Mr proceed. Speaker, I do. Order. In uh, this morning's Canberra Times, in an article Those edited— Those on my right. In an article edited by Simon Groves, there's an attempt to link me in some way it's the same measure of culpability as the honourable member for Kingsford Smith and the honourable member for Fremantle. I point out in the uh, matters to which that particular article refers that I paid all my own legal fees, that I stood down from Cabinet and I was acquitted on all charges, yeah, yeah, yeah. in contrast to both of those honourable gentlemen. The honourable member for Groom. Yes, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, I speak. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Do you claim to be misrepresented, yes, also? I, yes, I do, uh, Mr. Speaker. In a in a press release uh, earlier this evening, the Prime Minister accused me of being uh, mischievous or ignorant, or possibly both. Order. And that I need to do my homework before I burst into print. Can I just uh, say to the Prime Minister that he's he's wrong on both counts? Order. And no, 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 no. We're going to be here all night. The chair will be resumed tomorrow, Friday, 1st of December at 10 o'clock. Have a good night. I am. The most days I go.